Columbia presents Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. Our Miss Brooks is a school teacher. She's been teaching English at Madison High for about five years now. In spite of the fact that she doesn't make a lot of money, Connie is very fond of her work. In fact, in her own words... Teaching school can be a very rich life for a young woman. That is, if she happens to be a very rich young woman. Of course, I'm not rich, but I am rather young and rather a woman, too. Which brings us to Mr. Boynton. He's the biology teacher at school, and a sweeter, kinder, more intelligent scientist never brushed off an English teacher to play footsie with a frog. (laughs) But he'll come around. Even a studious biology teacher must sooner or later get a little biological. Meanwhile, I can dream, can't I? Yes, Connie Brooks can dream. It's a few minutes before seven in the morning, and Miss Brooks is fast asleep in the room she rents from Mrs. Margaret Davis. Fast asleep and dreaming. Oh, Mr. Darwell, this is too much. Miss Brooks, as principal of Madison High School, I insist you accept it. But a diamond-studded ruler? For what, Mr. Darwell? (laughs) Because you have the nicest erasers in school. (laughs) Why, Mr. Darwell, I didn't think you ever noticed my erasers. I'm also giving you Mr. Boynton, the biology teacher. Oh, Mr. Boynton. Kiss me, Miss Brooks. Miss Brooks? Miss Brooks, you'll be late. Kiss me again, Mr. Boynton. Miss Brooks, you have to go to school, dear. For this, I don't have to go to school. This comes naturally. (laughs) Oh, 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 it's you, Miss Davis. Mm -hmm. Oh, what time is it? Well, it's only 7.15, dear. But I know today's a big day for you. What with Mr. Darwell, the principal, leaving Madison High. Oh, yes, today's the day Mr. Conklin takes over. Maybe he'll give me a chance to head the English department. Osgood Conkler? Why, I've known him for years. We went to school together. All the other children used to call him Stoneface because he never laughed. Oh, fine. Well, I shouldn't say never. No, I did give him a laugh one time when we were out ice skating. He was practically in hysterics. What happened? I broke my leg. (laughs) Now, do hurry and get dressed, dear. I've got a lovely surprise for your breakfast. You just sit down and drink your juice All right, Mrs. Davis What kind of juice is this, anyway? Pomegranate Pomegranate? Uh Uh-huh I was going to bake you a kumquat But they were out of them at the deli Now, here's the surprise Here it is Armenian pancakes They've been setting for five days (laughs) What else could they do? in goat's milk. It takes five days for it to get good and sour. Sour goat's milk? Mm -hmm. Here, try a bite off this fork. Don't pay any attention to the smell, dear. Oh, but Mrs. Davis, I... Please, Mrs. Davis. I'm too old to be hand-fed, especially Armenian pancakes. (laughs) Now, tell me the truth. Aren't they delicious? Well, I don't want to hurt your feelings, Mrs. Davis, but if I were the goat responsible for this concoction, I would hang myself by my own beard. <laughs> if you don't mind, I'll help myself to some cereal. Oh, Miss Brooks, it's a crime to throw out these pancakes. What's the crime? Carrying concealed weapons? <laughs> now, you've got to have something for breakfast. Today's a big day for you. Let me whip up a few Swiss clan fritters. Look, Mrs. Davis. Yes, dear? If it wouldn't upset you to see it at the breakfast table, could I have some cornflakes? Uh, Well, everyone to his own taste Gee, it's funny Walter isn't here yet He knows I wanted to get to school a little early this morning Oh, is Walter Denton picking you up again? Yes, my Chevy's still in the shop I had a little accident Monday I ran into a parked car Oh, Oh, that's too bad I hope you reported it to the police I didn't have to They were sitting in the car (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's good Uh, Walter's a nice boy Although he's not too bright You're right about that, Mrs. Davis. Sixteen years old, and he gets his heart broken every other week by some jukebox, Cleopatra. 
Then I have to put the pieces together. You, Miss Brooks? Yeah, you know, I pat the little rooster on the head with my motherly wing and make clucking sounds. Oh, well, how does he respond to that, Miss Brooks? Before the last cluck has died away, he's back in the hen house. Uh. Oh, well, I can't worry about Walter today. I've got to make a good impression on Mr. Conklin if I want that new job at school. Oh, that's Walter now. I can always tell him by the way he humps. Me too. He sounds like a heartbroken goose. <laughs> well, here goes, Mrs. Davis. Wish me luck. Oh, I do, my dear. And don't you worry about a thing. I wonder what kind of a guy Mr. Conklin really is. <laughs> I tell you, I'm not going to stand for any nonsense at this new school, Martha. I've heard about their lack of discipline, and I won't have it, you hear? No one is going to interfere with my making Madison High School a well-run school. No one. If anybody gets in my way, I'll crush them. Step on them like so many ants. Squash them. That's nice. Pass the marmalade, dear. <laughs> and help yourself to some more toast. I hate toast. But I was saying, Martha. I'm sure that the faculty of Madison is totally inept. Oh, I don't know, Osgood. I'm sure you'll find a few ept ones. Ept! Ept! Drink a little water, dear. It'll go away. Oh. <laughs> no understanding. No cooperation. Nobody knows what a difficult job I'm faced with. It's awful, awful, awful. Please, Osgood. Can't you talk without barking? Honestly, sometimes I think Prince is the only one who can really understand you. Prince! Don't mention that lazy mutt to me. Look at him over there. Dead to the world. Well, it's getting late. Now, where's my hat? Confound it, where's my hat? Please, dear, don't bark. I'm not barking, Martha. Once and for all, I don't bark. <laughs> See? He does understand you. Now, be sure to drive carefully on your way to school. Don't tell me how to drive. I'm Dear, it's just that after all the work you put in, polishing it on Sunday, I'd hate to oh, see Oh, stop the... worrying. I did the work, didn't I? Look at her out there. Nothing takes a wax polish like a black touring car. Well, Osgood, you'd better get started. You mustn't set a bad example for your new teachers. I'll show them a thing or two. I'll show them. I'll make them step. <laughs> oh, shut up, Prince. Shut up. <laughs> Goodbye, Mark. It's nice of you to pick me up like this, Walter. Oh, that's all right, Miss Brooks. It's the least I can do. You've been so sweet to me. Besides, there's something I want to talk to you about. A girl? It usually is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's a girl, Miss Brooks, but this one... this one's different. You mean she's stuck on you? Oh, not yet. That's what I want to talk to you about. I want you to help me get her stuck on me. Now, well, here we go again. Who is the girl, Walter? She's the baker's daughter, Penelope Miller. When I kissed her for the first time the other night, I I knew she was different. But, Walter, you kissed a lot of girls. What's so different about Penelope Miller? She tastes like caraway seeds. <laughs> oh, grand. She's probably built like a pumpernickel. <laughs> now, look, Walter, I've got a lot on my mind today. Well, all I... I want you to do is help me write her a letter, Miss Brooks. You see... She doesn't think I'm mental enough. I can't understand it. And I figured, well, you being an English teacher, as well as a woman, well, you'd know how to make me think that, think that I was brainy. You know, intelligent. I hate to trade on just my sheer animal magnetism. You know what I mean? Walter, well, you are a little beastly in spots. <laughs> but don't blame yourself. Penelope just doesn't appreciate yet that a man is a thing to be treasured. When will she appreciate it? When she gets to be my age. <laughs> oh, I couldn't wait that long, Miss Brooks. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, Walter. Just how old do you think I am, anyway? Is uh, 35. What? 40. Walter! 45. One more bid and I'll throw you out of this auction. <laughs> I'm sorry, Miss Brooks. I guess I'm not very mental at that, but you will help me out, won't you? I'll come over to Mrs. Davis's tonight and we'll write a letter together. What do you say? Well, I could... Walter, look out! That car! What car? That big black touring car! Big black touring car? <laughs> well, it's not quite as big as it was. You young idiot! Why don't you watch where you're going? 
Oh, my fenders. My shining fenders lying in the gutter. Walter, put the man's fenders back on. <laughs> oh, gee, mister, I didn't mean to... You didn't mean. Why didn't you look where you were going? Well, gosh, it takes two to make an accident. A brilliant observation. But it just happens that I was only going 15 miles an hour. You should have been going 30. would have missed you by a block. <laughs> now, see here, you red-haired joyrider. It was probably your fault. My fault? Yes. Why don't you learn how to drive that hopped-up hearse of yours? <laughs> hopped-up hearse? How dare you? Walter, I've got to run along. I'll leave you to straighten out Barking Boy. Barking Boy? That's the second time today I've been accused of barking. Young woman, I'll have you know I do not bark. <laughs> Who's your friend? Go home, Prince. Goodbye, Walter. And thanks for the joy ride, Walter, if you'll pardon the expression. Oh, goodbye, Miss Brooks, and don't forget about tonight. <laughs> Good riddance. That is one of the most offensive young women I've ever met. Now then, young man, let me see your driver's license. <laughs> Classes haven't started yet. Let me see. Pick up my mail first, and then... Oh, hello, Mr. Boynton. Hello, Miss Brooks. Isn't it a coincidence that we're in the same mailbox? Not an overwhelming coincidence. You see, your last name begins with the same letter mine does. Well, that's a start. <laughs> you have such a quick mind, Mr. Boynton. Well, it, it is thorough. Personally, I think you tax it too much. Don't you think you need more recreation, if you know what I mean? Oh, Carrying on my biology experiments is recreation enough. You don't know what I mean. <laughs> of course, I also collect stamps. That gets pretty exciting sometimes. Oh, it must. There's no end to the possibilities. Have you ever tried your hand at beadwork? Beadwork? Well, no, I don't believe I have. Is it fun? Fun? Why, it just makes you tingle all over. <laughs> and, of course, basket weaving can be exciting, too. Really? Yes, if we're both in the same basket. <laughs> well, so much for the world of sports. Uh, uh, Miss Brooks, uh, if you don't mind my changing the subject, uh, are you going to be busy tonight? Busy? Me? Why, Mr. Boynton, I couldn't be unbusier. Well, uh, I'd like to come over after dinner, that is, if, if we could be alone. Alone? We'll be absolutely isolated. <laughs> I hope you don't think I'm too forward, Mr. Boynton, but I've anticipated this moment for quite a while. Remember the day about five years ago when I first came to Madison High, rounded a turn in the corridor and bumped smack into you? Oh, yes. Uh, I was teaching chemistry then. You put quite a dent in my Bunsen burner. <laughs> You know, that was the day that I first suspected that we'd be more to each other than just fellow faculty members. Oh? Uh, when were your suspicions confirmed, Miss Brooks? Oh, on our very next date, when you took me to lunch two years later. <laughs> Gad, you were a fast worker. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't blame you for kidding me, Miss Brooks. I, I guess I'm not much of a whirlwind romantically. Then most scientific people aren't. Mm -hmm. You see, the study of evolution alone tends to slow down any of the more intemperate reflexes. Mm -hmm. You must realize what a tremendous period of time was involved before the single cell divided itself in the sea and adapted itself to the land and air. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Countless centuries passed before lower forms of life assumed their new shapes. Generations before the mammal family produced the ape family and before the ape family produced the human family. What have you been waiting for me to do? Slip back a notch? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to lecture, Miss Brooks. You do look very lovely this morning. Well, thank you, Mr. Boynton. Luckily, I come from one of the prettier ape families. <laughs> now, about what time do you think you'll be able to come over tonight? Oh, Mr. Boynton, Miss Brooks. Sorry to interrupt, but as you know, today is my last day as your principal, and my successor, Mr. Conklin, is due any minute. Oh, we'll be sorry to see you go, sir. Yes, you've been a wonderful principal, Mr. Darwell. I don't know why the Board of Education had you transferred. Uh, ours not to reason why. Ours but to teach and die. <laughs> if you pardon a mixed poetical reference. And if I may say so, it's been wonderful working with you here at Madison High, and I'm genuinely sorry to leave. 
However, we're teachers, and teachers can't afford sentiment. We can't afford anything. <laughs> now, I suggest that you go to your classrooms and get things in order. I'll be taking Mr. Conklin on a tour of inspection as soon as he arrives. Uh, incidentally, Miss Brooks, your class will be one of the first ones visited. Also, it might interest you to know that I intend to recommend you as the head of the English department. Oh, thank you, Mr. Darwell. Believe me, I'm all set for Mr. Conklin. Good. You know, Miss Brooks, nothing is more important than a first impression. All right, class, let me have your attention now. As many of you know, our new principal, Mr. Osgood Conklin, takes over his duties today. So if he should drop in here at any time, there's no reason for any of us to be nervous, self-conscious, or... Head of the English department. I mean, uh, <laughs> we'll just go on in our normal manner. Now to take up where we left off yesterday. Uh, pardon me, Miss Brooks, but Mr. Conklin and I just happen to be passing by and... Oh, I come uh, right in, Mr. Darwell. Uh, this way, Mr. Conklin. Uh, Mr. Conklin, this is our Miss Brooks. Uh, how do you do, Miss Brooks? Glad to make your... Aqu- Wait a minute! <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Conklin. I'm glad to make your equate a minute, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh you, you, you two have met? Well, we sort of ran into each other this morning. Yes. Oh, so this is the young lady in the accident you told me about. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Conklin, I, I have an idea. Now, uh, well, why don't we skip English and drop in on Mr. English? Darwell, now that I know just who Miss Brooks is, I'm particularly interested in watching her conduct her class. Oh, uh, well, suppose you go right on, Miss Brooks. Uh, we'll have to sit here at the back of the room and uh, probably learn something. Oh, all right, Mr. Darwell. <clears throat> now, class... I'm going to read some lines to you, which I'd like you to... I mean, that I'd like you to. Well, I want you to tell me whom... Uh, who... I'd like the name of the author of the following stuff. <laughs> uh, so faithful in love, so conflict in war. I mean, so dauntless in war. Uh, never was there a night like young Lockenvar. Hands, please. No hands? Well, you've all got them, you know. <laughs> Just look at the end of your sleeves. <laughs> oh, oh, there's a hand. Winona. I can always depend on Winona. Uh, who write, wrote those lines, Winona? I don't know. I just want to leave the room. <laughs> Never mind the blindfold, Captain. Just give me a cigarette. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Boynton. Oh, Miss Brooks. Come right in. Well, if you don't mind, I'll stand by the door. Biology labs make me nervous. I just dropped by to see what time you're coming over tonight. Tonight? Yes, one of my students is stopping by. I've promised to write an intellectual letter for him to a girlfriend he's trying to impress, Penelope Miller. Penelope Miller? Yeah, she tastes like caraway seeds. <laughs> anyway, if you'll just let me know what time you can make it, oh, I'll... I'm not sure about tonight at all right now. I'm quite worried about Violet. Violet? Yes, the white mouse I use in some of my experiments. <laughs> I know, uh, steady, Violet. Steady, dear. I I'm just going to hold you for a minute. Mr. Boynton. You know, I don't like the feel of his stomach. Mr. Boynton, if it's you It's could... lumpy. Well, but Mr. Boynton, you told me at the office this well, morning... Well, frankly, Miss Brooks, at that time I didn't know about Violet's condition. You, uh, you understand, I have to... I know, you have to sit up with a lumpy mouse. <laughs> Violet's been awfully cooperative. Obviously. But she's terribly peaked lately, I... I don't know what it is. I think I better have a look at her cage. Hold her a minute, will you? Ah! Miss Brooks, you dropped Violet. She attacked me. Miss Brooks, get off of the desk. I can't. I see her. She's under that table, Mr. Boynton. Ah! I'll get her if you just stop that screaming and let go of your skirts. Get her. And this, Mr. Conklin, is our biology laboratory. <laughs> and where are we? Why, Miss Brooks, what are you doing on that desk? And where's Mr. Boynton? He's under the table with Violet. <laughs> Violet. So that's what goes on in the biology laboratory of Madison High. Oh, but Mr. Conklin, I'm sure we can... So am I. His... Very sure. Come, Mr. Darwell. I'll be back when Violet is out from under the table. Oh, no. Yeah, I, I've got her, Miss Brooks. Oh, the poor thing was scared to death. Yeah. Oh, look at her. Isn't she sweet? Isn't Violet a beauty? Ravishing. <laughs> and may I tell you something else, Mr. Boynton? What's that? You make a lovely couple. <laughs> Hello.
Hello. Yes, this is the principal's office. Osgood Conklin speaking. <laughs> Who's this? Who? Mrs. Davis. Uh, Margaret Davis. Oh, the girl who used to go ice skating with me. <laughs> How's your leg? <laughs> What's that? You want me to come over tonight? Well, my wife is visiting her mother tonight. I might be able to... Uh, you say there's a teacher living here that you want me to meet, uh, Miss Brooks? Miss Brooks! Now, look here, Margaret. I don't think I can... Yes, I know we're all friends, but... But I don't... But I can't... But I... All right, Margaret. I'll be there for dinner. All right, seven o'clock. Goodbye. <laughs> Margaret Davis. <laughs> Her leg must have been in a cast for six weeks. <laughs> I demand to see the new principal of this school immediately. I am he. I am Matilda Denton, and I have reason to suspect that my boy, a pupil at this iniquitous institution, has fallen into the clutches of one of your female teachers. What? But, madam, what makes you... Not over a half hour ago, on the phone, I heard my boy postponing a date with a girl his own age, a lovely little girl, Penelope Miller. Penelope Miller. Yes, she tastes like caraway seeds. <laughs> and when I asked Walter his reason for the postponement, he said he had a date tonight with a red-headed teacher at her home. But how do you know she... Here, she's... read this. It fell out of my son's notebook when he came home from school. Just read it. Very well. <clears throat> at last I've got what I want. Red hair and what a tough, sturdy body. Good heavens. Well, Mr. Conklin... Have you any idea who this nefarious woman might be? Yes, I have, Mrs. Denton. And I hasten to assure you that I'll take steps to get to the bottom of this as quickly as possible. Just how quickly is that, Mr. Conklin? No later than tonight. This teacher doesn't know it, but we are having dinner together. Oh, well, Osgood, how did you like your dinner? Very interesting, Mrs. Davis. I've never tasted a seal burger before. Oh. It's the goat's milk that does it. Uh-huh. Well, I'll take these dishes into the kitchen and see about the coffee. Oh, I make Bulgarian coffee, you know. It's strained through a grapefruit rind. Naturally. Uh, now then, Miss Brooks, I realize that the events of the day were as unpleasant for you as they were for me. Yes, they were, Mr. Conklin, but that's all in the past. I'd like to think so, Miss Brooks. But unfortunately, a matter of the gravest concern has come up. Really? Really. What would you think of a teacher who would allow a student to become infatuated with her and then lead him on? Why, I think she was pretty terrible, Mr. Conklin. Who's the teacher? We haven't any positive proof, but the boy's name is Walter Denton. Well, I think they both ought to be arrested. Walter Denton? Yes, Miss Brooks, Walter Denton. His mother came to see me today and told me all about it. She has no idea who the teacher is, but... Well, you can't deny that you were in the car with young Denton this morning. Oh, but Mr. Conklin, he was just giving me a lift until my car's fixed. I never see the boy at any other time. Are you sure about that, Miss Brooks? I'm positive. <laughs> Must be my laundry. Your laundry at 8 p.m.? Well, I, I deal with the owl laundry. <laughs> I only come out at night. Will you excuse me, Mr. Conklin? I'll be back in a minute. Hi, Miss Brooks. I keep you waiting. Yes, but not long enough. Look, Walter, come back some other time. Come on. You? No, Walter, no. Let's get into the living room. I'm anxious to get that letter started. Not so loud, Walter. What's the matter, Miss Brooks? You look like you've seen a ghost. I just had dinner with one. <laughs> Mr. Conklin is still in the dining room. Oh, the new principal? Yes, and he's convinced that you jilted your girlfriend because you're infatuated with me. Gee, is that good? Good. Listen, Walter, if he finds you here tonight, we'll both be out. Uh -huh. Oh. oh, quick, Walter, get behind those curtains by the window. Oh, all right. Oh. Say, they're very pretty. Get in back of them. Oh, yeah. Who was it that rang, dear? Oh, oh, it was just a wrong number, Mrs. Davis. On the doorbell? I, I mean the wrong house number. Why, Miss Brooks, you seem very nervous this evening, dear. You've pulled all the thread out of that tassel. Oh, <laughs> they don't make them like they did before the war, do they? <laughs> I remember some tassels you could pull on all day. Oh, come and get some coffee, dear. It'll calm you down. You know, the Bulgarians drink it flat on their backs. I'll be flat on my back any minute, and I wish I was in Bulgaria. Why, Miss Brooks, you're trembling like a leaf, and you're all flushed. Well, it's, 
It's rather warm in here, don't you think? <laughs> yes. Oh, if it isn't too much trouble, Osgood, would you mind pulling back those curtains and opening the window? Oh, no, not, not the no curtains. No trouble at all. I'll be only too happy to open the window. And I'll be only too happy to jump out of it. <laughs> there. There we are. Well, where is he? What's become of him? What's become of whom? Bobby Breen. <laughs> he used to send me. <laughs> Come on over to the couch, dear. You're still overwrought. There, now you lie right down here and I'll get you a pillow. You know, I keep pillows in the window seat just for emergencies like this. I always say you never know when you need them. Hello, Walter. Here you are, Miss Brooks. Just make yourself... <laughs> Margaret, Margaret, what is the matter? Walter Denton, you come out of my window seat. Ah, uh, ha! Just as I thought. Miss Brooks, where are you going? I thought I'd run down to the Belgian Congo for the weekend. <laughs> Sit down, Miss Brooks. Young man, what were you doing in that window? If you'll only give me a chance, Mr. Conklin, I can explain. Go ahead. What were you doing in there? Hiding. Oh, <laughs> oh no. Walter, tell them just why you came here tonight. I came here to see Miss Brooks. I thought we'd be alone. Oh, ho! Oh, Walter. Well, she was only going to help me write a letter to my girlfriend. Oh, why, that was very sweet of Miss Brooks. Don't you think so, Osgood? Extremely so, extremely. Now, let's hear you explain this, Miss Brooks. Here, read this page from Walter's diary. Mine? What is this? At last I've got what I want. Red hair, and what a tough, sturdy body. Walter! I wish everybody would stop saying Walter. This isn't even my writing. Here, look at the other side. That's my biology notes from yesterday. I asked Mr. Boynton to loan me a piece of paper. Mr. Boynton wrote that? Oh, oh, my. <laughs> Miss Brooks, don't you get it? Get what? Red hair. It's you he's writing about. Me? Uh-huh. Just what he wanted? Tough and sturdy. <laughs> well, I am strong. Surely you're not pleased, Miss Brooks. I'm not? I mean, I'm not. Good evening. The front door was open and I... Oh, hello, Mr. Boynton. I thought you said we were going to be along, Miss Brooks. You too! <laughs> What's happening around here? Haven't you heard? I've been made queen for a day. <laughs> Mr. Boynton, I'd like to know whether you wrote this or not. Well, let me see it, sir. Yes, I wrote it. It was supposed to go into my diary. What's wrong with it anyway? She is strong, and I did work hard to get her. Mr. Boynton, please, not in front of everybody. It, it took 23 generations of crossbreeding to get a red-backed mouse like that. Red-backed mouse? Mouse! Mouse! Oh, amazing. Well, uh, uh, Miss Brooks, I'm afraid I've done you a grave injustice. You most certainly have, Mr. Conklin. You've placed your own meaning on unfortunate incidents. But... You've accused me of misconduct with no proof whatsoever, and you've acted in general like a narrow, bigoted, unfair person. Uh, but, Mr. Miss Conklin, uh... I never want to see you or talk to you again as long as I live. Not even about that job as head of the English department? Mr. Conklin, I've done you a grave injustice. <laughs> Let's sit down on the love seat and talk this thing over, shall we? Well, we'll uh, take it up first thing in the morning, Miss Brooks. I've got to be getting home now. Come on, Walter. We'll take the bus together. Oh, we don't have to take the bus, Mr. Conklin. I've got my car outside. Your car? After our collision this morning? Oh, after I left you, I hit another car and everything snapped back into place. <laughs> well, good night, all. Good night, Walter. Good night, Walter. Good night Oscar. Good, good night. night. Good night, Mr. Conklin. Well, now, there's just the three of us, Mr. Boynton. Mrs. Davis and you and I. Gee, it's a beautiful night. Look at that moon streaming through the windows. If one would just take a hint, there'd just be two of us. Two of us and one sofa. I said if one of us would take a hint. Well, here we are, just the two of us. That's right, Miss Brooks. <laughs> How about a little gin rummy? Cut for deal. <laughs> well, I blitzed Mrs. Davis three across, but I'd rather have lost to Mr. Boynton. He's certainly naive, my little biology boy. But though he's shy, he's glad of I, and 
I'm sure he'll soon realize that the greatest thing he'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return. Good night. <laughs> Next week at the same time, Columbia will again present Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Yes, Mrs. Davis, something pretty important come up that I've got to discuss with Mr. Boynton. I'm meeting him at the zoo right now. Tell you all about it when I come back. Goodbye. Oh, Connie, you left a couple of letters on your dresser. Huh. She must be in a hurry. She didn't even open her mail, except this one. Huh. Dear Miss Brooks, as principal of Sunnydale Finishing School, I... Oh, I shouldn't be reading Connie's mail. I'll get on with my vacuuming. First, I'll, I'll get this corner here. Still, it's, it's pretty dirty over by that dresser. As principal of Sunnydale Finishing School, I hereby acknowledge your application for a position. Oh, oh, I'm terrible. I'd better get over to the other side of the room. Uh, still pretty dirty around Connie's letter, uh, dresser. <laughs> Application for a position as an English teacher at our school. This is to inform you... Oh, I better shut this thing off. I can hardly hear what I'm reading. <laughs> this is to inform you that we have an opening at Sunnydale, and we're looking forward to a personal interview. Very truly yours, Jonathan F. Margaret Davis, don't you dare read another word of this letter. No wonder Connie was so excited. Sunnydale is one of the most exclusive schools in the country. But that would mean her leaving Madison High. Oh, this is awful. I better phone Osgood Conklin. As principal of Madison High School, he ought to know about this. Hello? Hello. Martha, this is Margaret Davis. Oh, hello, Margaret. How are you on this fine day after Thanksgiving? Well, frankly, Martha, I'm a little upset. Well, so is Osgood. He ate himself into a coma yesterday. <laughs> Oh, then, uh, maybe you better not tell him today. Tell him what? That our Miss Brooks may be leaving Madison High to take a position at Sunnydale Finishing School. Sunnydale Finishing School? How do you know, Margaret? Did Miss Brooks tell you? Not exactly, but I got it from the principal of Sunnydale himself, Jonathan F. Uh, uh, Jonathan F. who? Um, hold the wire a minute. <laughs> Byers. Jonathan F. Byers. Is he there now? Yes, right on Miss Brooks' dresser. I mean... Uh... <laughs> Martha, look. You've got to promise me you'll never breathe a word of this to Miss Brooks or anyone else. Oh, I promise, Martha. Well, just by accident, I just happened to read a letter that was lying on Miss Brooks' dresser. By accident, Margaret? Yes, I just happened to have my glasses on. <laughs> But what are we going to do, Martha? We can't let Miss Brooks leave Madison. No, we certainly can't. Uh, tell you what, Margaret. I'll talk this over with my daughter, Harriet, and call you back later. All right. And remember, you promise not to mention a word about my reading Miss Brooks' mail. Oh, of course, my dear. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, I hope they'll be able to think of some way to keep her here. Oh, hello, Minerva. I'll get you some milk in a minute, dear. No, no, no. No, no, Minerva. Better stop licking your paw. You know what it does to you. Yeah. <laughs> you, Miss Brooks. Here I am, over here by these birds. Oh, of course, Mr. Boynton. I thought you were a little tall for a pelican. <laughs> It was nice of you to meet me. How'd you get over here so quickly? It was simple. I dressed on the way over. <laughs> but now that I'm here, what was it you wanted to see me about? Well, perhaps we'd better sit down while I tell you. Here's a bench under this tree. Fine. Eh, you comfortable? Perfectly. Uh, Miss Brooks, I... Uh... Yes, Mr. Boynton? Well, you must forgive me if I seem overexcited, but frankly, I never thought this day would come. You didn't? No, I didn't. <laughs> 
Well, before it goes, why didn't you think it would ever come? <laughs> because... Because of the things that have happened in the past, or rather because of the things that haven't happened in the past. Those are the ones that bother me, too. <laughs> You realize, of course, I'm referring to the migratory habits of the Arctic grackle. Oh, I realized that a long time ago. I just didn't want to let on. <laughs> this is the first time a grackle has ever been south of the Canadian border. Maybe he was waiting till after the election. <laughs> I knew that something was afoot when I looked out of my window this morning and saw a black and blue bullfinch. What happened to him? Get caught in a badminton game? <laughs> oh. um, the movements of the grackle can be very accurately charted by closely observing the bullfinch, since they are, in the truest sense of the word, full cousins to the mottled thrush. Where did he come from? Hudson Bay. And almost all of these species of bird like to lay their eggs in a soft, downy nest amid quiet surroundings. That's why I sent for you, Miss Brooks. Good. I'll take my hat off and keep my mouth shut. <laughs> now, I know this sounds terribly involved, but actually it's quite simple. You see... My uncle's farm in Boonville is a perfect nesting ground for both bullfinch and thrush. How does your aunt feel about that? Well, they both love birds. They've built a sanctuary for them, and I have an idea that if I get right up there, I may stumble into some grackle eggs. It sounds like fun, if you don't mind albumin on your Oxfords. <laughs> well, that's, why I, that's why I asked you to meet me, to say goodbye. Goodbye? But, Mr. Boynton, haven't you heard the old saying? Two grackle hunters are better than one? Oh, but you couldn't come along with me. It's a ten-hour drive to Boonville, and we'd have to stay overnight. Oh, but we'd certainly be well chaperoned, what with your aunt and uncle and all those bullfinches. <laughs> yes, they did have 600 of them up there last year, but I don't know, Miss Brooks. Even with the chaperones, you, you know how people talk, and unless we didn't say anything about it, but even then they might find out, although we'd only be gone a couple of days... Still, if the rumor got around that we were... Of course, we wouldn't be. But then there are those who might... Uh... Oh, but how could they? What do you think, Miss Brooks? Why should I butt in? Decide among yourselves. <laughs> well, it is kind of a long trip to make alone. Maybe you're right, Miss Brooks. Why, with the two of us traveling together, time will fly. We can chat together, eat together... Yes, ...and Mr. pay for the gas together. <laughs> I still insist that no one should hear about it, though. For the sake of both our reputations, absolute secrecy is essential. Not a word of this must cross our lips. Can I depend on you not to divulge our plans to a living soul? On your honor, Miss Brooks? Get out your penknife and let it, let's exchange blood. <laughs> Starring Eve Arden will continue in just a moment, but first, here is Vern Smith with an important announcement. Attention, ladies, regardless of age, skin type, or previous beauty care, doctors prove you too may win a lovelier complexion with palm olive soap. But to win this lovelier complexion, the kind men admire and women envy, you must stop improper cleansing. Instead, use palm olive soap alone, the way doctors advise. Remember, 36 doctors, leading skin specialists, advised 1,285 women, many with complexion problems, to use palm olive this way. Some had dry skin, some oily, some coarse-looking. Using palm olive soap alone, two out of three won lovelier complexions, regardless of age, type of skin, or previous beauty care. Now, here's the plan doctors advise. Wash your face with palm olive soap. Massaging for one minute with palm olive soft lather. This cleansing massage brings your skin palm olive full, beautifying effect. Rinse. Do this three times a day for 14 days. It's that simple. But leading skin specialists prove this way, using palm olive alone, nothing else, really works. So forget other beauty care. Use palm olive soap as these doctors advise for a lovelier complexion. Last night on the CBS Sing It Again program, you were promised an additional clue to the Phantom Voice and the $24,000 prize. Here it is. The Phantom is a famous ghost who galloped far from post to post. Yes, there is the clue for the $24,000 prize on the CBS Sing It Again program on Saturday night. The clue again, 
The Phantom is a famous ghost who galloped far from post to post. And now, as she quietly prepares for a weekend in the country, our Miss Brooks is blissfully unaware of the furor caused by the five-year-old letter which she left on her dresser. Let's look in now on Martha Conklin as she discusses the situation with her daughter, Harriet. So you see, Harriet, it, it looks very much like your favorite teacher will soon be leaving Madison High. Oh, that's terrible, Mother. Have you told Daddy about it yet? Uh, not yet, Harriet. I'm waiting until he recovers from his Thanksgiving dinner. You know how upset he gets when we mention the shortage of teachers. Oh, yes. Golly, Mother, he's been lying over there on the couch for hours. Do you think he's all right? Oh, of course he's all right. He's just sleeping. Aren't you, out good? I say, aren't you just sleeping off good? No. Mm. What? No, no, no. Take it away. Take it. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I guess I was having a nightmare. A nightmare, Daddy? Yes, I dreamt I was still eating. <laughs> I swear I don't know how those pilgrims did it. Uh, did what, Osgood? Ate all that turkey and fought Indians besides. <laughs> I'm surprised at you, Daddy. That's not the real Thanksgiving spirit. A lot I've got to be thankful for. Well, you've got us, Daddy. Mother and me. Yeah. <laughs> I've got you, all right. I've also got the school. A school full of overcrowded classrooms and a horde of unreasonable teachers constantly screaming for a living wage. Now, Osgood, don't work yourself up into a stew. Oh, please. <laughs> don't even mention words like that. <laughs> You haven't got the right attitude, Daddy. Nowadays, if you can hang on to the good teachers you've got, anything else you get is gravy. Me! Me! <laughs> Not you, too. Maybe we ought to go out and let your father sleep a while longer, Harry. Yes, uh, that's a splendid suggestion, Martha. Oh, this couch feels good. Oh, I'll get it. Coming. Oh, hello, Walter. Come on in. It's Walter Denton, Mother. Hiya, Harriet. Hello, Mrs. Conklin. Hello, Walter. And how are you, Mr. Conklin? You certainly look peaceful. I was, Denton. <laughs> Did you finish your lunch, Harriet? I just finished mine. We had plenty of turkey left over from yesterday, and I just ate the part that went over the... Oh, no! <laughs> With your father, Harriet. Doesn't he feel good? Not too good, Walter. Let's go into the other room. Okay. I hope you feel better, Mr. Conklin. I guess it was a mistake to hash over Thanksgiving no. again. Come on out in the kitchen, Walter. There's something we want to tell you. Guess what, Walter? Miss Brooks is leaving Madison High. What? How do you know, Harriet? Mother found out from Mrs. Davis. Mrs. Davis? But how does she know? Uh, we can't repeat that, Walter. Repeat what? That Mrs. Davis read a letter Miss Brooks left on her dresser. <laughs> it was a letter offering her a position at Sunnydale Finishing School. Sunnydale? But that's 500 miles from here. Oh, we've got to do something. Maybe we can cook up some kind of a scheme to make her stay. I know. We'll pretend I've become a delinquent. But do you think it'll work? It's got to work. Have you told Mr. Conklin about this? Uh, not yet. We didn't want to upset him. Well, he'll find out sooner or later, and there's no sense in waiting until it's too late. Somebody ought to tell him right away. I agree. Don't you, Mother? Yes, Harriet, I do. Somebody ought to tell him. Walter, don't look at me. If I go in there now, he'll bite my head off. <laughs> don't be silly, Walter. Mr. Conklin won't eat anything for two more days. <laughs> Oh, I'm kind of busy right now, Mrs. Davis. She would come around just when I'm packing. Well, come on in. Why, Connie, you're going away. No, Mrs. Davis, I'm not going away. Then why are you packing that bag? I'm going away, Mrs. Davis. <laughs> I'm surprised at you, Constance, leaving town without even saying goodbye. And after we've been so close. Oh, please don't feel that way, Mrs. Davis. I, I just didn't want to discuss it right now. You see, I have a lot of things to do. Oh, I, I don't want anybody to see me like this. You answer the door, Connie. I'm going into the kitchen and make some tea. All right, Mrs. Davis. Hello, Miss Brooks. I've just got to talk to you for a minute. Come in, Harriet. Let's sit here in the living room. I can't stay very long, but Then I'll... it's true. You are leaving town. Leaving town? 
How did you know, Harry? What's the difference? I know. And I realize it might be a pretty good opportunity for you. Pretty good? With half a break from the grackle, it's perfect. <laughs> oh, look, Harriet, I appreciate your interest, but I think I have to make my own decision in a matter like this. Oh, I know it seems attractive now, but later on you'll regret it. Well, I'll have to take my chances on that. <laughs> well, if you won't consider yourself, Consider the ones who care for you. Think of Walter Denton. Is that a must? <laughs> He's going to pieces. His parents, me, nobody can do anything with him. You've got to straighten him out, Miss Brooke. What in the world are you talking about, Harriet? It's the career he's decided upon. Walter's been reading a big book lately about the Treasury Department and counterfeiters and... Well, that's nothing to be alarmed about. Every boy his age wants to be a T-man or a G-man or some kind of a letter man. But he doesn't want to be a tea man. He wants to be a counterfeiter. <laughs> a counterfeiter? Oh, I'll get it. Hello, Walter. Come in. Hiya, Miss Brooks. I'm glad I nailed you before you took it on the lamb. <laughs> Let's angle into the living room. Oh, hello, Harriet. How's my little confederate to be, huh? <laughs> Funny he acts. What is all this nonsense, Walter? What do you mean nonsense? I'm making money hand over fist. The only trouble is scratching the green goods ain't enough. It ain't? Nah. <laughs> you gotta get a good queer shovel to help you pass the boodle. Queer shovel? Or a paper hanger. You know, snide pitcher. You can have the best cognac in the world make your slush, but if you ain't got a top bill poster to push the flash, you might as well slough the screwy and scramble for the McCoy. <laughs> Yes, but if I could find my way back alone, I'd leave now. You've got to do something, Miss Brooks. Walter wasn't cut out for a life of crime. Oh, now listen, you two. I don't know what's behind all this, but this well, is... Well, it's simple. When you get to where you're going, I'll send you a few stacks of hot to shove. I don't want to shove no hot. I mean... <laughs> I wish somebody would tell me what's coming. It's a good thing I never built a better mousetrap. Good afternoon, Miss Brooks. Why, it's Mr. Mousetrap. I mean, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> Come on in. Who is that, Connie? It's Mr. Conklin. Oh, hello, Osgood. I was just making some tea, but you know what they say. A watch pot never boils. Hello, Margaret. Now then, Miss Brooks, I'll be brief. I know that you're leaving town. You too? Somebody must be reading my mail. <laughs> on second thought, I'd better go back and watch that pot. <laughs> Miss Brooks, I think I can say without fear of contradiction that I know how to run a school as well as any principal in the country. Well, I guess you do, Mr. Conklin. That's why I'm know. here, to ask you to reconsider this proposition you've had. Proposition? Yes. I can offer you anything he can. Why, <laughs> what would Mrs. Conklin say if she knew you were talking this way? She's all for it. What? And so is my daughter, Harriet. Oh, now, please, Mr. Conklin. I've had a rather puzzling day so far, but this is... It just happens that your daughter's in the living room now. I think we'd better go in there. I'll be glad to. Oh, hello, Harriet. Walter. Hi, oh, Mr. Conklin. I'm awfully glad you decided to put your pride in your pocket and come over here. Did you ask her yet? Yes, Harriet, I did. The rest is up to Miss Brooks. Don't go away, anybody. I'll put your transfers when I get back. <laughs> Mr. Boynton. Yes, Miss Brooks, it's I. May I come in? Oh, of course. I've still got a single in the mezzanine. <laughs> but I can't help wondering, what happened to that oath of secrecy we took? Well, that's what I'd like to know. I thought you weren't going to tell anybody about our trip to my uncle's place. I didn't say a word about it. You didn't? No. Well, I've never seen so many wagging tongues in all my life. You think you've seen wagging tongues? My living room looks like a delicatessen. <laughs> I just don't understand what... Oh, hello, folks. Hello, Hi, Mr. Boynton. Boynton. Oh, I'm glad you're here, Boynton. Maybe you can help get Miss Brooks to change her mind. Well, I don't wish to appear insubordinate, sir, but frankly, I thought the trip might do us both a lot of good. Both? <laughs> don't tell me you're leaving, too. Pretty soon, there'll be no faculty left at Madison High whatsoever. We might as well all go. I don't think his uncle and aunt have room for you all. 
<laughs> Besides, Mr. Conklin, I think where I go and what I do is nobody's business but my own. And I say it is our business. Why you should want to go traipsing off to Sunnydale Finishing School is beyond me. It's Sunnydale Finishing School? Of course. Now, there's no sense in beating about the bush. Mrs. Davis read the letter you left on your dresser this morning, and we know you've been offered a job there. Oh, that letter. Yeah. Why, that's over five years old, Mr. Conklin. I turned that job down long ago. Oh, I'm so happy, Miss Brooks. Hooray! Now I can go straight. <laughs> but then, what were we talking about? You, uh, Mr. Boynton, uh, what was... Uh, how was... Uh, why did... Miss Brooks, just where were you and Mr. Boynton going together? That, Mr. Conklin, is a secret between Mr. Boynton, myself, and 600 bullfinches. <laughs> Martin, as our Miss Brooks, returns in just a moment. But first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight, show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a luster cream shampoo. Only luster cream brings you K. Dumas' magic formula blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Gives loveliness lather even in hardest water. Glamorizes your hair as you wash it. Luster cream, not a soap, not a liquid, but a dainty cream shampoo. Leaves hair fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen, soft, manageable. Gives new beauty to all hairdos or permanents. Four-ounce jar, one dollar. Smaller sizes, either tubes or jars. Tonight, try luster cream shampoo and be a dream girl, dream girl. Beautiful luster cream girl, you owe your crowning glory to a luster cream shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, after everyone found out about our plans, Mr. Boynton naturally called off the expedition. But things weren't a total loss, because Saturday afternoon he took me back to the zoo, and we sat by the aviary once again. You know, Miss Brooks, even though our trip didn't work out, I was very gratified to learn of your interest in birds and wildlife in general. Yes, I'm a great bird for wildlife. <laughs> well, since this common interest of ours has brought us so much closer together, there's something else I want to tell you, Miss Brooks. Something I think you ought to know. What's that, Mr. Boynton? There's a pelican here who holds 18 pounds of fish in his beak. What's he waiting for, the price to go up? <laughs> Next week, tune into another Our Miss Brooks show, brought to you by Palmer and Soap, your beauty hope, and luster cream shampoo for soft, glamorous, dream girl hair. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written and directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Boynton is played by Jeff Chandler, Mr. Conklin by Gail Gordon. Dentists know what cleans teeth best, and over 4,000 dentists say Colgate Tooth Powder with a two-minute routine gets teeth sparkling and super clean. So to remove dull film and get your teeth shining clean, just brush teeth two minutes, morning and night, with Colgate Tooth Powder. Brush inside, outside, and biting surfaces. Always brush away from the gums. See how this gets teeth naturally bright. It removes dull film that improper brushing misses. And Colgate Tooth Powder also sweetens your breath. Try it. Buy Colgate Tooth Powder today. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North, the exciting, fun-packed adventures of an amateur detective and his beautiful wife. Tune in Tuesday evenings over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at the same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Stay tuned now for Laman Abner. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting Center. <laughs> Palm Olive Soap, your beauty hope, and luster cream shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> Our Miss
Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, was as grateful as any other teacher for the Washington's birthday holiday observed last week. And far be it for me to criticize the actions of the father of our country, but I can't help wishing that he had taken more than just one day to be born. <laughs> of course, the one day off was better than nothing, but I must admit I looked forward to a weekend of not teaching with considerable anticipation. It isn't that I'm not fond of my pupils. I think they're a wonderful horde of kids. <laughs> but after the events of last Friday, I seriously considered giving up teaching and taking a course in rug tatting or peanut art. <laughs> it started Friday after school. Mr. Boynton, the usually bashful biologist, displayed a surprisingly different attitude when I entered his laboratory. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. I was just going to come down to your room. Oh, then I'll get back there right away. I wouldn't want to miss you. <laughs> well, I guess what I have to say can be said here, all right. Although I can't help wishing the surroundings were different. Different? Yes, Miss Brooks. More romantic. Romantic? Mm-hmm. I know I haven't been the most aggressive chap in the world, but I do think of other things besides my biological experiments. Things that are, well, more personal. Personal? Yes. <laughs> Things that a, a man thinks about a woman sometimes, whether she's a fellow teacher or not. Or not? <laughs> Just move my needle a notch to the right. <laughs> Mr. Boynton, what is it you're trying to tell me, I like to think? <laughs> well, it, it's just that, like I said before, I wish the surroundings were different. I wish we were in a blue lagoon somewhere with a soft breeze blowing through your hair and... Oh, but we're not. I can take care of that, Mr. Boynton. <laughs> Keep talking. Of course, I, I don't know why we have to be in a blue lagoon. I guess I just feel more confident when I'm over water. Well, hop up on this stool and I'll fill a pan. <laughs> I mean, please continue, Mr. Boynton. Well, as you know, Miss Brooks, I've been coaching the basketball team while Mr. Haney's been ill, and, well, we've been lucky enough to win the championship in our particular conference. Yes, I know. We've been invited to play in the state championships at Martinsville. The entire squad leaves this evening. We won't be back until next week. I, I just want you to know that, well... Yes, Mr. Boynton? It's terribly important that we win the championship. Oh, you'll win it, Mr. Boynton. But what else were you going to say? Well, I'm not so sure we'll win it. After all, we're playing a round robin. Well, I bet you could spot him four worms and beat him easily. <laughs> I know you're kidding me, Miss Brooks, but I don't mind. You know, now that I'm leaving town, I've come to realize certain things about our relationship. At last. Formal recognition that we have a relationship. <laughs> well, without getting too basic too quickly... I'd like to state that in the past, whenever the situation seems auspicious for declaring certain emotional reactions I've felt, upon finding myself in close proximity to you, that is, some outward manifestation seems to... Pardon me, Mr. Boynton. Couldn't you get a little more basic more quickly? <laughs> well, what I'm trying to say, Miss Brooks, is that there always seems to be some sort of interruption when I want to talk to you about certain things. What kind of interruption? I see what you mean. Come in. <laughs> Well, Boynton, as principal of Madison High, I... Oh, I thought you were alone. We were for a minute. <laughs> that is, uh, I was just saying goodbye to Mr. Boynton, Mr. Conklin. I see, Miss Brooks. And have you finished saying goodbye? No, Mr. Conklin, we haven't. This boy's been taking brave shots. <laughs> well, what I mean to say, sir, is that we can finish talking after you've spoken to me. Very well. I simply dropped in to wish you good luck with the team, Mr. Boynton. Remember, by winning the championship cup, you not only honor yourself and the athletes involved, but you bring further glory to the already hallowed name of Madison High. Glory and prestige, fame and all... How much have you bet on the game, Mr. Conklin? Just, uh, just a fin. I was... No! <laughs> you know I never bet. I... It's just that we must get that cup. Well, don't worry, Mr. Conklin. We've got the high-scoring forward of the conference on our team, you know. I see. And how's this boy's condition? Tip top, I trust? Well, he's six foot five inches tall, so his top would be hard to tip. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's a joke, sir. Thank you. 
By the way, Miss Brooks, is this the boy we transferred from Miss Enright's English class to yours? Yes, sir. Well, tell me, how's his state of mind? What there is of it is quite happy. <laughs> well, I know he's not a brilliant student, but now that he's in your class, Miss Brooks, I'm sure he'll improve. Uh, from what I hear, the boy's an all-round athlete. I want him eligible for other sports during the coming term. Well, I'll do whatever I can, Mr. Conklin. Of course, it's difficult to give a test without any questions in it, but... Uh... <laughs> we'll get him through all right, Mr. Conklin. Good, good. Well, I'll be running along now. Best of luck, Boynton. Bring back that cup. Let's see now. Where were we? Oh, I know. You were telling me something personal. Well, I wouldn't like to repeat myself, Miss Brooks. Do you remember what it was I said last? Oh, how could I possibly remember what you said minutes ago? This is just something about... You'd like to state that in the past, whenever the situation seemed auspicious for declaring certain emotional reactions you felt, upon finding yourself in close proximity to me, that is, some outward manifestation seems uh, That's to... right. And then you said, couldn't we get a little more basic more quickly? Right. Then you said there always seems to be some sort of interruption when you want to talk to me about certain things. And then you said, what kind of interruption? <laughs> and then I wrote, whoever it is, get lost. <laughs> Come in. Hiya, Coach. I just... Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. Hello, Walter. How are you? Fine and dandy. Good. Bye-bye, Walter. <laughs> I just wanted to remind Mr. Boynton about the big doings tonight. There's going to be a torchlight parade and a snake dance. Uh, you'll be there, won't you, Miss Brooks? Yes, Walter, if I can find a snake in time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh... Uh, before I go, Miss Brooks, have you seen Stretch around anywhere? Uh, no, not for the past few hours. Well, if he shows up, please send him into the gym, will you? I want to give him exact directions so he won't get lost on his way to the bus station. Knowing Stretch, he can get lost after he's got the directions. So we'll send him in to you if he shows up here. Thank you, and good day, Walter Denton. Uh, thank you, Miss Brooks. And may I suggest that you speed Mr. Boynton on his way with a salutation befitting the mentor of a sterling aggregation such as the Madison basketball team? Walter. So long, Coach. <laughs> I, I hope you're not embarrassed by Walter's inference, Miss Brooks If you think that would embarrass me, you need a coach, coach <laughs> Now, let's take off for that blue lagoon, huh? I'm afraid I don't comprehend, Miss Brooks My hair is blowing in the breeze again <laughs> <laughs> See? What is it you were trying to tell me before Walter came in? Well, it's just that with my leaving tonight, we won't be seeing each other at all over the weekend. I know, Mr. Boynton. Come in. Oh, it's Stretch. How are you, son? Hi, Mr. Boynton. Hello, Miss Brooks. Hi. <laughs> well, how do you feel about our impending junket? Huh? <laughs> Mr. Boynton wants to know how you feel about the trip you're taking this evening. Oh, well, I ain't going. Stretch, don't say ain't. Don't say you ain't going. <laughs> What's the trouble, Stretch? You're not ill, are you? There's nothing wrong with me physically. My trouble is mostly mental. Well, don't be self-conscious. <laughs> oh, wait, what is it, Stretch? Maybe I can help you. I'm afraid you can't, Mr. Boynton. You see, it's, well, it's about a girl. A girl? You've seen them. They play on girls' softball teams. <laughs> Is there anything I can do to help, Stretch? Yes, Miss Brooks, but I'd rather talk to you alone, if it's all right with Mr. Boynton. Why, certainly, Stretch. I've got to get down to the gym for a few minutes anyway. Miss Brooks, you will try to straighten him out, won't you? You know how important he is to the team. I'll do what I can, Mr. Boynton. Good. We'll see you at the snake dance tonight. Now then, Stretch, tell teacher all about it. Well, I know I ain't good in English, Miss Brooks. You're not good in English. I know. <laughs> But ever since the first test you give me, I knew that I was going to improve and get the kind of marks in English that I've always stroven for. <laughs> stroven for? Oh, I know I've got a lot to learn yet, but since I met you, I feel that you're more than just a teacher, that you understand kids, and that's why I come to you now. I ain't much at speeches, so I'll just say it right out, Miss Brooks. I'm in love. In love? With what? A who? <laughs> My best friend's girl, Walter Denton. People don't talk like this in any language. Stretch, are you trying to tell me that you've got a crush on Harriet Conklin? Exactly. 
When she's in the stands rooting for the team, I play great. When she isn't, like she's not going to be where we're going to play over the weekend, I don't. So I ain't going, Miss Brooks. Oh, now, wait a minute, Stretch. Have you told Harriet how you feel about her? Oh, no. Nor Walter, either. I wouldn't want to hurt neither of their feelings. It's just that I can't play without Harriet in the stands. Look, Stretch. I heard that they're going to show the games on television right here in Madison. That means that Harriet will be in the stands. She'll be right on the sidelines watching your every move. Honest, Miss Brooks? May I swallow a board eraser? <laughs> now... Will you attend the ceremonies tonight and then leave with the rest of the team for Martinsville? Well, if you say Harriet will be there on the sidelines, I guess I'll go along. Good. I knew you wouldn't disappoint Mr. Boynton and me. He was kind of counting on me, I guess. Funny thing about him, though. For a smart scientist, he's not very smart about getting someplace sometime. I stretch. What do you mean? Like with you, I mean. Here you are, a smart, pretty, brainy English teacher with no other attachments, and he don't do nothing about it. Stretch. Yes, Miss Brooks? You ain't just flapping your lips, Doc. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will continue in just a moment. But first, here is Vern Smith. Ladies, what's your complexion problem? My skin's so dingy. Mine's oily. My skin's dull, coarse-looking. Doctors have proved that many complexion problems respond wonderfully to proper cleansing with palm olive soap, regardless of age, skin type, or previous beauty care. Oily skin looks less oily. Dull, drab skin, fresher and brighter. Coarse-looking skin appears finer. To win such complexion improvements, simply use palm olive soap. Nothing but palm olive is needed the way doctors advise. Wash your face with palm olive soap three times a day. Massage with Palm Olive's wonderful beauty lather for 60 seconds each time to get Palm Olive's full beautifying effect. Then rinse. Look for improvements within 14 days. Remember, 36 doctors, leading skin specialists, advise this way for 1,285 women with all types of skin and proved it could bring lovelier complexions to two out of three. So forget all other beauty care. Use palm olive soap the way these doctors advise for a fresher, brighter complexion. And ladies, enter the $100,000 49 Gold Rush Contest. The makers of palm olive soap offer $49,000 first prize and over 4,900 other prizes. Get entry blanks and complete rules from your dealer now. You may win a fortune in cash. <laughs> Well, the pre-victory celebration was a huge success. A one-hour snake dance and the six-mile torch parade came off promptly at eight o'clock. And my feet came off promptly at nine. <laughs> After seeing the basketball squad off for the bus depot, I immediately limped home for a nice, warm bath. Mrs. Davis, my landlady, was sitting in the living room when I opened the door. Good evening, Connie. How was the snake dance? Very snaky, thanks. <laughs> did you bid Mr. Boynton a fun goodbye, Connie? Yes, Mrs. Davis. What did he say? Goodbye. <laughs> oh, that man. When is he going to open his eyes and see that? I think they're opening a little bit, Mrs. Davis. This afternoon in the laboratory, he really started to make a noise like an interested party. Oh, what happened? Nothing. I got all involved with the trials and tribulations of a star basketball player and his unrequited romance. But the weekend is upon us, and I won't have to play Dorothy Dix for a few days anyway. <laughs> what are you going to do tonight, Connie? I have some very elaborate plans, Mrs. Davis. Tonight I'm going to have myself a schoolteacher's B&B. Benedictine and brandy? No, bath and bed. <laughs> if you'll excuse me now, I'll drag my carcass into the bathroom and run a tub. Oh, you don't have to do that, Connie. I've already let the water in. I was going to bathe Minerva tonight. The cat? But cats aren't supposed to get baths, are they? <laughs> oh, Minerva loves it. Besides, I've just got to bathe her. Why, are the mice complaining? <laughs> no, uh, she was walking near the sink this morning and slipped on the tile, poor dear. Fell right into some dough I was mixing for bread. Oh. <laughs> then maybe Minerva better use the water that's in the tub. She can wait. You run along, Connie, and take a nice restful... Now, who in the world can that be? Coming! Stretch, what are you doing here? Why aren't you at the bus depot? I ain't going. 
Again? <laughs> well, come in for a minute. Thanks, Miss Brooks. This is Mrs. Davis. You remember Stretch? Of course. He's the famous quarterback on our hockey team, isn't he? <laughs> no, lately he's been playing goalie for our tennis team. <laughs> Could I talk to you alone, Miss Brooks? Naturally. Mrs. Davis, would you mind making a little tea? Not at all, Connie. I'd like some myself. How about you, Stretch? Nice glass of milk? No, thanks, Mrs. Davis. Well, I'll bring some anyway. Nothing like milk for a growing boy. I guess you're pretty disappointed in me, Miss Brooks, but I... Say, what's that? What's what? Right behind Mrs. Davis. There's a cake walking into the kitchen. <laughs> oh, relax, Stretch. I see it, too. That's just our cat, Minerva. She fell into some dough. <laughs> Tell me why you're not with the team. It's Harriet, Miss Brooks. Even though she'll be seeing me play on television, I won't be able to see her. I was afraid you'd figure that out. <laughs> um, look, Stretch, I'll get you a nice picture of Harriet and send it airmail. You'll have it by game time tomorrow night. How's that? Gee, I don't know, Miss Brooks. I would like to have a picture of Harriet, but I wouldn't want anybody to know that I... Walter's my best friend. I know, Stretch. You wouldn't want to hurt Walter or Harriet or either of their feelings. Believe me, I'll get the picture without anyone knowing for whom it's intended. Gosh, I hate to be such a problem to you, but... Well, I never mixed much with other kids outside of an athletics, I mean. And I think my name has something to do with it. Your name? You see, my real name is Fabian Snodgrass. Uh, <laughs> I guess when I was little and kids kidded me about it, I got sensitive. I see. Stretch, do you have any brothers or sisters? Sure. Two sisters and one brother. And do they have uh, peculiar names, too? Oh, no. They all got perfectly normal names. It's like the other day when I was talking to my sister. Rapunzel, I said. <laughs> Rapunzel. <laughs> well, that does it. I'll go into your case more thoroughly when you get back from this trip, Stretch, but right now you've got to rejoin the team. Come along. You won't forget to send a picture, Miss Brooks. I won't forget, Stretch. Lots of luck and goodbye again. Rapunzel Snodgrass. <laughs> now, there's a family for you. Oh, well, now for that bath. I better see if the water's still warm. Oh, it's pretty cold. I better let it out and run a fresh one. Come and get your tea, Connie. I'll be right there, Mrs. Davis. I'm afraid Minerva's water got a little cool. I'm running another tub for myself. Very well, dear. Where did Stretch go? Back to the bus depot. Wait till I close this door. The poor kid, he's hopelessly in love. Yes, I overheard. But he shouldn't worry so much about the other boy in the case. Why, when my sister Angela was a girl, she never went out with one boy at a time. She didn't? No, she played the field, Angela did. Why, I remember one time she went out with twins for over a year before she found out they were triplets. <laughs> Poor Angela. The eternal quadrangle. i better take a look at that bath. There. Nice and hot. Now to get these clothes off and... Oh, no, not another interruption. Hi, Miss Brooks. It's me. Can I come in for a minute? Yes, Walter, but that's about all. I'm trying to take a bath. Well, that'll have to wait, Miss Brooks. Well, it's getting plenty of practice. What's the matter, Walter? It's Stretch. He disappeared from the station, and when last seen, he was heading in this direction. He did come here, Walter, but I sent him back down to the depot. Well, that seems like a pretty silly maneuver. Well, what did he come here about? He wanted some advice. He's in love, Walter. In love? <laughs> in love with who? Whom? Who's she? <laughs> He's in love with somebody that doesn't love him, a girl who goes with another fellow. Now, what kind of a girl would go with a fellow when she could go with a star basketball player like Stretch? I can't divulge the details, Walter, but Stretch was miserable about the situation. But he's not supposed to be miserable. This is a crucial time. If he likes a girl, she should go with him and brush off this other jerk. <laughs> Careful, Walter. You may hate yourself for this. <laughs> Look, I've smoothed his feathers and sent him back to play the game of his life. Now, you get back to the depot and don't say a word about what I've told you. Well, all right, Miss Brooks. 
But I wish I could get a peek at the guy that's got Stretch's girl buffaloed. You may never see him till you start shaving. (laughs) (laughs) Goodbye to you again, Walter Denton. Well, let's see how this water feels now. It could be warmer. I'll let a little out and refill it. Singing in the bathtub. La-da-da-da-da. Singing in the bathtub. Now we'll just put the plug back in, run some more water. I always thought that teaching was my only profession, but bathing can be quite a career, too. (laughs) There, that ought to be just right. Singing in the bathtub. Nothing can go wrong. Singing in the bathtub. Oh, I should live so long. (laughs) Come in, come in, whoever you are. Oh, it's Mr. Boynton. Well, I'm sorry to bother you, Miss Brooks, but Walter Denton's disappeared from the bus depot. Have you seen him? Of course I've seen him. Won't you come inside, Mr. Boynton? Uh, I haven't time, Miss Brooks. You say you saw Walter. Where is he now? On the way back to the bus depot. Oh, good. Stretch got down there before I left, and when he found Walter gone, he was quite upset. Now everything will be all right. Sorry to have troubled you, Miss Brooks. See you next week. Goodbye. Goodbye, you greyhound lock of our... <laughs> At least there's nothing to stop me from taking that bath now. It couldn't have gotten cool in that short space of time. Let's see. Now it's exactly the right temperature. I don't have to let out a drop. Wrong again. Oh, no, it's not you again, Stretch. I'm a monster. (laughs) What do you want from me, an affidavit? What's wrong this time? When Walter came back to the depot, I took one look at him, and then I knew. Knew what? I couldn't go to Martinville without his girl, Harriet. I just can't play unless she's really in the stands. All right, Stretch, I'll do my best. Go back down to the depot and wait for me. What are you going to do, Miss Brooks? I'm going to slip on a straitjacket and run over to the Conklin. <laughs> I wouldn't have disturbed you this late, Mr. Conklin, but it's absolutely essential if you want Madison to win that championship. What's essential, Miss Brooks? That you let Harriet here go to Martinsville with the team. Me? Go with the team tonight? But of course it's Walter. He needs me. Stop squealing, girl. (laughs) But don't you see, Daddy? Walter's the manager of the team and he needs me by his side. I hardly dared to hope for it, but now I know. Walter's my life. My future. My all. Walter isn't the one who requested that you come along, Harriet. It was Stretch. Stretch? But he's the best athlete at Madison. I'll rush to his side at once. (laughs) What about Walter? Who needs Walter? When does the bus leave, Miss Brooks? (laughs) Not, Not so fast, young lady. What's this all about, Miss Brooks? Well, it's Stretch, Mr. Conklin. He's got a crush on Harriet. And if she'll just be in the stands and root for him, he says Madison is bound to win. There's really no harm in it. No harm in it? But Martinville is 400 miles away. The basketball team is composed entirely of boys. Boys and Mr. Boynton. Who'd chaperone my daughter? (laughs) Who else but Miss Brooks? Come on, Miss Brooks, pack a bag and we'll have to... Oh, just a minute, Harriet. I can't go to Martinsville. Oh, of course you can. It's your idea, isn't it? Now go on home and get... Wait a minute. With Mr. Boynton coaching the team, you'll need a chaperone yourself. (laughs) Then why don't you come along, Daddy? What? Me? The principal of the school leave Madison for a weekend? To watch our basketball team play a round robin with the best teams in the state? Tell your mother we're leaving at once. (laughs) Oh, just one thing, Mr. Conklin. Yes? You think they have a bathtub in Martinsville? (laughs) I never thought when I woke up this morning that I'd be riding on the bus with you and the team tonight, Mr. Boynton. I'm glad it worked out this way, Miss Brooks. I am, too. Me, too. (laughs) Oh, uh, uh, driver, I'm Mr. Conklin, the principal of Madison High. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Conklin? My name's Fredericks. What can I do for you? Well, I'd like to open a few of these windows, if nobody minds. It's kind of stuffy in here. Yeah, it is kind of crowded in the bus. You see, we didn't expect all you extra passengers... In fact, there was one kid back at the depot I couldn't even allow on. Which kid was that, Mr. Fredericks? Oh, some tall fellow. Said his name was Snodgrass. Stretch Snodgrass. Well, well just, just as, as long, long as he wasn't an important, important member of the team, team it's 
Stretch not, man! <laughs> Arden as our Miss Brooks returns in just a moment, but first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight, show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a luster cream shampoo. Only luster cream brings you K. Dumas' magic formula blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Gives loveliness lather even in hardest water. Glamorizes your hair as you wash it. Luster Cream. Not a soap, not a liquid, but a dainty cream shampoo. Leaves hair fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen. Soft, manageable. Gives new beauty to all hairdos or permanents. Four ounce jar, one dollar. Smaller sizes, either tubes or jars. Tonight, try Luster Cream Shampoo and be a... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl, you owe your crowning glory to a luster cream shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, Mr. Conklin was furious, and the only way I could square myself with him was to give up my seat to stretch when the bus returned to pick him up. Then I went home, got undressed, and steered my stubborn little course for the bathroom. Now I can really... T oh, hello, Mrs. Davis. Hello, Connie. I was going to postpone Minerva's bath till tomorrow, but she just couldn't wait any longer. Oh? When did you put her into the tub, Mrs. Davis? Just this minute, Connie. Well, I can't wait any longer either. Move over, Minerva. <laughs> week, tune into another Our Miss Brooks show, brought to you by Palm Olive Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo, for soft, glamorous, caressable hair. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written and directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Boynton is played by Jeff Chandler, Mr. Conklin by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Gloria McMillan, Frank Nelson, and Leonard Smith. Men, do you shave with a lather or brushless shave cream? Palmolive shaving cream comes both ways, and whichever way you prefer to shave, you'll find that using either Palmolive brushless or Palmolive lather shaving cream can bring you more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Here's the proof. 2,548 men tried the new Palmolive way to shave described on the tube, and no matter how they had shaved before, three out of every four got more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Get palm olive brushless or palm olive lather shaving cream today. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North, the exciting, fun-packed adventures of an amateur detective and his beautiful wife. Tune in Tuesday evenings over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at this same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. Have you ever stopped to realize how much freedom the American way of life offers you? Remember, in many countries, people have lost the freedom to work where they choose, start their own business, own their own home, invest their money as they see fit. Let's keep that free American way. Let's make it better by working a little harder on our jobs and by being better citizens of our country. Let's remember that the better we produce, the better we live. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Palm Olive Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, green girl hair bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks teaches English at Madison High School. She's very fond of her pupils, and they're very fond of her. She's also very fond of biology teacher Philip Boynton, and he's very fond of his frogs and guinea pigs. 
Well, this absorption in his laboratory is largely due to Mr. Boynton's natural shyness. Well, that is to say that he's shy in the world of reality. But in the dreams of our Miss Brooks, Philip Boynton is every bit as ardent and attentive as any woman could desire. Let's listen. Oh, my darling Constance. He's so lovely, so desirable. I feel I could fly on the wings of our love. Won't you join me, Constance, on a flight to paradise? Contact. <laughs> uh, I, I must pause for a moment, my darling. You know why? The station identification? <laughs> I want to look at you again before I kiss you. And if you notice anything strange in my eyes, dearest, it's stardust. Well, sweep it under your lids and let's get going. <laughs> Oh, isn't it wonderful, Connie? Just you and I alone in our dream house. Yes, it is, Philip. And if anyone comes calling, we'll refuse to answer the doorbell. Sorry, wrong number. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, alarm clock. Oh, you win. Quiet. If I could have slept a few more minutes, that dream might have gotten the Academy Award. <laughs> Come in. Good morning, Connie. Good morning, Mrs. Davis. I've brought you a little breakfast tray. Hope you like the surprise recipe on it. Another surprise recipe? I'm still trying to get used to the last one. <laughs> Rye crisp boiled in breadcrumbs. <laughs> oh, this isn't anything like that, Connie. This is a famous Alaskan dish. Want to know what it consists of? No, what? It's very simple. You just take a pound of frozen whale meat, thaw it out, roll in the patties, and fry in deep seal fat. <laughs> what do you call this Eskimo's delight? Blubber burger. <laughs> Blubber burger? Yes. Uh, of course, not everyone can enjoy them at first eating. How do you stand on this? Where you meet, Connie? I really don't know, Mrs. Davis. I've never stood on any. <laughs> it was nice of you to bring a tray into my room, Mrs. Davis, but I'd rather have breakfast out here in the dinette with you. Oh, thank you, Connie. But you haven't had a thing but a glass of milk. I know. You can't fry that. <laughs> that is, I didn't feel very hungry. Oh, that's too bad. Today of all days. What's so special about today? Don't you know? Let's see. Oh, certainly. Yesterday was payday, so today must be rent day. What do I owe you, Mrs. Davis? I'm not worried about the rent, Connie, although I could use a small loan. How much? Well, five dollars would do nicely. It's for a donation I promised the Ailing Newsboys Fund. All right, Mrs. Davis, I can let you have five dollars. You sure you won't miss it? No, I won't miss it. The people I owe the payment on my car might miss it, but I'll take care of that later. <laughs> I've had my eye on a bag in Justin's department store, and I've decided to throw caution to the winds and buy it this afternoon. The one you told me about, green alligator skin? That's the one. Of course, I'll have to postpone a lot of my time payments. The car, my coat, the watch I bought for Mr. Boynton, but it's worth it. Wait till you see that bag, Mrs. Davis. But what about your creditors? What do you tell them? I'll write them all polite letters. Letters? What do you say? Oh, I'll think of something. I'm an English teacher, ain't I? I mean, uh... <laughs> Aren't I? Uh, am I not? <laughs> you certainly must have your heart set on that bag. Oh, I have. Do you think Mr. Boynton will like it? He likes frogs and lizards and things. <laughs> then this alligator bag ought to be right up his alley. Lucky alligator bag to be up an alley with Mr. Boynton. <laughs> Oh, that must be Walter Denton. He's giving me a lift to school. I'll be there in a minute, Walter. Is your car in the repair shop again, Connie? Yes, the garage says they just have to get one more part for the car before I can drive it again. What part is that? A motor. <laughs> Hello, Walter. Come in. Thanks, Miss Brooks. I just came in to tell you to be sure and bring a coat with you this morning. It's cold in a school teacher's heart out. I mean, some school teachers' hearts, Miss Brooks. <laughs> You're a warm one. <laughs> Thanks, Walter. You can butter me up on the way to school. I'll go get a coat. I'll just be a few minutes. Psst. Psst. 
Did someone let that cat in again? <laughs> it's me, Mrs. Davis. Oh, Walter, I'm glad you came in. We've got to make arrangements for the surprise party. Does she know it's her birthday? No, just like last year, she's forgotten about it completely. Swell, then the party will go over that much bigger. Did you find out what she wants? Yes, I did, Walter. It's a green bag in Justin's. But she's threatened to buy it for herself. Oh, that's no good. I know. So I've thought up this scheme. If we all borrow some money from her, she won't be able to buy it. <laughs> then we can give it to her for a present. I'll call the Conklins and tell them to be sure and borrow something from Miss Brooks when she gets to school. Good. She's so soft-hearted, she'll never turn anybody down, as long as there's a hard luck story with it. I'll put the bite on her and... I mean, I'll borrow something on our way to school. <laughs> oh, hey, here she comes. I'll go back into the kitchen. I don't want her to think we've been conspiring. Okay, Mrs. Davis. Well, that wasn't such a long wait, was it, Walter? Oh, not at all, Miss Brooks. Gosh, that's a nice coat. Well, when did you buy that? Within the next 18 months. <laughs> Let's hurry, Walter. I couldn't touch a morsel of Mrs. Davis's breakfast. I'd like to get a bite on our way. Don't worry. You will. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks will continue in just a moment, but first, here is Vern Smith with an important announcement. Palm Olive Soap is giving away prizes worth $67,000, a grand prize of $25,000 in one lump sum, or $100 a month for life. And that's not all. There are over 2,000 prizes in Palm Olive's big treasure chest contest. Ford sedans, Westinghouse laundromats, from Silver Fox scarves, Toast Master toasters, and it's easy to enter. Complete the last line of this jingle. A fresher, brighter-looking skin is something I would like to win. I'll get Palm Olive soap today. Da 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 da. Write your last line on a plain sheet of paper or use an official entry blank giving complete rules obtainable at your dealers. Include your own and dealer's name and address and mail with the big word Palm Olive from the front of the wrapper of one regular and one bath size cake of Palm Olive soap to Palm Olive, Box 92, New York 8, New York. Now here's the jingle once more. A fresher, brighter looking skin is something I would like to win. I'll get Palm Olive soap today. Da 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 da. Mail your entry to Palm Olive, Box 92, New York 8, New York. Get Palm Olive soap for a lovelier complexion. Remember, doctors prove Palm Olive's beauty results. <laughs> I just had a tune-up job done in the car, Miss Brooks. Runs pretty smooth, doesn't it? Yes, it does, Walter. What kind of a car was this? Uh, is this? A 1938 Hudson. Hmm. Certainly held together for the past ten years. So have you, Miss Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm comparing you with a car or anything, but... Well, you're still so youthful. Nature's treated you extremely well. Why, well, you haven't even got any crow's feet. Nature probably knows I can't afford shoes for them. <laughs> I don't like to keep bothering you with my personal problems, Miss Brooks, but could I once more? Could you once more what, Walter? Bother you with a personal problem. It's about a financial matter. What kind of a financial matter? A loan? Are you asking me or telling me? I'm telling you. I mean, I'm telling you. I'm broke. Really? How long have you been a school teacher? No, I'm serious. I've just got to get some money somewhere. It isn't like it was for myself. I wouldn't even ask if it was for myself. Who is it for? It's for a friend of mine. He's a... He's an ice man. And his horse fell down the other day, and he's laid up in the barn now, and my friend hasn't been able to sell any ice. Oh, that's too bad, Walter. He doesn't know when the horse will be on his feet again. And he's just had a baby. The horse? No, the ice man. <laughs> well, that's a switch. His wife has a baby, you see, and they haven't got enough money to buy milk to feed it. Well, let alone the other seven children in the family... Plus oats. <laughs> Sad, Miss Brooks. Saddest thing since Camille. <laughs> How much do you want to borrow, Walter? Five dollars would help a lot. Okay, here you are. Gosh, thanks. Are you sure you won't miss it? No, I won't miss it, Walter. The people who sold me this coat may miss it, but I'll take care of that later. Thanks again. You don't know what this money will do for these people. And you'll get it back just as soon as my friend's foot heals. Your friend's foot? I thought it was the horse who fell. The horse? Oh, sure. But didn't I tell you? 
When the horse fell, my friend tried to lift him up and sprained his own ankle. Oh, great. Between his sick horse, sprained ankle, and having a baby, your friend is the busiest ice man I ever knew. <laughs> well, we're right near school. Oh, gosh, I got so wound up talking about my poor friend, I forgot to stop and let you get some breakfast. Well, after that story, Walter, I'd feel guilty eating anything but hay. <laughs> I'll have an early lunch in the cafeteria. Okay, Miss Brooks. Well, here we are. Thanks, Walter. Say, isn't that Harriet Conklin going up the steps? Yeah, that's Harriet. Oh, you better hurry. She's anxious to talk to you. How can you tell from the back of her neck? I'm psychic about some things. Go ahead, Miss Brooks. All right, Walter. See you later. Good morning, Harriet. Oh, good morning, Miss Brooks. I'm so glad we bumped into each other before school starts. I've been very anxious to talk to you. Walter is psychic at that, among other things. What did you want to talk to me about? Well, it's rather embarrassing. Not that you're hard to talk to or anything, but... Dolly, I just don't know how to say it now that we're face to face. Well, we'd look pretty silly chatting back to back. (laughs) (laughs) What seems to be the trouble? Well, it's really not my trouble, Miss Brooks. It's just that I've got to get some financial assistance for a friend in need. What friend, Harriet? Well, it's a little boy I know. He comes from a very poor family, and in order to help his folks... He shines shoes after school. Now, he's got a little dog that helped him get his business started. What did he do? Put up the money? (laughs) (laughs) No, Miss Brooks. He used to do tricks and track customers. But just the other day, he fell down and hurt his foot. Now, the poor little dog can't even get downtown anymore. Well, I can get him a lift downtown if he doesn't mind riding on a lame horse. (laughs) (laughs) I don't understand. Well, I don't either, but how much do you want to borrow? Well, right after he was hurt, they took the little dog to a hospital, and the bill there was $8. He must have had a semi-private room. (laughs) Well, here's the $8, Harriet. Oh, thank you, Miss Brooks. You sure you won't miss it? No, I won't miss it. The people I owe the payment on my watch might miss it, but I'll take care of that later. Anyway, I still have enough left to pick up that bag at Justin's this afternoon. Yeah. Oh, I mean, what bag? A green alligator job that I've had my eye on for weeks. Oh. Well, before you go to your room, Daddy would like you to stop in at his office. Uh Uh-oh. What have I done now? Why should you think you've done something, Miss Brooks? Golly, just because Daddy's a principal is no reason for anybody to be afraid of him. Oh, maybe you're right, Harriet. Good morning. (laughs) (laughs) Good morning, Daddy. See you later, Miss Brooks. Bye, Harriet. Will you uh, step into my office a moment, Miss Brooks? Certainly, Mr. Conklin. Ah, at ease. <laughs> Have a chair. Yes, sir. As you know, I was a major in the last war. Mm-hmm. Spent almost four years in charge of the post exchange at Camp Bubrick, Ohio. <laughs> South fella. <laughs> yes, although I've been returned to the arms of my loved ones for over two years now, I opened my last box of Hershey's in 46. <laughs> I must confess there are aspects of military life which bear remembering. Such as? Oh, the camaraderie, esprit de corps. Don't you agree, Miss Brooks? Oui, mon capitaine. (laughs) Now, you've been teaching at Madison High for over five years, haven't you? That's right, Mr. Conklin. And in that time, I've had a lot of esprit de corps, but very few raises. I think the last one was Uh, way back in... Now, let's not talk shop, Miss Brooks. (laughs) I uh, realize that you haven't had a raise in some time, but after all, it's a universal complaint these days, and one which can't be remedied overnight. Meanwhile, you get by very nicely on the money you earn, don't you? Well, speaking frankly... Uh, That's the only way to speak, Miss Brooks. (laughs) Now, if you don't mind, I'll come to the point. I've got to have some financial assistance for a friend of mine in distress. Another one? (laughs) This poor chap was one of my GI assistants during the war. Just a corporal, but I recommended him for a War Department citation. Really? Yes. You never saw anyone fill a Coke machine like this lad. (laughs) As for stacking Kleenex boxes... Oh! (laughs) Well... (laughs) After the war, he got married and started to raise a family. That was three years ago, but luck didn't favor this boy. He lost one job after another. Things went from bad to worse. You mean he became a teacher? (laughs) No laughing matter, Miss Brooks. He's just written me that his wife is going to have another baby. Therefore. In three years? (laughs) Uh, 
there's a, a set of twins. <laughs> In any event, he's desperate. He can't even afford a hospital room for his wife. Well, I know where there's a semi-private room if she doesn't mind dogs. <laughs> I mean, how much would you like to borrow, Mr. Conklin? Well, I've asked many of my friends for five or ten dollars. I see. Well, I get but that. But you're such an old friend, Miss Brooks, I feel that I can ask you for fifteen. Before our friendship gets any older, here's the fifteen dollars. <laughs> oh, thank you, Miss Brooks. You're sure you won't miss it? No, I won't miss it. The people I owe a repair bill on my car might miss it, but I'll take care of that later. Very well. That'll be all, then. Dismissed. Oh, excuse me, Miss Brooks, but may I sit at this table with you? The school cafeteria is pretty crowded today. Oh, sit down, Mr. Boynton. You'll forgive me if I go ahead with my lunch. Oh, of course. I want to eat this salad while it's still warm. <laughs> There's something I'd like to talk to you about. Yes, Mr. Boynton? I've heard from many people how generous and warm-hearted you are under your veneer of seeming sophistication. Of course, I've always known that you're true blue, a hundred percent human being, deep down below the surface. Why, Mr. Boynton, you've been peeking at my x-rays. <laughs> I'm serious. I know that I can appeal to you for assistance without fear of embarrassment. And I know when you hear my story, you'll want to help. Et tu, Boynton? <laughs> well, what's your story? Well, I have this friend who's also a biologist. From a poor family? No, no, his family's very wealthy, as a matter of fact. But he's married and has seven children and one on the way. No, he's a single chap. <laughs> but he's got a bad sickness. No, no, he's in the pink of condition. Oh, wait a minute, I know. His little puppy broke its leg. Oh, he hasn't any puppy, but his great Dane just won a blue ribbon. Wrong again. But give that lady a box of Red Heart and two tickets to next week's flea circus. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Mr. Boynton, I'll bet your friend's horse is so lame he can't even ride him to work, hmm? Well, my friend drives a Cadillac. Uh, uh, if you'll just let me finish, I'll be as brief as possible. You see, he's leaving town. He's got about 30 white mice and frogs that he wants to give me. Oh, so that's it. They're sick. Oh, no, not at all. They're wonderful specimens. But they're orphans. Please, Miss Brooks, what I'm trying to tell you is that I'll need about $20 for the added equipment it'll require to house them. Oh, well, why didn't you say so? Here, Mr. Boynton, here's $18. It's all I have left. Let a couple of the mice double up. <laughs> Miss Brooks, I certainly appreciate this, but are you sure you won't miss it? No, I won't miss it. The people I owe the payments on my car, watch, and coat might miss it, but I'll take care of that later. There's only one thing that's not going to be put off, Mr. Boynton. Oh, what's that? A green alligator bag I've got my deep down underneath little warm heart set on. My first stop after school will be the nearest bank that lends money. <laughs> Attention, quiet, please. It, now then, Harriet, it was your idea to have this surprise party for Miss Brooks. Suppose you outlined the plan. All right, Daddy. First of all, did we all borrow enough from Miss Brooks to keep her from getting that bag she wants? Mrs. Davis and I took five dollars each from her. I nailed her for a... Uh, that is... <laughs> I appropriated fifteen. And she loaned me eighteen dollars. Good for you, Mr. Boynton. Oh, I'm afraid it's not good enough, Mr. Conklin. She told me at lunch she was going to the bank and borrow the money for the bag. Oh, golly, that'll spoil everything. I know. Why don't we call the store and tell them under no circumstances to sell her that bag? Tell them uh, we're buying it. Excellent, Walter. It's a wonder that that agile mind of yours doesn't function quite so efficaciously in the schoolroom. <laughs> Gosh, thanks, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> down to the store, pick up the bag, and take it home. Now, who'll get Miss Brooks and bring her over to our house? Oh, I will. I'll call for her at about five o'clock and bring her over to your house at six. Fine. Now, synchronize watches, everybody. <laughs> Let's see. Confidential loan department. This is it. Uh, pardon me, I've read your ads, but I'd still like to be assured that any business we transact will be strictly confidential. You may be quite certain of that, miss. <laughs> what? I said we treat all our transactions with the utmost secrecy. Well, you can let me in on it. 
I'd like to borrow about $35. Yes, ma'am. What is your occupation, please? I'm a school teacher. How long have you been teaching and at what school, please? Five years at Madison High. <laughs> and how do you sound when you've got laryngitis? Very comical. <laughs> They'll write your name and address down, and I'll get you the money. Is that all there is to it? Yes, we don't believe in a lot of red tape. Oh. All you have to do is sign a few papers. First here. Yes. Now here. Right. Now this one. There you are. Now here. Mm-hmm. And here. Again. And okay. this one. Yes. Now we'll start on the second page. <laughs> Here, yes. and here, mm-hmm. and here, mm-hmm. and here, and here, and here, Can I help you, madam? It's Miss, Miss Brooks. I'd like to see an item your department has been featuring in your window display. Uh, what item is that, Miss Brooks? It's a green alligator. What? A green alligator. I've seen it in your window every day for weeks now. Have you ever heard of Alcoholics Anonymous? <laughs> Do you mean to tell me you don't know what I'm talking about? Oh, not at all, Miss Brooks. You know you don't know what you're talking about, don't you? <laughs> or do you? Of course I do. Let's start all over again. There's a purse made of green alligator skin that's been in your window for Oh, the past... that thing. Oh, you wouldn't want to own that. Why, it wouldn't do a thing for you. It wouldn't have to. I've got a job. <laughs> May I see it, please? Uh, 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 funny thing about that model, I sold the last one not a half hour ago to, uh, uh, Miss H. Conklin, I believe. Well, couldn't you get one just like it if I... H. Conklin? That's Harriet. Why, that little demon. Maybe if I get her another bag, she'll trade me the green one. Now, she wears a lot of green. Besides, she has alligator shoes, too. Well, I might as well go over to her house and see what I can do anyway. Um, uh, I didn't mean to eavesdrop on your monologue. But, uh, H. Compton won't be home for a while. She said she had a lot of shopping to do. And then she's going to get a manicure at Antoine's. Well, I'll go to her house and wait. Thank you, and good day, J. Edgar Hoover. <laughs> Mrs. Conklin, is Harriet at home? Why, no, Miss Brooks. She's out doing some last-minute shopping for the... Po- Miss Brooks! Isn't it terribly early? I mean, um, with the days getting shorter all the time, it seems like about five o'clock. It is five o'clock. May I come in, Mrs. Conklin? Oh, of course. Who's that at the door, Martha? Oh, it's you, Miss Brooks. Hello, Mr. Conklin. Martha, did Harriet get back with all... Miss Brooks! <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it a little early? I mean, it only seems like five o'clock. Five, one. Here in the living room a minute, Miss Brooks. Osgood, I'd like to talk to you. Yes, yes. Will you excuse us, please, Miss Brooks? Surely. What happened? Why did that so early? Well, I don't know what it is. Somebody must have ripped off the door. I say. I wonder if they've had a confidential loan lately. I'll be right there. Hello, Walter. Hello, Mrs. Conklin. I got all this stuff. Funny hats, noisemakers, confetti, and streamers. Oh, come on in the living room and we'll start decorating the place. Uh, but, Walter, uh, look who's here, Walter. Hi, Miss Brooks. Hi, Walter. Now, we'll take the streamers and we'll start in this corner of the room and we'll... Miss <laughs> Brooks! When you hear the tone, the time will be 5-2. This one's on me. <laughs> Oh, hello, Mr. Conklin. I, I was just over to Mrs. Davis's house, but you... Say no uh, more. Say no more, Boynton. Come into the living room. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Hi. Oh, hello, Mrs. Conklin. Walter. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Oh, hello, Miss, Miss Brooks. As I started to say, Mr. Conklin, I went over to Mrs. Davis's to pick up Miss Brooks, but she... <gasps> Miss Brooks! <laughs> I know I'm terribly early, but I wish I knew for what. <laughs> I'll answer it. Must be Harriet. Hello, dear. Mrs. Davis. Come in, won't you? I got the bag, Mother, and I had it gift wrapped. Oh, it looks just super. I brought the cake, Martha. Well, hello, everybody. Hello, Mrs. Davis. Harriet. Hello, hello Miss Brooks. Brooks. Well, there's nothing else that we can do now but wait. 
Miss Brooks! Oh. <laughs> Somebody says Miss Brooks once more. I'm going to change my name to Lucy Pumpernickel. <laughs> Cat's out of the bag now. We might as well tell her. Miss Brooks, this little gathering is in honor of your birthday. My birthday? How do you like that? I forgot it again. Miss Brooks, as a token of our esteem and affection, may we present you with this little gift. Go on, Miss Brooks. Open it. The gift is something you've wanted for a long time, Connie. Oh, the green alligator bag. So that's why everybody borrowed money from me today. <laughs> well, that's right. We, we didn't want you to get it for yourself. Well, this is certainly the nicest present anybody ever bought me, with or without my money. <laughs> well, we didn't get this with your money, Miss Brooks. Look inside the purse. What? Oh, what's this? Five, ten, twenty? It's all here. That's right, Miss Brooks. Well, now that we all know it's your birthday, suppose you tell us how old you are. <laughs> Happy birthday to me, happy birthday to me, happy birthday, our Miss Brooks, happy birthday to you. Eve Arden as our Miss Brooks returns in just one moment, but first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight, you can see this come true, revealed by a luster cream shampoo. You'll see your hair lovelier, your wave or curls softer, more glamorous, easy to do quickly. Even in hardest water, luster cream shampoo leaves hair three ways lovelier. Fragrantly clean, easier to manage, brilliant with sheen. Don't wait. Tonight, use Luster Cream Shampoo. Not a soap, not a liquid, but a dainty, magical cream. Discover why it's by far the top favorite cream shampoo. Get the big jar, one dollar. Smaller sizes, either tubes or jars. Tonight, you can be a... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful Luster Cream girl. You owe your crowning glory to... All Luster Cream Shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. So, you see, I won't need the $35 I borrowed from you people yesterday. Here it is. Fine. The interest is practically nothing. Oh, that's nice. May I have a receipt, please? Of course. Just sign here. Yes. And 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 here. and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, dream girl hair. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written and directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Dentists know what cleans teeth best, and over 4,000 dentists say Colgate Tooth Powder with a two-minute routine gets teeth sparkling and super clean. So to remove dull film and get your teeth shining clean, just brush teeth two minutes, morning and night, with Colgate Tooth Powder. Brush inside, outside, and biting surfaces. Always brush away from the gums. See how quickly this gets teeth naturally bright. It removes dull film that improper brushing misses. And Colgate Tooth Powder also sweetens your breath. Try it. Buy Colgate Tooth Powder today. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North. Tune in Tuesday evenings over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at the same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. I'm Olive Soap, your beauty hope, and luster cream shampoo for soft, glamorous dream girl hair bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. Our Miss Brooks teaches English at Madison High, but one of her favorite subjects at school is biology. Or to be completely honest about it, biology teacher Philip Boynton. He's tall, dark, handsome, and painfully timid. <laughs> 
But Connie Brooks is still hopeful. In her own words... I'm still hopeful that he'll look up from his experiment one day and decide that I compare favorably with some of his higher-type frogs. <laughs> Somehow I feel that if I could just be alone with him a few hours, he wouldn't mind my not being wart green. <laughs> it looked like last Saturday was going to be the day. I was thinking about my plans when my landlady, Mrs. Margaret Davis, obeyed my instructions to wake me at 8.30. Up, Connie. It's 8.30. Oh, come in, Mrs. Davis. Good morning, Connie. How did you sleep? Pretty well, Mrs. Davis. How about you? Well, I wasn't going to mention it, but now that you ask, my insomnia has got me a little worried. You see, for the past three nights, I've gone to bed at 9.30 and slept right through the night. <laughs> well, what's wrong with that? I missed the sleeping pill I'm supposed to take at 10. <laughs> but I guess I'll be all right. Tell me, Connie... Why did you leave me a note to wake you? What happened to your alarm clock? Oh, it met with an accident yesterday morning. What kind of an accident? I threw it in the bathtub and stamped on it. <laughs> Thanks for getting me up, though. I've got to be down at Carney's repair shop at 10. That's when they promised my car would be ready. Oh, goodness, it's about time. How long has your car been in that repair shop, Connie? Off and on, about 12 weeks. <laughs> How long have you had your car? Off and on, about 12 weeks. <laughs> I hope it holds together today. I'm driving Mr. Boynton to the football game with Clay City High. Madison didn't play them last year, did it? No, this is the first time. They say Clay City's an awfully nice little town. It's about 60 miles from here, I understand. 55 as the crow flies. You ought to make it in a couple of hours easy. Well, I'd better allow three. My car makes about the same time a crow does on the ground. <laughs> Well, hurry and get dressed, Connie. I've got a surprise recipe for your breakfast. I hope it's not as surprising as the last one, Mrs. Davis. Blubber burgers fried in deep seal fat. Uh, don't you, uh... I'm afraid I haven't time for breakfast today. I'll just have a glass of milk. Hmm? Well, uh, don't you even want to know what the surprise consists of? Oh, no, thank you. Well, I'll save it for you till tomorrow. It'll keep fine. Although a little penicillin may form on the mold. <laughs> Probably do it a world of good. Well, I have to be running along now, Mrs. Davis. I've got to get my car, pick up Mr. Boynton, and then it's off to Clay City. Just think, we'll be alone together for 55 whole miles. Oh, wonderful, Connie. I hope Madison runs up a big score. Me too, but I'm more concerned about scoring with Mr. Boynton. <laughs> Miss Brooks, I just want to finish this fender here. That finished it. <laughs> uh, is my car ready, Joe? Your car? Mm -hmm. Let's see. What did you bring it in for last? One of the headlights needed a new bulb. Oh, yes, yes. Step into the office here a minute, will you? I'll get the sheet on that car. Have a seat, Miss Brooks. Thank you. Should be right here in the desk. Was that a Nash, Miss Brooks? 1935 convertible? Yes, a late 35. <laughs> So it wasn't a convertible until I tried to go through a railroad crossing with the bars down. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, here we are. You say one of the headlights needed a new bulb? That's what you told me. Funny, our mechanic found quite a bit of other work to do on the car. What other work? Well, your spark plugs were shot, so he replaced them, and the points were practically gone. Where to? <laughs> your valves needed grinding, and the wheels were way out of line. Of course, that could have been caused by the warped axle. Practically no barbarian action left in his sprockets at all. <laughs> and your transmission and differential had to be thoroughly revamped. How did I get the car down here? On my back? <laughs> the steering knuckle was way off, so he had to pack that. But that wasn't too much trouble. I'm glad. He was down there ripping off the old brake lining anyway. <laughs> the new voltage regulator we put in should help that shorten the wiring considerably. And a new oil filter will keep your motor cleaner. Now, just a minute, Joe. You didn't say a word to me about any of those things when I left the car here. Well, of course not, Miss Brooks. I had no way of knowing about them until our mechanic checked the car thoroughly. Any more than I could have told you about the clutch lining. What about the clutch lining? Let's not speak ill of the dead. <laughs> it was shredded. And that probably affected the rear end situation. Rear end? It was really dragging. <laughs> now, uh, now, do you want me to total up your bill with the new radiator that's coming or just charge you for the soldering job temporarily? Like I say, Joe, what do I owe you for the light bulb? <laughs> oh, we'll just throw that in. 
And uh, please don't feel that we invented any of these difficulties, Miss Brooks. Every item on your bill was strictly legitimate. May I never smear grease on my hands and charge for a lube job if it wasn't. I've got a good mind to get the Falcon after you. <laughs> What's the total? Well, let me see. Uh, 1450 plus uh, 798. 46 for parts. Uh, 19 for the crown. $9 for the distributor of the crown. Well, it's uh, $112.49, Miss Brooks. <laughs> Call it 113 even. We'll call it 112 even, and I'll have to pay you off by the week, Joe. Oh, that's perfectly all right. Say $10 a week, 20 weeks. 20 weeks? That would be $200. Carrying charges, Miss Brooks. <laughs> Plus lawyer's fees. Lawyer's fees? Well, sure, you're a school teacher, aren't you? Yes. Well, you couldn't keep paying $10 a week out of your salary. A lawsuit's inevitable. <laughs> Well, if I can't make the payments, I'll sell you the car. Are you kidding? With the repair work this heat needs, I wouldn't give you a hundred bucks for it. Look, I've got to have the car today, Joe. I'm driving Mr. Boynton to Clay City to see our football team play. Now, what would it cost me if you put back the shredded clutch lining and the gone points? Hmm? Well, never mind. <laughs> never mind that, Miss Brooks. How much cash have you got on you? Well, I got paid yesterday and just took care of my rent and a few small bills, so I've still got about $19. We'll take it. I believe in one price. You say $19, I say $19. Hand it over. Here you are. And Mother will be happy to know you let me keep my locket. Bye, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Boynton. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will continue in just a moment. But first, here is Vern Smith with an important announcement. Palm Olive Soap is giving away prizes worth $67,000, a grand prize of $25,000 in one lump sum, or $100 a month for life. And that's not all. There are over 2,000 prizes in Palm Olive's big treasure chest contest. Ford sedans, Westinghouse laundromats, from Silver Fox scarves, Toast Master toasters, and it's easy to enter. Complete the last line of this jingle. A fresher, brighter-looking skin is something I would like to win. I'll get Palm Olive Soap today. Da 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 da. Write your last line on a plain sheet of paper or use an official entry blank giving complete rules obtainable at your dealers. Include your own and dealer's name and address and mail with the big word palm olive from the front of the wrapper of one regular and one bath size cake of palm olive soap to palm olive, box 92, New York 8, New York. Now here's the jingle once more. A fresher, brighter looking skin is something I would like to win. I'll get palm olive soap today. Da 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 da. Mail your entry to Palm Olive, Box 92, New York 8, New York. But hurry, contest closes soon. Get palm olive soap for a lovelier complexion. Remember, doctors prove palm olive's beauty results. <laughs> I finally got to Mr. Boynton's apartment house to take him to the football game. He was standing in front of the door holding a big box with a cellophane top, the kind you put an orchid corsage into. I said, Mr. Boynton, you shouldn't have bought me flowers. His answer was typical of the man. With a modest smile, he hung his head, blushed, and said, I didn't. <laughs> oh. Well, then what's in that box? MacDougall. He's a wee one, isn't he? Uh, MacDougall's a bullfrog, Miss Brooks. I took him home from the laboratory yesterday. I don't like the sound of his voice. It's kind of raspy. Maybe he's got a man in his throat. <laughs> Are you taking him with us to the football game? Oh, I'm afraid I'll have to. You see, his neck's pretty sore, and I put a compress on it. Wouldn't want him to scratch it off. He, oh, he should have had his tonsils out long ago. Maybe his folks couldn't afford it. <laughs> Well, get in, Mr. Boynton, and put McDougal in the back. Oh, I'd rather not, Miss Brooks. Let's keep him up here in front between us. <sighs> Goody. I've always wanted to go to a football game with a bullfrog. <laughs> well, are you all set, Mr. Boynton? All set, Miss Brooks. Then we're off to Clay City. It's a beautiful day for football, isn't it? Oh, yes, it is. Do you like football, Mr. Boynton? Well, frankly, Miss Brooks, I, uh, I haven't seen many games. Oh, that's a shame. We teachers should set an example in school spirit for the student body. That's why I'm going today. That's one reason, anyway. I beg your pardon? I said I think we should show more interest in school events. 
Oh, I agree, Miss Brooks. Who's pitching for us today? <laughs> well, we tried to get Satchel Page, but he's tied up. <laughs> of course, we have some good backfield men pitching passes. That's what you meant, isn't it? Oh, I guess so. I'm afraid you'll have to explain quite a bit of the rules, Miss Brooks. Oh, you'll get on to it, Mr. Boynton. Meanwhile, we've got 55 miles to travel together. Just you and I. <laughs> I was hoping you'd feel that way about it. That, that was McDougal. Now, now, quiet, Mac. I want you to rest your throat. Yes, do that, Mac. Now, where was I? Uh, you were saying we've got 55 miles to drive together. That's right. Just the three of us. A man, a girl, a bullfrog. Uh -huh. oh, well, we'll have fun anyway. <laughs> I know a wonderful little restaurant en route where we can stop for lunch. It's called the Blue Goose Cafe. Oh, fine. Uh, look, Miss Brooks, uh, isn't that one of our students pushing that car across the street? Why, yes, that's Walter Denton. Maybe we can give him a hand. Hello, Walter. Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. How do, Mr. Boynton? Oh, hello, Walter. Something wrong with your car? Oh, nothing unusual. It just won't go. <laughs> I think my clutch lining is gone. Oh, well, take a little of mine, Walter. I've got a new batch. <laughs> Gee, of all times to fizzle out on me. I had my heart set on going to the Clay City football game today. Well, why don't you come along with us? What do you say, Miss Brooks? With us? Well, I'm sure Walter would rather get there under his own power. Maybe we ought to try and get his car started. Hmm? Oh, it's no use, Miss Brooks. It won't go. I know this car like the back of my hand. And the back of my hand to you. <laughs> well, it isn't that you're not welcome to come with us, Walter. I know. Why don't we tow you in your car? Tow me. Well, I don't understand the point of that, Miss Brooks. You wouldn't. <laughs> I haven't got any tow rope anyway, Miss Brooks. Well, maybe we could push you in your car. You know, bumper to bumper and shove. Then we got when we got to a nice downgrade. Whee! <laughs> Walter. <laughs> oh, you're kidding me, Miss Brooks. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. I'll sit in the back here. You and Mr. Boynton won't even know we're in the car. All right, Walter, hop in. I wouldn't want you to miss the game. Well, here goes, off to Clay. Did you say we're in the car? Sure, I've got a date with Harriet Conklin. She's a real football bug. Bug? <laughs> <laughs> Don't get excited, Mac. It's just an expression. <laughs> She'll be waiting in front of her house, Miss Brooks. It's just a mile or two out of your way. Naturally. But we'd better hurry if we want to have some lunch before the game. Hang on. Uh, turn right at this corner, Miss Brooks. You'd better slow down for it. Uh, look out for that milk wagon. Boy, that was close. <laughs> oh, are you still in the car, Walter? <laughs> I mean, I hope I didn't unnerve you. Oh, that's all right, Miss Brooks. I'm used to driving with woman drivers. My mother's one, you know. <laughs> one what, Walter? It's only natural for drivers to make mistakes. But my mom has made some whoppers. That I can see. <laughs> Look, isn't that Harriet standing under that tree? Oh, yeah, that's her. Uh, pull over to the curb, Miss Brooks. Yes, sir. Shall I hold the meter? <laughs> Hiya, Harriet. My car's all tattered and torn, so Miss Brooks is taking us to the game. Well, bless your little pointed head. Hello, Miss Brooks. Hello, Harriet. How are you, Harriet? Mr. Boynton, how nice to have you along. Get that leer out of your voice, Harriet. Mr. Boynton's been spoken for. <laughs> in fact, he's been spoken and croaked for. <laughs> What in the world was that sound? Oh, this is MacDougal, Harriet, one of my favorite frogs. You can introduce them formally when we're rolling again. Hop in. <laughs> Not you, Mac. <laughs> uh, we'll get in back. After you, my lady. Thank you, my man. All set? Well, we're off for Clay City. Oh, don't start yet, Miss Brooks. Daddy's coming down off the porch. Hi, Daddy. Hello, everyone. Oh, hello, Mr. Conklin. Bye, Mr. Conklin. Uh, that is, <laughs> how do you do, sir? How's Madison's favorite principal today, hmm? At ease. <laughs> I was just reading about the game with Clay City High. Should be quite a contest. Oh, yes, sir. That's where we're going today. At least we're starting today. Denton, must you sit so close to my daughter? I'm not sitting close to her, Mr. Conklin. She's sitting close to me. I'm over as far as I can get. I've got to pin him down, Father. Walter's the elusive type. 
Of course, he's not a real happy heartache, but he's good for a minor throb or two. Ah, uh, cut it out, Harriet. <laughs> oh, stop those nonsensical noises. Now, there's quite a bit of work I could do this afternoon, filing reports to the Board of Education and so forth. You have a nice day for it, Mr. Conklin. Well, we'd be getting along now. But I got to thinking. Conklin, I said to myself, or rather, Mr. Conklin, I said, <laughs> you haven't seen a football game in a month of Sunday. Let's take in this Clay City game. Then you mean you're going along with us? That's just super, Daddy, isn't it, Walter? Yeah. Super. Well, it'll be a pleasure to have you along, Mr. Conklin. Oh, thank you, Boynton. But what about you, Miss Brooks? It's your car. How do you feel about my coming along? Just ginger peachy, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> well, let's get started if we're going. It's getting kind of late and we want oh, to Oh, I at... won't be any time at all. I'll go back to the house and ask Mrs. Conklin to speed things up. Mrs. Conklin? Yes, yes. She's been out in the yard all morning planting and she's quite dirty. I'll tell her to hurry with a bath and not fuss much with dressing. Well, tell her to slip on anything, Mr. Conklin. A loose rug will do. Well, here we are. Sorry to keep you waiting. Hello, Miss Brooks, Mr. Boynton. Hello, Miss, Mrs. Conklin. Uh, how are you, ma'am? <laughs> Walter's here, too. Hello, Walter. Hi, Mrs. Conklin. Uh, where do you want to sit? Well, I think that you two should be separated. So, Martha, if you would just sit between Walter and Harriet, I'll sit up front between Miss Brooks and Mr. Boynton. Fine. Now, if we can only get somebody to sit between McDougal. Uh, I'd better hold him on my lap. There we go, Mac. Pity he doesn't drive. We could change places. You <laughs> ready? Ah, uh, we're all set, Miss Brooks. Uh, do you know the road? Well, not offhand, Mr. Conklin, but I've got some maps in my glove compartment. Well, I'd better get them out then, Miss Brooks. Could be a very simple matter, getting to Clay City. Uh, let's see here, Route 68 into 44, then west... No, it's east, I guess it is, on 106. Well, what are you waiting for, Miss Brooks? For the directions, Mr. Conklin. Oh, I'll give you those as we go along. Just start her up. <laughs> Well, we're on our way, Harriet. Oh, isn't it fun, Walter? Please, children, you're squeezing me. It should happen to both of us. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Brooks, do you mind turning your radio on? I understand there's going to be a new clue on Sing It Again. All right, Harriet. Gee, the prizes are up to $26,000. And here, folks, is your new Sing It Again clue. The Phantom Voice is no Ziegfeld girl, but a Ziegfeld guy gave her a whirl. Thank you. The 26,000 will come in handy. Who do you think the Phantom Voice is, Miss Brooks? Well, if I knew the answer to that, Harriet, I'd be able to walk right up to your father and say... Yes, Miss Brooks? <laughs> Hello, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> We've been going quite a while on Route 68. Shouldn't we have switched over to 44 by now? Are you questioning my directions, Miss Brooks? Well, no, Mr. Conklin, but... I was a major in the last war, you know. <laughs> and as such, spent considerable time in command of a transport group at Camp Bobrick, Ohio. I'm sure we're on the right road. <laughs> and the caissons go rolling along. Oh, you have quite a voice, Mr. Conklin. Oh, thank you, Boynton. I did a bit of singing round the barracks now and then. Yum tum 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 tum. Oh, that's very cute, Mr. Conklin. Oh, that was Mac, wasn't it? He must be hungry, Mr. Boynton. I know I am. Shall we stop for some lunch at the Blue Goose? Well, where's the Blue Goose, Miss Brooks? Well, I haven't been there since I was a girl, but. Gosh, Miss Brooks, do you think it's still standing? <laughs> Now, just a minute, Walter. How old do you think I am, anyway? Oh, I'd say you're about... Of course to... it's still standing. <laughs> There's only one place to go if you want a delicious luncheon. That's the Pink Flamingo. Oh, where's that, Osgood? You never mentioned it in front of me before. Well, the last time I went there, I was with a bunch of the... Bo Are you sure you can find this blue goose, Miss <laughs> Yes, I think so, Mr. Conklin. Let's see, where are we now? Well, there's a signboard over there, Route 118. Funny, that isn't on this map at all. Uh, you'd better bear left at this fork, Miss Brooks. Very well, Mr. Conklin, but I don't think we're on the right road. This hill ahead of us is pretty steep. I hope the motor doesn't heat up too much. This radiator's just been patched temporarily. Well, up we go. Over hill, over down, yum, 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 yum. 
And the caissons go... What was that? The caissons stopped rolling. <laughs> at least this one did. Well, I'll get out and look at the motor. Uh, keep your seat, Mr. Boynton. As head of a transport battalion, I had considerable to do with motors during my tour of duty. Yeah, well, uh, let's see. Let's see. Well, nothing wrong with the tappets. Radiator's still in one piece. Hand me a hammer, somebody. There are some tools under this seat, I think. Oh, here, let's get out. Here we are. Here's a hammer, Mr. Conklin. Oh, thank you. Now we'll just tap this water pipe here. Oh, be careful, Mr. Conklin. Please, Miss Brooks. <laughs> I know motors backwards. One more good tap should do it. That did it, all right. Well, let's get out and push, folks. We're off to the nearest garage. Well, there you are, folks. There you are. Good as new. Nothing would have happened in the first place if some knucklehead hadn't hit the pipes with a hammer. <laughs> what? Why, how did... Why, who do you think... Why, I'll have you know... Who's this huffing and puffing? Oh, please. Uh, this is Mr. Knucklehead. I mean... <laughs> I mean, Mr. Conklin. Yeah. He's my principal. I... Oh, now, calm down, well, Mr. Let's... Conklin. Remember, this... everything's all right I... now. We're uh... off to Clay uh... City. <laughs> Where do you figure we are now, Miss Brooks? Well, I think According we're... to my calculations, we've been traveling due east on Route 94 for one hour and ten minutes at an approximate mean speed of 40 miles per hour. Any tailwind, Mr. Conklin? <laughs> oh, look, we're, we're coming into a town. Of course we're coming to a town. It's just as I figured. This is it. Uh, Miss Brooks, ask that pedestrian where the stadium is. What pedestrian? Hey, look where you're driving! <laughs> Oh, that pedestrian. Uh, pardon me, could you tell us where the Clay City Stadium is? Well, I can't be positive, but my guess would be Clay City. <laughs> Isn't this Clay City? No, no, this is Boonville. If you'd be kind enough to give me a lift home, though, I could show you where Clay City is. I live just a few miles from there in Flagden. Well, there really isn't much room. We've got three in front and three in back now. Well, it's not much of a ride from here. Perhaps I could sit on this gentleman's lap. What? Sit on my lap? Oh, better take him, dear. We've only got a short time if we want to see the kickoff. Oh, very well. Come on. I hope I'm not too heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll change my position. <laughs> Start the car, Miss Brooks. All right, Mr. Conklin. And this time, we're really off to Clay City. Yeah, thanks a lot for the lift. You're welcome. Now, how do we get to Clay City from here? Oh, that's 29 miles back down the road. We passed through it on the way. What? Why, you... It's so long. You... 29 miles back? Why, that... We could have been... He said that it was only... Daddy, he... remember what? your blood pressure. His ears get awful red, don't they? <laughs> now, see here, everybody. We've got to organize this expedition. There's been no unity of command, that's the trouble. Everybody's talking at once. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Shut that toad up, Poynton. He's not a toad, Mr. Conklin. MacDougall's a frog. A giant bullfrog with tonsils. Quiet, quiet, Mr. Brooks. Now turn this car around and go that way, and don't stop going that way until I tell you to. Off to Clay City. Well, this is Clay City, all right. There's the Clay City National Bank, Clay City Lumberyard. Now, for heaven's sake, Miss Brooks, before you get lost again, ask somebody where the stadium is. All right, Mr. Conklin. Oh, there's a bus parked over there. I'll ask the driver. Excuse me, but could you tell me where the Clay City Stadium is? Uh, sure, it's four blocks left and three right. Oh, thanks a lot. That's the first definite answer I've had all day. Well, I ought to know where the stadium is. I got the Clay City team in this bus. We just beat Madison High 89 to nothing. <laughs> 89 to nothing? May I ask you one more question? Sure, what is it? Did they put up a good fight? <laughs> Eve R. 
Gordon as our Miss Brooks returns in just a moment. But first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight, show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a luster cream shampoo. Only luster cream brings you K. Dumas' magic formula blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Gives loveliness lather even in hardest water. Glamorizes your hair as you wash it. Luster cream, not a soap, not a liquid, but a dainty cream shampoo, leaves hair fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen, soft, manageable, gives new beauty to all hairdos or permanents. Four-ounce jar, one dollar. Smaller sizes, either tubes or jars. Tonight, try Luster Cream Shampoo and be a... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful Luster Cream girl. You owe your crowning glory to a Luster Cream Shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, the trip back from Play City was uneventful. I dropped Walter and the Conklins at their house instead of on their heads. And though I missed the football game, the rest of my plans worked out pretty well. Mr. Boynton asked me to dinner, and without Mr. Conklin in the car, we had no trouble finding the Blue Goose Cafe. Dinner was delightful. The orchestra was playing softly, and Mr. Boynton turned to me and said, That's my favorite tune, Miss Brooks. Would you care to dance? Um. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Boynton, but I promised this one to Mac. Next week, tune in to another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Parmalee Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, green girl hair. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written and directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Dentists know what cleans teeth best. And over 4,000 dentists say Colgate Tooth Powder with a two-minute routine gets teeth sparkling and super clean. So to remove dull film and get your teeth shining clean, just brush teeth two minutes, morning and night, with Colgate Tooth Powder. Brush inside, outside, and biting surfaces. Always brush away from the gums. See how quickly this gets teeth naturally bright. It removes dull film that improper brushing misses. And Colgate Tooth Powder also sweetens your breath. Try it. Buy Colgate Tooth Powder today. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North, the exciting, fun-packed adventures of an amateur Park Avenue detective and his beautiful wife. Tune in Tuesday evenings over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at the same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting <laughs> Olive Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, green girl hair bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks teaches English at Madison High, and though she's fond of her work and her pupils, these last few days have been rather hectic. In fact, she's even had to neglect her favorite faculty member biology teacher, Philip Boynton. And when I have to neglect Mr. Boynton, you can be sure things are hectic. Of course, like most scientific men, he's rather preoccupied. But he doesn't spend all his time looking at frogs and white mice in his laboratory. No, indeed. Every Friday, he goes to the zoo and looks at frogs. <laughs> but in spite of his apparent absorption in scientific matters, I can't help feeling that deep down underneath, there's a definite lack of interest in me. <laughs> but I keep trying. Now, take this past week, for example. I had to get the midterm examinations ready, but I wanted desperately to get my work done by Thursday afternoon so I could keep a date we had for that evening. But maybe I'd better start at the beginning. Thursday morning, my landlady, Mrs. Davis, woke me promptly at 7.30. Oh, Connie, it's 7.30. You've got to get up. Come on in, Mrs. Davis. <laughs> Time to rise and shine, my dear. Oh, I may rise, but you'll have to get your own shine. <laughs> I'm glad you got me up on time, though. 
Maybe I can make up a few questions before my first class. I don't think you should do anything before you finish your work at school. You've been going at this midterm examination too hard, Connie. I don't like to scare you, but I'm worried about your health. Oh, it's sweet of you to take such an interest in me, Mrs. Davis. But work doesn't bother me. I'm healthy as a horse. Well, just the same. Overwork isn't good for anyone, even a horse. You wouldn't want to get... You wouldn't want to get gray around the mane, would you? Oh. <laughs> Heaven for Finn. But I figured I'll be all right if I keep my Fetlock shampooed regularly. Uh, luster cream shampooed, that is. You've got to build yourself up, Connie. Here, I brought you some juice to drink before breakfast. Taste it and tell me what you think it's made of. I should know better, but here goes. <coughs> oh, oh, that's stronger than usual. What's in it, Connie? Well, I would say you took a raw potato, one hard-boiled egg, some rye crisp, a cup of kidney beans, and some spinach, and threw them into the mixmaster. You're slipping, dear. You forgot the hominy grits. <laughs> well, I think I'll skip the juice this morning, Mrs. Davis. I've got to hurry. Walter Denton's picking me up in his car. Oh, is yours in the shop again? Oh, definitely. But the repair job this time won't cost me as much as the fine I had to pay. Twenty dollars for parking. Twenty dollars? Where in the world did you park? The lobby of the Stevens Hotel. <laughs> but how did you ever get in there? Just like anybody else, through the revolving door. <laughs> I'm glad you picked me up early, Walter. I've got some work to get done before my first class. Oh, that's all right, Miss Brooks. Glad to be of service. But did you say you've got work to do before your first class? Yes, Walter. I'm preparing questions for your midterm exams. It's rather difficult getting the right ones. Well, if I may make a suggestion, why don't you forget about the difficult questions and think up the simple ones? <laughs> that would make it easier on you, wouldn't it? Yes, but frankly, I question your motives. I wasn't thinking of myself, Miss Brooks. It's just that I've been looking at you while I'm driving here out of the corner of my eye, sort of, and, well, you... Walter, look out for that truck! Oh! Sorry. I guess I looked out of the wrong corner. <laughs> anyway, I've noticed that you've changed a little. Changed, Walter? Yeah. I remember when you first got to Madison High, Miss Brooks. You were so vibrant. You were actually pulsating with life and energy and... Oh, gosh, you always seem to be sort of shimmering. And that's not all. I come in six delicious flavors. <laughs> I'm not kidding, Miss Brooks. You've got to watch your step. How long do you think the bloom of youth will cling to your cheeks? It's all according to how you put it on, Walter. <laughs> I hope you don't think I'm being too personal, Miss Brooks, but... As I look at you, I can't help thinking of something. What's that? Did you ever drive out in the country and come to an old deserted pasture? Well... And uh... did you ever see at the end of the pasture one lonely old horse with sad brown eyes <laughs> staring over the fence rail? I knew I should have shampooed those fetlocks. <laughs> Comparing you to a horse, Miss Brooks. I know, Walter. I'm not fast enough. Hmm? <laughs> now, it's just the look the horse gets in his eye when he's all worn out. As if to say, I've done my work and now I'm old. Just an old, tired, beat up, lonely horse with nothing to show for my years of faithful service. It's his own fault. When he was young, he probably made a man's neck out of himself. <laughs> Oh, I appreciate your interest in me, Walter, but believe me, I'm not ready for the glue factory yet. <laughs> I hope you're not offended, Miss Brooks. Oh, of course I'm not, Walter. You know how I feel about you. Gosh, I think you're a thoroughbred. <laughs> I mean, I just don't want you to get run down. <laughs> I won't, Walter. I'm used to hard work. I've been working since I was a young girl. Really? I didn't think they let girls work way back in those days. <laughs> What kind of work did you do then? I helped my mother, mostly. They had mothers in those days, too. <laughs> what did you do for your mother? While father was out hunting dinner, I used to help clean up our cave. <laughs> you sound a little sore, Miss Brooks. Oh, don't be silly, Walter. Why should I be sore? Well, the way I word things sometimes, 
It's a little unfortunate, like the stuff about the horse and all. I know you meant it for my own good. Forget it, Walter. I have. Well, here we are. I'll find a place to park, Miss Brooks. You go ahead. Thanks, Walter. Oh, before you go... Yes, Miss Brooks? Got a piece of sugar? <laughs> Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will continue in just a moment. But first, here is Vern Smith with an important announcement. Palm Olive Soap is giving away prizes worth $67,000. A grand prize of $25,000 in one lump sum, or $100 a month for life. And that's not all. There are over 2,000 prizes in Palm Olive's big treasure chest contest. Ford sedan, Westinghouse laundromat, from Silver Fox Scarf. Toastmaster Toaster. And it's easy to enter. Complete the last line of this jingle. A fresher, brighter-looking skin is something I would like to win. I'll get palm olive soap today. da 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 Write your last line on a plain sheet of paper or use an official entry blank giving complete rules obtainable at your dealers. Include your own and dealer's name and address and mail with the big word palm olive from the front of the wrapper of one regular and one bath size cake of palm olive soap to Palm Olive, Box 92, New York 8, New York. Now, here's the jingle once more. A fresher, brighter-looking skin is something I would like to win. I'll get Palm Olive soap today. da 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 Mail your entry to Palm Olive, Box 92, New York 8, New York. But hurry. Contest closes November 20th. Enter this week. Get palm olive soap for a lovelier complexion. Remember, doctors prove palm olive's beauty results. Daddy, you're the principal of this school, and you've got to do something about it. About what, Harriet? About what I've been talking about. Miss Brooks overworking. I was talking to Walter Denton, and he told me that Mrs. Davis told him that Miss Brooks is just killing herself. But, Harriet, Now, I... one way to scare a woman into doing something or not doing something, for that matter, is to make her think she's losing her looks. And another way is to get her interested in doing something other than the thing you want her to stop doing. It's as simple as that. That isn't simple enough. What are you talking about, Harriet? Look, sure. we've got to try and get Miss Brooks interested in something outside of schoolwork. Now, I'll talk to Mr. Boynton first. Then as soon as I find Miss Brooks, I'll send her in here to talk to you. Agree? Absolutely not. Good. I knew you'd see it my way. <laughs> That's the end of the period, boys and girls. Class dismissed. Miss Brooks, could I talk to you for a minute? Certainly, Harriet. Come on up to my desk. Miss Brooks. As one woman to another, I'd like the privilege of being frank with you. Go ahead, Harriet. Well, you're working too hard, Miss Brooks, and it's beginning to show. Where? Well, I don't mean you're falling apart physically or anything. It's just your attitude. Since these midterm exams have to be written, you're almost constantly preoccupied. You don't seem to have your old sparkle and crackle. Oh, great. Now I'm a bowl of cereal. <laughs> I know conditions in school are pretty awful nowadays, and, well, you've got a big load to pull. Here we go again. <laughs> Idiot, ask Miss Brooks. There's a look you get sometimes, like a... Oh, don't say it, Harriet. Oh, I wouldn't hurt your feelings for the world, Miss Brooks. There's nothing really radically wrong with you. It's just that you're taking this exam too seriously. Why, I noticed you yesterday in the cafeteria with Mr. Boynton. You just seemed to nibble at your food. Oh, that's just to make Mr. Boynton feel at home. He's very fond of rabbits, you know. <laughs> I mean, you should forget about work when you're at lunch. Today I want you to relax. Sit down at that table and really tie the feed bag on. <laughs> I'll cut those fetlocks off, that's what I'll do. <laughs> oh, by the way, Miss Brooks, Daddy would like to see you in his office. Mr. Conklin? What does he want to see me about, Harriet? Oh, I'm sure I don't know. Maybe as principal of this school, he feels it's his duty to keep his teachers happy. Of course, you've got to know how to handle Daddy. What do you mean, Harriet? Just take the bit in your teeth and don't let him drive you too hard. <laughs> okay. Come in. Oh, 
about you, Miss Brooks? Have a chair. Thank you, Mr. Conklin. I was just finishing this report from the school board. Will you excuse me for a moment? Certainly, sir. Oh, she is so. Oh, excuse me, Miss Brooks. Hello? Hello. Is that you, Osgood? Oh, yes, my dear. I'm glad you got my message to call me back. I just wanted to remind you that this afternoon we're going, uh, you know where, for tea. Oh, you mean to Mrs. Davis's. I haven't seen Margaret in ever so long. Miss Brooks will be there, too, won't she? Yes, Martha. That's the purpose of the little gathering, to help that party get her mind up. Well, that is, uh, she's been working quite hard lately, and she looks like... That is her face. Should... Confound it, Martha. I can't talk now. Oh, sure you can, Mr. Conklin. Just make believe I'm deaf, too. <laughs> I'll call you later, Martha. Goodbye. Goodbye, Osgood. Oh, uh, just one thing. Yes? If you see Miss Brooks, don't say anything about our dropping in today. That's the prize, Eric. Yes, Martha. Goodbye. <laughs> <coughs> that was my wife. She sends her regards, Miss Brooks. Oh, thank you, Mr. Conklin. Uh, no doubt you're wondering why I sent for you. Well, I'll be brief. During the war, my outfit had the most consistently high morale of any unit in Camp Bobrick, Ohio. Now... What has all this to do with you, you ask? A reasonable question. What has all this to do with you? I really don't know, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> of course you don't. Now, take the time we ran out of ping-pong balls. It was nobody's fault. <laughs> As supply officer in charge of the post exchange, I had discharged my duties faithfully. But still, there it was. No ping-pong balls. <laughs> there were murmurings from the men. Muttering and discontent swept through the recreation hall. But I refused to be thrown into a panic. Do you know what I did, Miss Brooks? I made those men use their heads. Weren't they a little big? <laughs> I mean, uh, how, Mr. Conklin? By finding another hobby. And that's what I called you here to tell you, Miss Brooks. You've got to find a hobby. Oh, but I have a hobby, Mr. Conklin. Oh, what is it? Collecting a biology teacher. Uh, that is, Mr. Boynton and I go to the zoo every Friday. I'm afraid that isn't enough of a change for you, Miss Brooks. No, what you've got to do is learn how to relax. Have a good time. Oh, but Mr. Carpenter... Don't I'm... interrupt. You've got to concentrate on some outside interest, Miss Brooks. Fun. That's what you've got to have. Fun and gaiety. You've just got to enjoy life more. Be merry. Laugh. Laugh. <laughs> Just what sort of form your hobby should take, but you've got to get one. You've got to, Miss oh, Brooks. Oh, please, Mr. Conklin, remember your blood pressure. Yes. I'll get one. I'll have a ginger peachy time. I'll go to Arthur Murray's. I'll do something. You wait and see. Good. Good. That's all I want, Miss Brooks, for my teachers to be happy. That's all I want, Miss Brooks, for my teachers to be happy. Contented and happy. Not nervous. I don't want a school full of nervous racks. You hear me? No nerve. No one <laughs> Before I go, Mr. Carson, may I make a suggestion? What is it? Did you ever think of getting a hobby? The cafeteria is pretty crowded today, Miss Brooks. I don't know how you managed to get this table. Oh, it wasn't hard, Mr. Boynton. I just told the two students who were sitting here I'd flunk them if they didn't leave. <laughs> oh, you wouldn't do that, Miss Brooks. No, not actually. Now, I'll get our lunch, Miss Brooks. Just tell me what you want. Oh, I'll go along. It's fun to shove the little tray along the little railing. Gives me a feeling of power. <laughs> no, no, I'd rather you sit here and take it easy. I've noticed how hard you've been working, Miss Brooks, and now that I see you, uh, there's, there's something in your eyes lately that... Well, I can't be specific, but they just seem to say... All these years of faithful service, and what have I got to show for it? Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I know you've got to get your exam questions set, but the race isn't always to the swift. You've been whipping yourself terribly. Oh, fine. Now I'm my own jockey. <laughs> well, I just want you to know, Miss Brooks, that if, if there's anything troubling you, anything at all, I'd be happy to have you cry on my shoulder. I'd rather laugh up your sleeve. I mean... <laughs> oh, look, Mr. Boynton, it's nice of you to be so concerned, but there's nothing wrong with me. You're right. There, there isn't a thing wrong with you that a good hobby won't cure. Yes, I know. 
And I've thought of a wonderful hobby. Oh, what's that, Miss Brooks? It's called short ribs of beef and boiled potato. Would you get me some? <laughs> oh, certainly. You hold our places here and I'll be right back. Okay, Mr. Boynton. Well, let's see now. Where's that book of questions in English lit? Maybe I can get a little work done while I'm waiting. Hi, Miss Brooks. Eat lunch yet? No, Walter, but Mr. Boynton's getting me some. Oh, and then I won't sit down. Good. <laughs> Look, have you seen Harriet Conklin? No, not since this morning, Walter. Uh, she seems to have noticed my disintegration, too. Really? Mine has been the swiftest decline since the fall of the Roman Empire. <laughs> Tell me something, Miss Brooks. Did you ever collect stamps? No, I never did. Then you're in for a treat. See you later with my album. We'll put in a few hundred new specimens I just got. A few hundred? Oh, look, Walter, I'm allergic to mucilage. You better stop at the delicatessen and pick up a spare tongue. <laughs> Brooks, see you after school. Go along, Walter. Oh, what's the use? I'll just have to lock myself in a room if I want to work. Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. Have a nice chat with Daddy? Yes, Harriet, a nice apoplectic cater day. <laughs> Your father told me to get a hobby. Have you hit on one yet? No, not yet. Oh, I'm glad. I've got one you'll just go mad for. Patternless crossword puzzles. I'll bring a big, super special one over this afternoon. See you then, Miss Brooks. Goodbye, Harriet. And goodbye to my date with Mr. Boynton tonight. Oh, did someone mention my name? Oh, hello, Mr. Boynton. Say, those short ribs look good. Yes, they do. I hope you like to eat them the way I do. Plenty of horseradish. Don't mention it. <laughs> well, let's begin. Here's your dish and here's your knife and fork. Oh, thank you. That was good. What's for dessert? <laughs> You didn't bolt your lunch down already. I'm afraid I did, Mr. Boynton. I've got to get some work done before my afternoon classes. Well, this is terrible, Miss Brooks. You're, you're all keyed up. Look, do you play chess? Not if I can help it, Mr. Boynton. Well, I'm not very good at it, but it's wonderful relaxation. I'd be happy to teach you if you... Yes, well, some other time, Mr. Boynton. Now, if you'll just hand me my check. Oh, oh that's all right, Miss Brooks. I'll pay your, pay your check for you. Oh, thanks, Mr. Boynton. Uh, you can give me the money later on. <laughs> I didn't get much of my test prepared at school, Mrs. Davis, so I've got to get to work right now. That can wait. I've got the yarn right here and two sets of extra large needles. Just look at them. My seconds will call on you at dawn. <laughs> what in the world are those foils for, Mrs. Davis? I'm going to teach you to knit. With this equipment, it won't be any time at all before you have yourself a nice afghan. I don't want myself a nice afghan. Give me an American boy every time. <laughs> Wonderful for the nerves, Connie. Just sit right here and help me roll this skein into a ball. Oh, but Mrs. Davis... I, I do it for you, Connie. Oh, all right. What do I do first? Just hold your hands about six inches apart. That's the girl. Now I'll start winding. Around and 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 Nothing. I just wanted to break the monotony. <laughs> now, tell the truth, Connie. Isn't this fun? Oh, yes, indeed. This is more fun than drawing your fingernail over a slate. <laughs> <laughs> now that we've got a ball, I'll show you how to cast on. Okay. What did you say, dear? Oh, it's the cat. Go away, Minerva. We're busy. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Maybe she wants some milk. No, she just had her lunch. I made it for her myself. Maybe she wants some bicarbonate. <laughs> now, the uh, first thing we do is catch the yarn onto one needle. So, like this. Mm -hmm. And like this. Mm -hmm. Oh, now don't unwind the yarn, Minerva. Be a good girl now. Yes, Minerva, be a good girl, and I'll boost you up to the goldfish bowl later on. <laughs> Look, Mrs. Davis, if it's all the same to you, let's let Minerva knit for a while, and I'll play with the ball. Huh? You can catch on to it in no time, Connie. Oh, I really must get some work done. If you'll excuse me, I'd like to go into the dining room. I can spread my reference books out on the table there. Hmm? Very well, Connie. We'll do some more knitting, but the dining room? Oh, I knew there was something I forgot. You better get in there right away, Connie. You've got company. That's what I like, prompt messages. 
Well, hello. Well, I guess I beat you home, Miss Brooks. I guess you did, Mr. Boynton. So did I, Miss Brooks. Harriet, did you two come over together? Yes, we did. Oh. I drove them. Oh, listen, Walter, too? <laughs> well, now that we're all here, suppose we all keep nice and quiet while I do some work. Hmm? Oh, you can work later, Miss Brooks. Here, I've got the board all set up. Let me show you how to play chess. Well, go ahead, Miss Brooks. I'll start sorting my stamps and looking for prize specimens to show you. And I'll get a crossword puzzle started so it won't be too difficult. Oh, but listen... The first row, here, the, these little ones here are pawns. They move one or two spaces forward. I know the moves of the pieces, Mr. Boynton, but honestly, well, I let's just, just play don't... one game, Miss Brooks. I'll go first. There. Now, don't rush yourself. Chess is a very patient, easy-going game. Have you got a clean handkerchief, Miss Brooks? I have to clean my magnifying glass. <laughs> Here you are, Walter. Oh, Miss Brooks. Yes, Harriet? What's a six-letter word for horse? Have you tried B-R-O-O-K-S? <laughs> oh, I've got an E-Q-U-I-N-E. Look at this sesquicentennial Dutch Guiana, Miss Brooks. You can tell by the cancellation it's legitimate. Go oh, look through the glass. Oh, very pretty, Walter. It's your move, Miss Brooks. What? Oh, the game. I'll just go here. Oh, here's a funny coincidence, Miss Brooks. I need a six-letter word for hobby. M-U-R-D-E-R. <laughs> hey, wait, look at this one. I'll bet there aren't three like it in the whole country. Is that good? I'll get it. Margaret. Well, Martha Conklin, and all good. Hello, Margaret. Where's the hobby room? Oh. We're <laughs> <laughs> in the dining room here, August. Come along, folks. Here we are. Miss Brooks, guess who's here? Dr. Gallup looking for a new hobby. <laughs> Well, let's not waste any time. We'll get right down to our hobbies. I brought over a bag of toys to be fixed for Christmas. I do this work every year. And I help, Mrs. Conklin, with my portable carpentry set. Uh, may I set my vice up over here? Oh, yes, Mr. Conklin, of course. I'll take some of these toys out on the table, if I may. There. There we are. That's not a legal move, Miss Brooks. Well, I was just... Oh, the chess game. I'm sorry, Mr. Boynton. I'll take it back. I'll move my knight instead. There. Ah, this will do you a world of good, Miss Brooks. Give her a broken toy to fix up, Martha. Think you'd like to stuff a few dolls, Miss Brooks? I'd just love to stuff a few dolls, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> Before you do that, Miss Brooks, take this glass and look at this early Cameroon. What's a four-letter word for purgatory? Harriet. Well, that's got to be... <laughs> That's got seven letters. Oh, you mean Harriet. The, the knight can only go two squares vertical and one diagonal. Oh, look at this cute little mechanical man. He can walk and everything. I'll just wind him up. Yeah. Give me some of those pool toys to plane down, Martha. Here you are, dear. Are you having fun, Miss Brooks? Oh, loads, Mrs. Conklin. But would you call the little mechanical man back? He's biting my knitting needles. <laughs> His electric drills are beauty. Oh, I think it was a wonderful idea, Dad. We are having a hobby afternoon together. Oh, so do I, Olga. It's so entertaining. Sure takes your mind off things. I'd better saw some of this down here. What do you mean, Mr. Boynton? The knight can only move two squares vertical. Oh, here's an awfully cute little wagon. It'll be as good as new when we fix the bell. There. Martha, could you show me that new drop stitch you mentioned last week on the phone? Oh, that wasn't a drop stitch, Margaret. Uh, that was a cable, I believe. These loose nails will never do. Never do. Motor seems to be broken on this, sir. Uh, you can tell by the shape of the printing that this is a nine letter work for Billy Go. This horn is fine now. Yeah, a little more planning and drilling to do it. Does it? The last toy is fixed. Yes, and the dolls are all stuffed and painted. Uh, it's been a lovely afternoon, Mrs. Davis. Thank you, Osgood. It was nice to have you over. Well, the main thing, of course, is that we were able to interest Miss Brooks in something that could take... Miss Brooks? Miss Brooks? She isn't here. Oh, that's funny. Where could she be? I'll answer it. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Davis. This is Miss Brooks. Connie, 
Where in the world are you? I've discovered a wonderful hobby, Mrs. Davis. What is it, Connie? Making up examination questions in the balcony of the bijou. <laughs> Miss Brooks returns in just a moment, but first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight, show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a luster cream shampoo. Only luster cream brings you K. Dumas' magic formula blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Gives loveliness lather even in hardest water. Glamorizes your hair as you wash it. Luster cream, not a soap, not a liquid, but a dainty cream shampoo. Leaves hair fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen, soft, manageable. Gives new beauty to all hairdos or permanents. Four ounce jar, one dollar. Smaller sizes, either tubes or jars. Tonight, try luster cream shampoo. And be a dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. You owe your crowning glory to a luster cream shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, I didn't get many questions done, but I did see Rita Hayworth in Loves of Carmen. I knew, of course, that with the examination question still to be done, I'd have to cancel my date with Mr. Boynton. But that was almost inevitable from the beginning. When I finally reached home, I knew I'd have to buckle down. So I headed right to the dining room, opened the door, and turned on the light. Of course you can move the night too horizontal. Why, Mr. Boynton, if I'd known you were still here, I'd never have turned the lights on. <laughs> Tune in to another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Tom Ellie Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, dream girl hair. Dentists know what cleans teeth best. And over 4,000 dentists say Colgate Tooth Powder with a two-minute routine gets teeth sparkling and super clean. So to remove dull film and get your teeth shining clean, just brush teeth two minutes, morning and night, with Colgate Tooth Powder. Brush inside, outside, and biting surfaces. Always brush away from the gums. See how quickly this gets teeth naturally bright. It removes dull film that improper brushing misses. And Colgate Tooth Powder also sweetens your breath. Try it. Buy Colgate Tooth Powder today. <laughs> For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North. Tune in Tuesday evenings over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at the same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Palm Olive Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous dream girl hair bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> Although Our Miss Brooks teaches English at Madison High, her problems, like those of any other teacher, aren't always confined to purely scholastic ones. There's Mr. Philip Boynton, for instance, a biology teacher of whom Miss Brooks is extremely fond. And who, in return, lavishes his affection upon his frogs and guinea pigs. <laughs> and there have been other problems, too. A perfect example of what I'm talking about occurred last Sunday, a grand illustration of what can happen when you let a little softness of the heart spread to your head. The day started off innocently enough when my landlady, Mrs. Davis, Knocked on my door around 9.30 in the morning. Connie! Oh, Connie! Get up, Connie. It's 9.30. Oh, come on in, Mrs. Davis. Oh, I don't like to disturb you like this on Sunday. Oh, that's all right, Mrs. Davis. I've been up. Since when? Since you said, Connie, oh, Connie, get up, Connie. It's 9.30. 30. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I got your note to wake you, dear and... I'm glad you did, Mrs. Davis I've got to do a little checking today On one of my pupils who's been absent all week Eddie Garson But Connie, today's Sunday I know, Mrs. Davis, but Eddie's always had such a good record of attendance I just can't understand it His mother hasn't answered any of my notes And by tomorrow, Mr. Conklin will send a truant officer after him I'm going over to his house today and investigate. It's very nice of you to take such an interest in the boy, Connie. Well, I feel it's my duty to go to Eddie's home, Mrs. Davis. He's always been a good student, well-behaved, with a fine character, and he lives four doors from Mr. Boynton. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I see. Connie, did Mr. Boynton ask you for a date? Well, how could he, Mrs. Davis? I haven't asked him to yet. (laughs) But if I can straighten out Eddie Garson in a hurry, I might accidentally run into Mr. Boynton. I'm perfectly willing to meet him halfway. Of course, if his door opens outward, I'm liable to get a broken nose. (laughs) But I understand that Mr. Boynton likes to take his Sunday morning constitutional by himself. Well, that's what's nice about a constitutional. You can always amend it. (laughs) (laughs) Coming. Miss Brooks. May I come in, Eddie? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Sit down, Miss Brooks. Thank you, Eddie. I'm glad to see you're not sick. I came over to find out why you haven't been in school all week. Well, frankly, Miss Brooks, I've been pretty busy. Oh, well, I guess I can go home now. (laughs) You know, it's no joke trying to raise kids. Kids? But you're only 14 years old yourself. Well, that's what makes it so tough. Oh, Well, I guess I can go home now. (laughs) I've been taking care of my kid brothers, Miss Brooks. You see, my father's on the road and my mother's in the hospital. Oh, I'm sorry, Eddie. Is there anything I can do to help? Oh, there sure is, Miss Brooks. Mom's over in the Clay City Hospital, and I'd like to hitch a ride out and see her today. If there was only someone to stay with the kids. Well... You will? Oh, gee, that's wonderful, Miss Brooks. Hey, Mike. (laughs) Hey, Mike. Hey, Danny, will you come here? What do you want, Eddie? This is Miss Brooks. She's my English teacher at school. Oh. (laughs) I'm uh, glad to know you too, Mike. And this is Danny. Say hello to Miss Brooks, Danny. Hello. (laughs) Uh Now, there won't be any trouble at all, Miss Brooks. In fact, they'll give you all the help you need. Help? Well, yeah, with Tommy, the baby. Help? (laughs) Well, I'll be running along now. I'll be home in time for dinner. Thanks a million. So long. Well... Here we are. (laughs) I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. (laughs) Well, you'll have to wait. (laughs) Oh, on second thought, maybe you two other two better wait. (laughs) Oh, quiet, baby. Nice, baby. Your mother will be home soon. (laughs) Oh, dear. How does your mother keep him quiet? You gotta tell him a story. Yeah, you gotta tell him a story. All right, I'll tell you a story. (laughs) (laughs) Once upon a time... (laughs) He heard that one. (laughs) He's pretty blasé for a child his age. Anyway, once there were three bears... You thought I'd tell him that old chestnut? (laughs) Give her a chance, Danny. She might put a switch on it. And so Snow White and the Prince lived happily ever after. I'm glad for him. I wonder why Eddie ain't home. You wonder why Eddie ain't home? Some English teacher. (laughs) You know, I never in my life hit a child, and this is the first time I ever wondered why. (laughs) Eddie should have been back by now, though. It's after seven. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I'll get you something to eat and drink in a minute (coughs) Quiet, Tommy Now, once there was a girl named Little Red Riding Hood Oh, great Whose father was a traveling salesman (laughs) And the glass slipper fit right over Cinderella's foot Oh, well, thank goodness they're all asleep Now, if I only knew where Eddie was Oh, shh Hello? 
Hello, Miss Brooks. Well, gee, I had a wonderful visit with my mother, thanks to you. Oh, I'm glad, Eddie, but where are you now? Well, I'm still in Clay City, Miss Brooks, with some friends and mothers. The doctor said she can go home tomorrow, and if you'll just stay with the kids overnight... Oh, but Eddie, I haven't got any... Uh... We're one of mothers. Well, gee, I... <laughs> I sure appreciate this, Miss Brooks. I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, well, it's in a good cause. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. <laughs> Once there were three little pigs Let's not bring personalities into this I'm hungry I'm thirsty Well, come on Drop the other shoe (laughs) That's better Now, once there was a big giant. Oh, what a horrible night. Let's see now. I better see what's in the kitchen before hungry, thirsty, and screamy wake up. (laughs) There's not a thing in the cupboards. I better call Mrs. Davis. If they'll only stay quiet for a few more minutes. Hello. Hello, Mrs. Davis. This is Connie. Connie, I've been worried sick. Where in the world have you been? I have no time to explain now, but I want you to do me a favor. When Walter Denton comes by to take me to school, send him over to 225 Park Street. 225 Park Street? Yes, Mrs. Davis. I can't make it to school today. But Connie... I'll tell you all about it when I see you. Hmm, This is mysterious. Not going to school on Monday morning. I'd better call Mr. Conklin. I'll... Just tell him that Connie is sick and... Hello? Hello. Is that you, Osgood? This is Mr. Conklin speaking, yes. (laughs) This is Margaret Davis Osgood, and I just want to tell you that Miss Brooks won't be in school today. She doesn't feel well. Doesn't feel well? What's the matter with her? I really don't know, Osgood. I just know she's quite indisposed. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Mrs. Davis. We always get indisposed on Monday. (laughs) What's that, Osgood? Tell Miss Brooks to take care of herself. Goodbye. He didn't sound very concerned. If I were you, Connie, I wouldn't go in until I... Well, who am I talking to? She's not even home. What are we going to eat, Miss Brooks? As soon as I send one of my students to the store, Mike. You flying hooky today, Miss Brooks? I guess I'll have to until your brother Eddie comes home. Say, that reminds me. I'd better call Mr. Conklin. But what'll I tell him? I can't explain about Eddie on the phone. Besides, there's no proof of his story until his mother comes back. I wish you'd talk to us for a while. You're making me very nervous. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry, Danny. I know what I'll do. I'll make believe I'm Mrs. Davis and tell him I'm sick. Hello? Hello, Mr. Conklin. This is Mrs. Davis. Margaret? Yes, I just wanted to tell you that Miss Brooks doesn't feel very well. What's the matter? Has she taken a turn for the worse? Who? Miss Brooks. Yes? Oh, well, that is, she's no worse than she's ever been. Have you had a doctor? Yes, but how did you know she was sick? You just told me a few minutes ago. I did? Oh, of course I did. Well, I'm, I'm terribly upset about this. Now, for heaven's sake, Margaret, don't go to pieces. Oh, quiet, Margaret. I mean, Tommy. I mean, oh, I'll be all right. Uh, Goodbye, Mr. Conklin. I wish my mother was here. I want my mother. Starring Eve Arden will continue in just a moment. But first, here is Vern Smith with an important announcement. 
Palm Olive Soap is giving away prizes worth $67,000, a grand prize of $25,000 in one lump sum, or $100 a month for life. And that's not all. There are over 2,000 prizes in Palm Olive's big treasure chest contest. Ford sedans, Westinghouse laundromats, from Silver Fox scarves, Toast Master toasters, and it's easy to enter. Complete the last line of this jingle. A fresher, brighter looking skin is something I would like to win. I'll get Palm Olive soap today. Da 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 da. Write your last line on a plain sheet of paper or use an official entry blank giving complete rules obtainable at your dealers. Include your own and dealer's name and address and mail with the big word Palm Olive from the front of the wrapper of one regular and one bath size cake of Palm Olive soap to Palm Olive, Box 92, New York 8, New York. Now here's the jingle once more. A fresher, brighter looking skin is something I would like to win. I'll get Palm Olive soap today. Da 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 da. Mail your entry to Palm Olive, Box 92, New York 8, New York. But hurry, your last chance. Contest closes next Saturday. Get Palm Olive soap for a lovelier complexion. Remember, doctors prove Palm Olive's beauty results. <laughs> Now back to Our Miss Brooks, where we find Walter Denton and Harriet Conklin listening to the radio in Walter's car. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes our newscast Walter, from our nation's radio capital. A little, will you? I think they're going to give another clue for the $18,000 contest on Sing It Again. Okay, Harriet. And here, ladies and gentlemen, is your extra clue to the Phantom Voice on the CBS Sing It Again program. At camp, his father was a king who spent some time at lumbering. Okay, Walter, you can turn it off now. Boy, I'd sure like to win those prizes. At camp, his father was a king. Uh, what was the second line, Harriet? The second line? Da-da, 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 da-da. Oh. <laughs> it was nice of you to give me a ride this morning, Walter. Oh, that's all right, Harriet. If I were the principal's daughter and you were me, you'd give me a ride if my father drove off to school early in the morning without me this morning, wouldn't you? <laughs> You mean the only reason you stopped for me is because of my father? Oh, of course that's not what I mean. I, I thought you might want to ride over and pick up Miss Brooks with me. Mrs. Davis was pretty mysterious about her. Said she hadn't been home all night. Well, where did Mrs. Davis say Miss Brooks was, Walter? 225 Park Street. Park Street? Doesn't Mr. Boynton live on Park Street? Yeah, come to think of it, he does. <laughs> Walter... Remember that picture we saw last week? The one called Her Other Life? Yeah, Harriet. Maybe Miss Brooks has another life. Who knows? She might even be secretly married. Miss Brooks? Married? To who? <laughs> Why, to Mr. Boynton, of course. I don't be silly, Harriet. Mr. Boynton doesn't like girls. He likes frogs. <laughs> well, it's a wonder I didn't think of it before. Why, they might even have a family by now. That's just like a woman, always giving people families. <laughs> well, this is Park Street, and there's Miss Brooks in front of that house. Hiya, Miss Brooks. Here we are. Hello, Walter. Harriet, I'm glad you could... Harriet, I didn't know you'd be along. But now that you are, I've got to take you into my confidence. Harriet, can you keep a secret? Oh, certainly, Miss Brooks. Even from your father? Especially from my father. Oh, good. Then I don't want either of you to mention that you saw me here. You see, I told Mr. Conklin that I was sick, and, well, I'll explain it all later, but right now you've got to go to the grocery store for me. But what is it you're going to explain later, Miss Brooks? That's the secret, Walter. Just take this list and this money and have them send these groceries out as soon as possible. The address is right on the bottom of the list. Well, okay, Miss Brooks, but there sure is something funny going on. Why, there's nothing funny about it at all, Walter. Good day, Miss Brooks, and, and give my regards to the children. Thank you, Harriet, I will. What? <laughs> now, do you believe me, Walter? Look at this order we've just given. Four bottles of milk, one dozen cans of strained vegetables, two chocolate milkshake bars, a large box of pablum, and some swieback. That sure is suspicious, all right. Nobody eats swieback if they're not married. <laughs> <laughs> Look who just came into the store, Walter. Oh, it's Mr. Boynton. Hiya, Mr. Boynton. Oh, it's Walter Denton and Harriet. How are you today? We're fine, Mr. Boynton. 
How are you all? Oh, well, as could be expected, we're anticipating a blessed event at any time now. <laughs> Another one? Oh, yes. Of course, Patricia has quite a big family now. She's even changing her name. Oh, yes. Patricia's one of my favorite frogs. Oh. <laughs> Those, uh, those bundles look pretty heavy, Walter. Can I give you a hand with one of them? Oh, yeah, thanks, Mr. Boynton. We just bought them for Miss Brooks. Miss Brooks? Well, why didn't she come down herself? Well, she looked pretty upset when we saw her last, Mr. Boynton. Here, you better take both of these bundles and get right over there. Me? But get right over where? I guess you never heard of 225 Park Street. Park Street? I live on Park Street. Harriet, he says he lives on Park Street. <laughs> Come along, Walter. We'll be late for school. Don't worry, Mr. Boynton. Your secret is safe with us. Yeah. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> and while Sleeping Beauty was waiting, Prince Charming came to her door. Come in, Prince. Uh, oh, it's the doorbell. <laughs> I guess you got carried away by the story. It should happen to me. <laughs> At last, the groceries. Uh, hello, Miss Brooks. And Mr. Boynton, right behind them. Come in, won't you? He's a big one, ain't he? <laughs> ain't he? There she goes again. Uh, Miss Brooks, who, who are these... these... Uh... Children will do, high pockets. <laughs> They're terribly bright. Now, boys, run to the kitchen and play with the meat cleaver until lunch is ready. <laughs> All right. But please make it snappy, because I'm hungry. And I'm thirsty. Oh, did you have to turn that on? Oh, excuse me, Mr. Boynton. There, there, little baby. There, but shh. Oh, I guess I'll have to pick him up. No. Uh, Miss Brooks, I don't want to pry, but where did all these children come from? Why, any biology teacher knows that. The stork. <laughs> what, what I mean is, whose are they? Well, they're the children of Eddie Garson, who's a student of mine's mother. <laughs> what? Which their father is a traveling salesman. <laughs> it's good, sir. I'm... I'm afraid you're upset. Oh, well, of course I am. You'd be upset, too, if you had breakfast crying and three children cooking on the stove. Well, isn't there anything I can do to help? Yes, there certainly is, Mr. Boyden. You can help me get this house tidied up before Eddie brings his mother home from the hospital. But, Miss Brooks, I I've got to go to school. You're smart enough now. <laughs> In some ways. <laughs> Call Mr. Conklin and tell him you're ill. But I'm, I'm not ill. Well, stick around a while. Your chances will improve. Well, I don't know what this is all about, Miss Brooks, but if you're in trouble, the, well, the least I can do is stand by and lend a hand. Give that boy a box of merit badges and two tickets to the next Olympic game. Thank you. <laughs> No doubt you're wondering why I summoned you two to my office, Harriet. Oh, well, yes, Mr. Conklin. We... I was speaking to my daughter. Harriet? Yes, Daddy? There's something strange going on in this school today. First, Mrs. Davis calls to tell me that Miss Brooks is sick. Twice. Then Mr. Boynton calls, tells me he won't be able to come to school today because he's expecting an illness. <laughs> and then, while I was conducting both their classes, I catch my own daughter... Receiving a note from this... This... Scallywag? From this scallywag. Thank you, Denton. Hand over the note, Harriet. But, Daddy... The note? That's better. Hmm. Dear Harriet, whatever you do, don't let the cat out of the bag about meeting you-know-who in the grocery store and sending him where we did. We don't want to get Miss You-Know-Who in trouble. After all, we have no proof that those little you-know-whos are her. <laughs> Nor are we positive that 225 Park Street is a love nest. You know who? Love nest? What's the meaning of this, Harriet? Well, oh, you wouldn't want me to betray a confidence, would you, Father? Yeah, you wouldn't want her to do that, would you, Father? Uh, Mr. Conklin? Quiet. 
I'll find out what's going on at 225 Park Street. Well, Mr. Boynton, did you enjoy your lunch? Oh, yes, indeed, Miss Brooks. And you know something? Seeing you taking care of those children and then tucking them in for their nap after lunch made me feel that this is where you belong. Miss Brooks, did you ever think of giving up your career as a teacher? Why, Mr. Boynton... I mean it. I've been thinking it over all morning, and, well, I've got another sort of career in mind for you. You have? Yes, Miss Brooks, I have. Why don't you become a governess? (laughs) Oh. Well, I'll tell you what, Mr. Boynton. I'll become a governess when you become a governor. Oh, it's been fun trying to help you out this morning, Miss Brooks. I hope I have been of some assistance with the children. Oh, you've been a tremendous help, Mr. Boynton. They would never have gone to bed so quickly if you hadn't told them that fascinating story about the African tsetse fly. <laughs> oh, it, it was nothing, really. Nothing, he said. It had everything. Humor, pathos, sleeping sickness. <laughs> now, if you'll excuse me, I'd, I'd like to wash the luncheon dishes. No, no, you sit right where you are, Miss Brooks. I'm going to do those luncheon dishes myself. Oh, but Mr. Boyd... No, I... no, I'll have them done in a jiffy. Picture you upon my knee Just okay. me for two and two and three <laughs> Me for you and you for me alone Tom, Tom, ti tam tam ti tam tam ti tam ti tam tam ti tam Oh, I hope that's Eddie and his mother. Be right there. We will raise a family, a boy for you, a girl for... Me! Oh! (laughs) Mr. Conklin! What's going on here, Miss Brooks? I was under the impression that you were sick. I was. I am. (laughs) Oh, what a coincidence you're meeting me here at the doctor's. (laughs) Did you say the doctor's? (laughs) He's an obstetrician. (laughs) What? I don't think I helped my case any. <laughs> well, everything's all set, Miss Brooks. I just... Uh, Mr. Conklin! <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Boynton. I suppose you're here visiting the doctor, too. Oh, of course. He's expecting tadpoles. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's my sinuses, Mr. Conklin. Oh, well, you've certainly come to the right place for treatment. An obstetrician should do them a world of good. Now, see here, you two. I know this is no doctor's office. You know what I think? I think you two are secretly married, and this is your love nest. Love nest? Love nest? Love nest? Love nest? Who are these? What are... Where did they come from? Now, now, please, Mr. Conklin, remember your blood pressure. He turns an interesting color, doesn't he? (laughs) Now, see here, you little... I... I don't know what you are or who you are or... Oh, please. You're Ooh. tight when I was silent pictures. <laughs> Get back in your room, you two. Sit down, Mr. Conklin. Take it easy. But, Miss Brooks, you promised us another story. Get back in your room, or I will kill you. <laughs> Come on, Mike. He's turned on us. Oh, now, please let me explain, Mr. Conklin. Very well, Miss Brooks. Everyone's entitled to a hearing before he's hanged. <laughs> That's what I like, an open mind. Now, you see, sir, Mr. Boynton and I were just taking care of these children until their mother comes back from the hospital. Uh, that's right, Mr. Conklin. It, it was an emergency. Yes. It's all well and good, but why did you lie to me? Well, it would have been hard to explain on the phone, Mr. Conklin. And besides, I didn't want Eddie Garson to get in trouble. He's been absent all week taking care of his little brother. A very touching story, Miss Brooks. I don't doubt that your motives were of the highest, but I can't run a school that way. Miss Brooks... Unless you're in your classroom for the afternoon session, you had better look elsewhere for employment. Oh, that must be Eddie now. I'll get it. Eddie, I thought you'd never get... Where's your mother? Well, she's paying the cab, Miss Brooks. She'll be right in. The doctor says she's fine. Oh, good. Then she'll be able to take care of her family again, and I can get back to school. Oh, oh, no, you can't, Miss Brooks. We need you more than ever now. Look, in this blanket here, a brand new baby brother. Once upon a time, there was a governess named Connie Brooks. <laughs> Eve Arden as our Miss Brooks returns in just a moment. But first... Dream girl, dream girl, dream girl. 
beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight, show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a luster cream shampoo. Only luster cream brings you K. Dumit's magic formula blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Gives loveliness lather even in hardest water. Glamorizes your hair as you wash it. Luster cream. Not a soap, not a liquid, but a dainty cream shampoo. Leaves hair fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen. Soft, manageable. Gives new beauty to all hairdos or permanents. Four ounce jar, one dollar. Smaller sizes, either tubes or jars. Tonight, try Luster Cream Shampoo and be a dream girl, dream girl, beautiful Luster Cream Girl. You owe your crowning glory to a Luster Cream Shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, I couldn't afford to lose my job at school, and yet I hated to leave Mrs. Garson in the lurch. So I did the only thing possible under the circumstances. I got somebody to help out in my place. Before I left for the afternoon sessions, I gave a few last-minute instructions. Uh, now, be sure the formula isn't too hot, and don't be stingy with the talcum powder. Any other questions? What should I do with the safety pins when they're not in use? <laughs> But with a baby this age, you won't have that problem. Goodbye, Mr. Conklin. Uh <laughs> Next week, tune in to another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Palm Olive Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, dream girl hair. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns. Written and directed by Al Lewis with music by Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Boynton was played by Jeff Chandler. Mr. Conklin by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Gloria McMillan, Tommy Cook, Sandra Gould, Bobby Ellis, and Jeff Silver. Dentists know what cleans teeth best. And over 4,000 dentists say... Colgate Tooth Powder, with a two-minute routine, gets teeth sparkling and super clean. So to remove dull film and get your teeth shining clean, just brush teeth two minutes, morning and night, with Colgate Tooth Powder. Brush inside, outside, and biting surfaces. Always brush away from the gums. See how quickly this gets teeth naturally bright. It removes dull film that improper brushing misses. And Colgate Tooth Powder also sweetens your breath. Try it. Buy Colgate Tooth Powder today. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North, the exciting, fun-packed adventures of an amateur Park Avenue detective and his beautiful wife. Tune in Tuesday evenings over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at this same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Palm Olive Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, dream girl hair bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks teaches English at Madison High School. And although one day in the life of a school teacher is pretty much the same as the next, at night you... Well, perhaps we'd better let Connie Brooks speak for herself. Although one day in the life of a schoolteacher is pretty much the same as the next, at night, you wish you were dead. <laughs> Not that I'm bored. How could I be with Mr. Philip Boynton teaching biology at Madison? Of course, every new frog he gets in his laboratory represents an arch rival. But I shouldn't complain. It gives me an added interest in life. Each morning before I get out of bed, I look down to see if I'm getting webbed feet. <laughs> Somehow, ever since we've been on the faculty together, Mr. Boynton just doesn't seem to think of me as a woman. I can't quite understand that, because when I think of Mr. Boynton, I always think of me as a woman. <laughs> and I almost...
almost always think of Mr. Boynton or dream about him. Like the other morning around 7.25. Of course, Philip, I'd love to go dancing with you. When will you come for me? That's quick work. (laughs) Me, Connie, may I come in? Oh, it's Mrs. Davis. Come in, Mrs. Davis. I thought I'd wait before your alarm clock went off. It's so loud and nerve-wracking. Oh, I'm pretty used to it by now, Mrs. Davis. (laughs) I always like to clear my throat before I pour orange juice into it. I guess I'd better get up and perform my morning ablutions, like they say. You can ablute later, Connie. <laughs> you stay right where you are. Oh, but Mrs. Davis, it's 7.30. No, no, it isn't. I set the clock a half hour ahead. But why? Snap. Snap? That's right. They want pictures of you from the minute you first wake up till you go to sleep. Who does? Snap. You're faded. Uh... <laughs> all this about, Mrs. Davis? Snap is a magazine, Connie. Some time ago, I read that they were looking for the ideal American teacher for an interview. The next thing I knew, the layout editor was here in town and had called me up for an appointment with you. Me? But why me? I guess somebody recommended you as the model teacher. Somebody like who? Somebody like me. I wrote them all about you. What a wonderful teacher you are and how all your pupils love you. Oh, you shouldn't have done that, Mrs. Davis. I didn't. What? I discovered the letter in my desk this morning. I'd forgotten to mail it. (laughs) So it must have been somebody else who... Oh, here they are, Connie. They've been waiting in the living room. Oh, but Mrs. Davis, I'm not dressed. Come on in, folks. Snap, snap's a school teacher. Uh, Where is the little lady? Oh! Here she is. Well, and not such a little lady after all. Tootsies reach all the way over the end of the bed. (laughs) Those are my stockings hanging over the rail. Uh, My name is Peterson. Uh, Pete to my friends. And, uh... This is Miss Forrest. How do you do? If you'll just wait in the living room for a few minutes, I'll get myself a Well, frankly, Miss Brooks, we'd rather start in here. You see, I'm the layout editor. That's nice, but before you lay me out, (laughs) I'd like to comb my hair and wash my face. I wish you wouldn't. Just put your head back on the pillow for a minute, will you? Oh, but I... You pose the way the folks want you to, Connie. I'm going to make some breakfast for all of us. Swell, that'll be our second shot. Snap, snaps the school teacher snapping up a breakfast. Good, huh? <laughs> Very snappy. Wait a few minutes. Now, as I was saying, my dear, we don't want you to do a thing for this picture. Realism is what our readers want. The eyelids practically stuck together. Little straggly clumps of hair flopping over the ears. And those little tired lines around the mouth that looks like it just tasted a raw lamb chop. <laughs> we want you just the way you are. Thank you, dear. <laughs> Have you picked your pallbearers yet? <laughs> That's just what we want. That snarling look when the teacher first gets up in the morning. Got it. Now listen, you two. (laughs) We're going to be together all day. It'll be much more pleasant for all of us if you cooperate. Well, it isn't that I don't want to cooperate. It's just that I don't like to have my picture taken without a little makeup. Even if it's only an inch or two like you've got on. a little, aren't you? I use very little makeup. A dab here and a dab there. Here a dab, there a dab, everywhere a dab, dab. (laughs) No, Miss Forrest, I'm not sure I really want this spread. I know, dear, but when a woman reaches a certain age, some spread is inevitable. Oh! You mean in the magazine? Oh, yes. Well, let's talk about it after breakfast. I'm starved. Good. Will you join us at the table, or do you want your saucer of milk on the back fence? (laughs) Well, I hope you enjoyed my pancakes. 
You know, the batter is my own invention. Oh, really? Uh, what's in it? If she tells you, you'll never eat them again. <laughs> Instead of eggs, I use hot peanut oil. Then to the customary amount of flour and milk, I had half a cup of baking powder mixed with cornmeal, two cups of yummy yogurt. And while the whole thing is being whipped in the mix master, I gradually add a teaspoonful of cider vinegar and just a smidgen of goose liver. <laughs> She's got a recipe for stuffed cabbage that would send you screaming into the hills. <laughs> oh, now, Connie, it isn't that good. Hmm. Well, I'll help you clear the table, Mrs. Davis. Oh, get a shot of this, Pete. The yeah. school teacher helps out with chores at home before going to classroom. Up uh, here, take a stack of dishes, Miss Brooks. All right. I don't mind your taking my picture so much now that I'm dressed. Well, I don't blame you, my dear. That's a very nice suit. Uh, shark skin, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's such durable material. One can tell at a glance that it's worn you for years. <laughs> You're very observant. It would be a shame to see those great big eyes of yours closed for a while. <laughs> I think maybe you'd better get somebody else for these pictures. But, Connie, think of the prestige it will give you at school. It will? Of course. Everybody making a fuss over you. Why, I bet it would make even Mr. Boynton sit up and beg. Mr. Boynton? Uh, the school mascot. He's a schnauzer. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try to pet him because he snaps. What? Mm, oh, never mind. Don't worry about it. I've changed my mind. You can take all the pictures you want. <laughs> Oh, that must be Walter Denton. He said he'd pick me up this morning. Oh, that's right. Your car is in the repair shop again, isn't it, Connie? Oh, you own a car, Miss Brooks? Yes, I do. Well, what kind of a car? Well, I had a brand new 49 Hudson, but I didn't want to show off, so I traded it for a 32 Stutz. <laughs> Walter, eh? Must be nice to have a man call for you in the morning. Who is he? The well-known absent-minded professor? No, dear. This one's more your type. Oh? Sixteen years old, and he can't run very fast. <laughs> Say, uh, you think Walter will mind if we ride down to school with you, Miss Brooks? Oh, I guess it'll be all right. Come along. Goodbye, Mrs. Davis. Goodbye, Miss Forrest. Uh, thanks for breakfast. <laughs> School, Mrs. Davis. I'll help you sterilize the mix master. <laughs> well, good morning, Walter. Boy, somebody looks yummy this morning. Why, Walter, do you really think so? I sure do, Miss Brooks. Where did you meet her? <laughs> meet her? Oh, you mean Miss Forrest. Miss Forrest, Mr. Peterson, meet Walter Denton. They're with Snap Magazine, Walter. Uh, glad to know you, Walter. Hi. Well, I'm certainly glad to make your acquaintance, Mr. Denton. Uh, what subject do you teach at Madison High? Teach? Oh, I'm not a teacher. Although I do coach some of the younger students in subjects that just naturally come easy to me. <laughs> like, uh, lunch period and study hall. <laughs> well, it was a natural mistake. You seem so gallant, so worldly, Mr. Denton. Ah, uh, just call me Walter. <laughs> Walter, then you must call me Stephanie. I must? Gosh, do you really think I'm worldly, Stephanie? I certainly do. I knew this morning was going to be different, even though it started out like all the other crummy mornings in my life. <laughs> On my way over here, I just felt that something romantic was going to happen. And sure enough, here you are. Why, Walter... What a lovely speech. It's not a speech. It's merely what I feel, Stephanie. <laughs> Shall we go to school now, Walter, or just stay here in the casbah? <laughs> Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will continue in just a moment. But first, here is Vern Smith with an important announcement. Ladies, what's your complexion problem? My skin's so dingy. Mine's oily. My skin's dull, coarse-looking. For a lovelier complexion, you must stop improper cleansing. Instead, use palm olive soap the way doctors advise. Leading skin specialists have now proved the palm olive plan, using nothing but palm olive soap, can bring fresher, brighter complexions. Yes, regardless of age, type of skin, or previous beauty care. Now, here's what these doctors advise. 
Wash your face with palm olive soap. Massaging for one minute with palm olive's soft, lovely lather. This cleansing massage brings your skin palm olive soap's full beautifying effect. Rinse. Do this three times a day for 14 days. It's that simple. But remember, 36 doctors, leading skin specialists, advise this way for 1,285 women with all types of skin. Dry, oily, normal, young, older. And prove this plan using palm olive alone, nothing else, really works for two out of three. So for a lovelier complexion, forget all other beauty care. Instead, do as these doctors advised. Use palm olive for a fresher, brighter complexion. For loveliness all over, use big, thrifty bath size palm olive in your tub or shower. You know, folks, when I read that Snap Magazine was looking for a model teacher, I was going to write in and suggest Miss Brooks. But then the midterm exams came along and I got kind of busy and I... Uh... But honest, I was going to, Miss Brooks. Thanks anyway, Walter, I think. <laughs> Is her picture going to appear on the cover when the story comes out? I imagine so, Walter. Gee, that's great. It'll sure be a relief from those pictures of glamorous young girls in bathing suits with legs. <laughs> it may come as a shock to you, Walter, but I've got legs myself. You have? Yeah. Of course, they may not be as pretty as Marlena Dietrich's, but then I'm not a grandmother either. <laughs> You're not? <laughs> Rancid one. <laughs> Maybe we'd better change the subject. Uh, Miss Forrest, uh, Stephanie, after you get through taking pictures of Miss Brooks at school, you ought to get some at the faculty student malt hop this afternoon. Malt hop? Well, the faculty call it a tea dance, but we call it a malt hop because it's held in Weber's malt shop. Oh, sounds fascinating. Yeah, they serve a wonderful malt there. Their slogan is, our malts are too thick to sip through a straw. You have to eat it with a spoon. Some of them are even too thick to eat with a spoon. Some of them are even too thick to dance in. We've got a swell jukebox and a cute little dance floor. Uh, before we get to school, Stephanie, I'd like to ask you, would you... Could you... She would and she could and she'll be there ten minutes ahead of you. Well, Miss Brooks, you sound a little put out. You weren't by any chance expecting Walter to ask you to the hop. Me? Oh, heck No. I go with a girl. <laughs> Why, Walter, I'm surprised at you. What do you think Miss Brooks is? A blackboard eraser with teeth. <laughs> Gee, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, Miss Brooks. No, you didn't, Walter. I'm used to it. I was just wondering about Harriet Conklin. Didn't you have a date with her for this afternoon? Oh, sure, but there was nothing definite about it. I merely asked her if she wanted to go to the hop, and she said yes. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know it was that tentative. <laughs> I guess you're going to the dance with Mr. Boynton, huh, Miss Brooks? Oh, did they let schnauzers in? <laughs> schnauzers? Oh, it was just a joke, Walter. I referred to Mr. Boynton as our mascot. He's really the biology teacher at Madison, Miss Forrest. And what a teacher. Boy, is he good looking. Oh, really, Walter? Yeah, he's tall, dark, handsome. Stoop-shouldered, knock-kneed, cross-eyed. <laughs> Uh, hey, isn't this the school? Oh, yeah, I almost passed it. Yes, I was looking at somebody on my right. Well, if you'll just turn your head, Walter, you'll see Harriet approaching on your left. Good morning, Walter, Miss Brooks. Oh, I didn't know you had passengers. Oh, this is Miss Forrest and Mr. Peterson, Harriet. They're here from Snap Magazine. How do you do? Uh, hi. If you'll excuse me, I'd uh, like to get some atmosphere shots of the campus. Oh, yes, do that, please. Snap has picked Miss Brooks as a model American teacher. Oh, that's wonderful, Miss Brooks. And what a coincidence. Coincidence, Harriet? Yes. When I read about it, I sat right down and wrote them a letter recommending you. Well, thank you, Harriet. But of all the silly things to do, I forgot to put a stamp on it. It just came back the other day. That's just like a child of your age, Harriet. What do you mean, child, Walter? You see, Stephanie, this is the infant I allow to toddle at my heels when I'm not involved with some more glamorous creature like yourself. Walter Denton, what's gotten into you? On this crummy morning, Walter's become a man of the world. <laughs> well, I'd better find a place to park. All those that want to better get out here, Miss Brooks. <laughs> you little hinter, you. 
Well, I'll go with you, Walter, and then walk you back to school. I was hoping you would. <laughs> Miss Brooks, I don't like the way that woman looks at Walter. I don't like the way that woman looks, period. <laughs> she certainly is chic, in a cobra-like sort of way. Has she seen Mr. Boynton yet? Bite your tongue, girl. Well, I think you ought to get permission from Daddy before you go through with this interview. After all, he is Madison's principal. Harriet, you've given me an idea. I must admit I kind of liked all the attention because I thought it would make Mr. Boynton sit up and take notice. But I never stopped to think that he might sit up and notice the wrong thing. Well, maybe Daddy won't consent to the interview. Then she'll have to clear right out. Harriet, you are wise beyond your years. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm off to beg for your father's unpermission. Come in. Could I talk to you for a moment, Mr. Conklin? I'm all ears, Miss Brooks. Yes. Uh... <laughs> Mr. Conklin, Snap Magazine wants to do a layout on me as a model teacher for 1948. You, Miss Brooks? Isn't it ridiculous? They've sent a Miss Forrest and a Mr. Peterson to take pictures of me and the unpainted school and the overcrowded classrooms and the strained looks on the faces of the pupils. I can't allow that, Miss Brooks. Of course you can't. I mean, you can't? <laughs> Certainly not. It's beneath the dignity of Madison High. Way beneath, Mr. Conklin. I've always looked upon Madison High and its teachers as my family. And it's the first rule of a family that its problems be kept to itself. Strictly to itself. We should not hang out our wash for every Tom, Dick, and Harry to see. Tom, Dick, and Harry should not see our wash, no. <laughs> it won't do you any good to argue, Miss Brooks. I've made up my mind. Publicity is nothing but a cheap parasitic device designed to prey on the unfettered appetites of the unsuspecting. Publicity oh, is... Excuse me. The so... door was open, so... Oh, you must be Mr. Conklin. I've been looking forward to meeting you, Mr. Conklin. I'm Stephanie Forrest of Snap Magazine. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, well, won't you sit down, Miss Forrest? Uh, I'll be with you in a moment. As I was saying, Miss Brooks, publicity is the foremost blessing of our century. It makes the unknown known. It brings information and joy into the home of everyone. I can just see Tom, Dick, and Harry peeking at my wash. <laughs> Miss Forrest, I was just explaining to Miss Brooks what this wonderful exploitation will mean to Madison High and its problems. Oh, I'm so glad you see it that way, Mr. Conklin. You and I will have to work together on this. I'll need your advice on so many things. Of course, Miss Forrest. Oh. <laughs> well, let's not be so formal. You can call me Stephanie. And you can call me Osgood. <laughs> you can call me a doctor. I'm ill. <laughs> well, then it's all settled. I'll get a hold of Pete and we'll start shooting Miss Brooks at once. Fine. I'll bring my own blindfold. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Conklin, but I... Oh, I didn't know you were busy, sir. Well, I am Boynton. You'd better come back later. So you're Mr. Boynton. Well, no wonder I've heard so much about Madison's biology department. Well, uh, thank you, Miss, uh... Miss, uh... Don't look at me. I never saw her before in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Brooks has such a quaint sense of humor. My name is Stephanie Forrest. But you can call her Miss Forrest. If you want to live to see your frogs again. Well, what's that, Miss Brooks? Never mind, Miss Brooks, now, Boynton. What do you mean, now? <laughs> Miss Brooks, will you stop mumbling? <laughs> Boynton, Miss Forrest here is going to do a story on Miss Brooks for Snap magazine. Oh, really? Then they must have picked you as the model teacher. Oh, that, that's wonderful, Miss Brooks. You know, I was going to write in and suggest your name myself, but well, then I got all wrapped up in my pigmentation experiments and neglected to do so. Well, it's nice to know that you thought of me. <laughs> well, now that you're here, Boynton, what is it you wanted to talk to me about? Uh, well, sir, uh, it's something I need for my guinea pigs, but uh, I'd rather talk to you when, when you're alone. Oh, come now, Mr. Boynton. You mustn't keep anything back from a reporter. What is it you need for the creatures, Boynton? I... I'd rather not say in mixed company, sir. Oh, come now. We're over 21. Some of us are way over. <laughs> oh, 
Come on, Boynton, out with it. What do you need for those guinea pigs? Well, if you insist... Uh, hormones. <laughs> well, that's peculiar behavior. You ran right out of the room. Well, uh, I guess I'd better be running along, too, Mr. Conklin. Just a minute, Miss Forrest. Shouldn't we give the quarry a few minutes head start? <laughs> right you are. Now. Now. Quiet. Quiet, boys and girls. As some of you know, I have been chosen by Snap Magazine as the model American school teacher of 1948. Thank you. Thank you, boys and girls. And now I'd like you to meet Miss Forrest, Snap's layout editor. <laughs> Quiet, boys. Thank you, class. Now, before we take any pictures, Miss Brooks, would you please ask those boys standing in the back of the room to sit down? They are sitting down, Miss Forrest. They're sitting on the top of the desk. <laughs> but why? Well, with the room as crowded as it is, I use them as lifeguards. Lifeguards? Yes, they keep the smaller children from being shoved into the inkwell. <laughs> Snap Magazine sits in while Miss Constance Brooks acts as faculty advisor. Philosophy Club will now come to order. Miss Brooks, I must be fixing your makeup between classes. You're making yourself look like a teacher, a school teacher. Just that so many school teachers I've met bear such a marked resemblance to human beings. <laughs> well, we'll just stick a few pencils in your hair and throw a little chalk dust on your suit. There, that's better. Now, just continue as if I weren't here. That'll be a pleasure. <laughs> now, let's get on with the meeting, Walter. Yes, ma'am. Our subject is, should a high school graduate turn to teaching as a career? But what I mean, Miss Brooks, is in the face of our inflated economy, what security is there in the teaching profession? Well, Walter, the way I figure it is this. When I first started to teach school, a dollar was worth a dollar. Last year, a dollar was worth 60 cents, and this year it's worth 40 cents. So if I were earning more, I'd be getting poorer all the time. Thus, by being a school teacher, I'm actually saving for a rainy day. <laughs> Snap joins Miss Brooks for lunch in the school cafeteria. Thanks so much for getting my lunch, Mr. Boynton. Oh, you're very welcome, Miss Brooks. Here's your change. Ah, let's see. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Swiss on rye. You're the stuffed tomato. And, uh, what am I? Now, there's an opening you could drive a truck through. <laughs> Forrest, is Pete going to take any pictures while I'm eating? In a few minutes. He's getting a bite himself right now. Oh, good. Then you'll have time to smear some mayonnaise on my nose. <laughs> oh, frankly, darling, I'm not terribly interested in you at the moment. Mr. Boynton, when we chased you into your laboratory before, you wouldn't tell us whom you were taking to the malt hop this afternoon. Well, I really don't know if I should leave my work, you see. Oh, uh, there you are, Stephanie. I've been looking all over for you. You're going to the hop with me, aren't you? Well, I can't tell yet, Walter. Good I... afternoon, folks. Uh, Miss Forrest, as principal of Madison High, I feel that it is my very pleasant duty to invite you to the faculty student dance this afternoon. Well, really, Mr. Compton, I don't know if I'll be finished with my... My work. That is, could I give you my answer after I've eaten? I haven't had a bit of lunch. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Forrest. I'll go get you a tray. I'll get you a knife and fork. If you just take my arm, Miss Forrest, I'll personally escort you to the steam table. <laughs> oh, no, it isn't. <laughs> Hi, Miss Brooks. Shall we have lunch together? No, thanks, Harriet. I'm quite full. I've just eaten my heart out. <laughs> I saw what happened just now. Well, it's my own fault, Harriet. My sins have come to roost. Well, what do you mean, Miss Brooks? I knew it. I just knew it. Knew what? I knew I shouldn't have sent that wire to Snap Magazine recommending me as the model teacher. <laughs> Eve Arden as our Miss Brooks returns in just a moment. But first... 
Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight, show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a luster cream shampoo. Only luster cream brings you K. Dumas' magic formula blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Gives loveliness lather even in hardest water. Glamorizes your hair as you wash it. Luster cream, not a soap, not a liquid, but a dainty cream shampoo. Leaves hair fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen, soft, manageable. Gives new beauty to all hairdos or permanents. Four-ounce jar, one dollar. Smaller sizes, either tubes or jars. Tonight, try Luster Cream Shampoo and be a... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful Luster Cream girl. You owe your crowning glory to a Luster Cream Shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, things didn't work out quite as badly as I expected they would. Right before the dance, one of Mr. Boynton's guinea pigs had a blessed event. Triplets, in fact. And Mr. Boynton couldn't find a scissor for them anywhere. So he didn't even attend the hop. Walter Denton was kept in after school by his history teacher, and after a couple of dances with Mr. Conklin, Stephanie Forrest packed up her equipment, packed up Pete, and packed us in. Not long after that, I was sitting in the cafeteria one day when Walter rushed over all excited. Miss Brooks, it's out. Snap Magazine with a four-page spread of you as America's model teacher. Let's see that, Walter. Here, I've got it open to the story. Oh, I'll read the story later. How about the cover? Is my picture on it? Well, it says portrait of model school teacher, Miss Brooks, but here, you better look for yourself. How do you like that Stephanie Forrest? A blackboard eraser with teeth. <laughs> Next week, tune in to another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Palmolive Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous dream girl hair. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written and directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Boynton is played by Jeff Chandler, Mr. Conklin by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Gloria McMillan, Mary Jane Croft, and Jack Crucian. <laughs> I'm Olive Soap, your beauty hope, and luster cream shampoo for soft, glamorous dream girl hair bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> our Miss Brooks teaches English at Madison High School, and although like most of our teachers, she possesses a higher-than-average intelligence, she also possesses the higher-than-average curiosity of most of our women especially when it comes to weighing machines. There's nobody more concerned about the result than a female who has just deposited her penny in the slot. Unless it's the male tub of lard who was on the scale when I got there. <laughs> this happened last Wednesday after school. I was passing the drugstore and just happened to have a penny on me. Tuesday was payday. <laughs> so I approached the weighing machine, and like I said, this brewery horse was stomping on the springs. And when he saw his weight on the little card, he looked around the drugstore, then made tracks for a sign saying girdle department. I calmly stepped aboard, and when my card came out, I glanced casually at my weight, chuckled as if to say, how much accuracy can you expect for a cent? <laughs> and was just about to throw the card away when I noticed my fortune printed on the back. It said, a tall, dark man is coming into your life. Then, of course, I did drop the card. It landed in my purse, and I proceeded on home. <laughs> By the next morning, I'd forgotten about it completely. As usual, I'd left word for Mrs. Davis, my landlady, to wake me at 7.30. Connie. Oh, Connie. Oh, what is it? Better hurry, Connie. You've only got 20 minutes. 20 minutes? What time is it? 7.10, and you've only got 20 minutes to sleep. Oh, fine. <laughs> well, come on in, Mrs. Davis. Did you have a good night, Connie? I said, did you have a good night? Good night, Mrs. Davis. <laughs> you better get up now, Connie. Here, I've brought you some fruit juice. Go on, Connie. Take a sip. Oh, what kind of juice is this? It's a combination. Pineapple, papaya, and passion fruit. 
Maybe it's a genuine Hawaiian recipe. What do you start with, the ukulele? <laughs> After you drink it, we'll have a nice... Why, Connie, what's that little white card? What little white card? This one here on your night table. Let's see. Uh, there's a, a tall, dark man is coming into your life. Now, who do you suppose that could be? Well, it's not Sonny Tuff. He's a blonde. <laughs> Maybe they mean Mr. Philip Boynton. The bashful biologist? No, Mrs. Davis. So far, he's managed to remain in the suburbs of my life. <laughs> well, of course, I don't believe in fortunes on cards and crystal gazing and palm reading and all that nonsense. There is, however, a logical and scientific way to arrive at certain conclusions about one's personal destiny. What's that, Mrs. Davis? Tea leaves. Now, will you hurry and get dressed and I'll brew the tea. After breakfast, I'll give you a reading. All right, Mrs. Davis. Oh, just a minute. What is it, Tony? Before I get out of bed, you better take that tall, dark man off my night table. <laughs> Finished with your tea, Connie. Yes, Mrs. Davis. Mm, let's see now. Where are the leaves? Well, most of them are in my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we are. There's plenty left for a reading. First, we revolve the cup three times slowly between our hands, then quickly turn it over onto the saucer. There. Well, what do you know? The weight card was right. What? There he is, right there in the cup. The tall, dark man who's coming into your life. Don't tell me you can't see him. Oh, of course. For a minute, I didn't recognize him with all those tea leaves on. <laughs> this is an amazing coincidence, Connie. I'd like to get another reading, if you don't mind. Oh, not at all, Mrs. Davis. It's always nice to be sure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, what do you know about that? I know, he's gone. Left town without even saying goodbye. <laughs> Be serious. This is an amazing thing I see in this cup. What now, Mrs. Davis? Uh, I don't think I should tell you. Why not? Because you're not even married yet. Oh, but I'm a big girl now. <laughs> I'll have to find out sooner or later. I never would have believed it. Three of them. Three tall, dark men? No, Constance. Three little ones. Three little dark men? <laughs> Children. You're going to have three children. Well, don't look so shocked, Mrs. Davis. Maybe they're his by a former marriage. <laughs> no, no, Connie, they're yours. But how can you keep your job at school if you've got to take care of... Oh, I know. I'll get Mrs. Fletcher. When my niece Bertha had the twins. <laughs> Mrs. Fletcher took over completely. Oh, now, just a minute, Mrs. Davis. Don't you now, think now it's a little quiet, Connie. You can't prepare... <laughs> you can't prepare too soon for this sort of thing. Now, where did I put Mrs. Fletcher's phone number? I better call... I don't it. want Mrs. Fletcher. I'll take care of my kids myself. <laughs> yes, that's the way you want it, honey. After all, I'm only trying to be helpful. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Davis. This tea leaf business is pretty fascinating. But I better get ready. Walter Denton's giving me a list of school again. Oh, is your car in the repair shop, Connie? Yes, it is. What's wrong with it this time? Well, I can't be sure, but I think that Joe the mechanic and my car are that way about each other. <laughs> Every time I try to separate them, the car blows a gasket. <laughs> oh, there's Walter now. I'll be right with you, Walter. Oh, before you go, Connie, please do me one favor. Certainly. What is it? Promise me you'll be very careful today. Careful? Oh, you mean about my fortune. Mrs. Davis, I give you my word of honor. I'll let you know in plenty of time to call Mrs. Fletcher. <laughs> Walter, it's very nice of you to keep driving me to school like this. Oh, that's all right, Miss Brooks. I don't like to take advantage of the fact that because your car is incapacitated and I can jump into the breach now and then, transportation-wise, that is, you can't very well refuse gracefully, but I'm telling you, you can before I even ask you. That's square enough, isn't it? Square as things in Clyde McCoy. <laughs> but being an English teacher, I practically understand you, Walter. Just what kind of advice do you need this morning? Oh, it's a girl. What's a girl? Harriet Conklin. Why, Walter Denton, you've been wearing your glasses again. <laughs> what about Harriet? Well, I'm afraid it's a pretty long story. That's all right. I have a pretty long ear. <laughs> well, as you know, Miss Brooks, Harriet Conklin is the daughter of Mr. Conklin. Granted. Who, in turn, is married to Harriet's mother, Mrs. Conklin. It all started the night before last. 
See, I told you it was a long story. Only the way you tell it. Go ahead. <laughs> well, the night before last, I had a date with Harriet to go to the movies. When I got to her house to pick her up, she acted like I had bubonic plague or something. Did you? I mean, <laughs> what did she do? Well, she said that she couldn't be bothered with me anymore because a tall, dark man was coming into her life. Her too? <laughs> Must be an epidemic. Where did she find out about this tall, dark man? Well, that's where her mother comes in. Maybe there's a shorter way to listen to this story. <laughs> her mother and Harriet had taken out the Ouija board that afternoon. That's when they found out about this tall guy. Well, after all, Walter, you can't compete with a non-existent rival. That's just the trouble. He's not non-existent. He's not? No, he materialized yesterday. Oh, now, Walter, please. No, it's I... true, Miss Brooks. Harriet told me all about him when I called yesterday evening, although I wasn't going to after the way she treated me the evening before. But when I did, she told me that this tall, dark French teacher had checked in at their house to give her father his papers before he began teaching French at school today. I know you're telling me something because I can see your lips moving. <laughs> What is it, Walter? Well, don't you understand, Miss Brooks? It's called an exchange deal. This teacher came over from Paris, France. What did we send them? Two outfielders and a shortstop? <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but I do know that Harriet sounded like this French teacher was a combination of Maurice Chevrolet and... and... I know. <laughs> Maurice Chevrolet and Charles Buick. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say Charles Boyer. <laughs> That's what I was afraid you were going to say. This teacher must be quite an interesting personality. What's his name? Let's see now. Well, there's an article about him in the school paper. Oh, I know. It's Manette. Jackwee's Manette. <laughs> Jackwee's Manette? Oh, you mean Jacques Monet. Say, that is a romantic-sounding name, all right. I'll bet he's a very nice person. Oh, it's not him I'm worried about. It's Harriet. Since he showed up, she thinks the Ouija board is infallible. The Ouija board? Oh, that's ridiculous. Harriet's much too sensible to... Why, <laughs> I'm surprised at her. Next thing you know, she'll be having her tea leaves read. Three children? <laughs> Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will continue in just a moment. But first, here is Vern Smith with an important announcement. Doctors, leading skin specialists, prove palm olive soap using nothing but palm olive can bring lovelier complexion, regardless of age, skin type, or previous beauty care. Less oily skin for Helen Dixon, Minneapolis. Fresher, brighter color for Clara Franklin, San Francisco. Smoother, younger-looking skin for Rochelle Bouchaud, New York City. Yes, 36 doctors, leading skin specialists, Advised using palm olive for 1,285 women, many with complexion problems. Some had dry skin, some oily, some dull and coarse looking. And using palm olive alone, nothing else, two out of three want fresher, brighter skin. Now here's the plan these doctors advise. Wash your face with palm olive soap. Massaging for one minute with palm olive soft lather. This cleansing massage brings your skin palm olive beautifying effect. Rinse. Do this three times a day for 14 days. It's that simple. But remember, leading skin specialists prove this plan really works, regardless of age, skin type, or previous beauty care. So try palm olive soap this way, using nothing but palm olive, as these doctors advise, for a lovelier complexion. For loveliness all over, use big, thrifty bath size palm olive in your tub or shower. <laughs> Brooks. Thanks, Walter, and don't worry too much about losing Harriet's affection. I'm sure the French teacher is just a passing phase in her life. Hey, there's Harriet on the steps. I'll go find a place to park. See you later, Miss Brooks. All right, Walter. Hello there, Harriet. What? Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. You'll have to forgive me if I seem to be in a reverie. But I've heard about your Ouija board. I don't care what anybody says, Miss Brooks. There must be something to it. Imagine the very next day he came along. It's the first time I've ever seen capital letters in conversation. <laughs> <laughs> he must be quite attractive. Attractive isn't the word, Miss Brooks. No, what is the word? Heavenly. Super heavenly. 
stratospherically heavenly. Oh, please, Harriet. I'll come up a little if you'll come down a little. <laughs> oh, wait till you see him, Miss Brooks. He, he's... Adjust safety belt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Look, Harriet, I think it's all very natural for a schoolgirl to have crushes. I had them myself. You, Miss Brooks? Yes, me, Miss Brooks. I wasn't born an English teacher, you know. I also think it's perfectly normal for a girl your age to think like a schoolgirl in other ways. But I do say this, and I mean it sincerely, Harriet. You don't have to act like a schoolgirl. I don't even worry. But you are the principal's daughter, Harriet, no? May we, Monsieur Monet, may we? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is Miss Brooks. Miss Brooks, je suis enchanté. That is, I've heard so much about you. But it is, uh, how do you say, understatement. You're so youthful, so lovely. Why, you're like a pupil, not a teacher. (laughs) Run along, Harriet. You'll be late for school. (laughs) But we're at school. Oh, when did that get here? Something is wrong. Wrong? Oh, I should say not, Monsieur Monet. It's just that, well, we don't meet such distinguished visitors every day, and, well, they must have given at least three outfielders and two short stops for him. Pardon? Oh, uh, it's just a figure of speech. Oh, and a lovely figure you have, too. <laughs> oh, this is a doll. <laughs> Shall we go into the school, Monsieur Monet? Uh, oui, yes. I have to stop at Monsieur Conklin's office. You, uh, you show me where it is, huh? No? I, I show you where is it, uh, yes. <laughs> and I hope Mr. Boynton sees us together. Uh, I'll direct Monsieur Monet to Daddy's office, Miss Brooks. Oh, you won't have time, Harriet. You have to freshen up before your class. Freshen up? But I just stepped out of the shower. Then give yourself a rub down. You'll catch cold. <laughs> this way, Monsieur. <laughs> Our new French teacher. Good morning, Monsieur Manet. Bonjour, Monsieur Conklin. Uh, excuse me, I mean good morning. Hi, Daddy. Hello, Harriet. Uh, Mr. Conklin, I just came in to volunteer my assistance if you're looking for somebody to show Mr. Monet around the school. I told Miss Brooks that I'd be glad to take Mr. Monet, Daddy. Of course, I'd need your permission to cut one of my classes. Maybe English. I'm pretty well advanced in that. Me too. Maybe we both could cut it. <laughs> Please. Please, I would not want either of you to, uh, how do you say, put out yourselves. Oh, it would be silly to put out ourselves now. After all, we just started to blaze. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure I'll be able to show Mr. Monet the rope. But, Daddy, you're too busy. Oh, much too busy, Daddy. I mean... Mr. Conklin, I have a study period coming up in which I don't I want to hear any more about it. I'm sure Mr. Monet wouldn't want us to feel that because of him, our entire system was disrupted. Oh, certainly not. I can find my, my own way about the premises. I'm sure that... Well, in that case, come along, Harriet. You're in my first class, you know. Oh, one moment, Miss Wolf. Would you do me the great honor of perhaps having lunch avec, uh, the, with me? With pleasure. <laughs> Oh, but I did have a date with Mr. Boynton. Hmm, I think I'll keep that date, too. Maybe it'll open his eyes a little. Uh, I'll see you in the cafeteria, Mr. Monet. But I thought Mr. Monet was going to have lunch with us. Didn't you tell me you were going to invite him to the house, Daddy? Invite him? Uh, well, I suppose so. Uh, thank you just the same, Monsieur, but I would rather not leave the school proper during my first day. Ah, an admirable spirit, Monet. If more of our homegrown teachers had it, Madison High School would be a better place in which to learn something. Something like English, for example. (laughs) Yes. Well, as the little boy in the Fisk ad says, it's time to retire. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Oh, it's you, Miss Brooks. Uh, How are you today? Fine, thanks. I'm glad I caught you before your class got in. I I wanted to ask you about lunch. Oh, I'll be happy to join you. Thanks very much. 
Oh. Well, I had other plans, but how can I resist an invitation like that? By the way, Mr. Boynton, do you speak any foreign language? Just American. Why, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Boynton, you're getting quite a sense of humor. Must catch it from your frog. <laughs> really, though, do you speak French, for instance? No, I don't. Then you wouldn't know what a French person would be saying to me if he said it in French, would you? No, I wouldn't. Good. <laughs> this may be a very interesting lunch for all of us. All of us? Yes, you see, there's a new teacher in school. Oh, you, you mean Jacques Monet? You've met him? Oh, yes. I had to deliver some papers to Mr. Conklin's home yesterday, and he was there. Oh, he's a prince of a chap. We had quite a time together. Be nice to see him again at lunch. Oh, it will. Oh, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, you'll uh, have to apologize to him for me. I'm afraid I'll be a little late. Oh, you will? That's too bad, Mr. Boynton. Why will you be late? Well, it's McDougal here. You know, my bullfrog. He's got me worried, Miss Brooks. It's his throat. He can't seem to croak above a whisper. Oh, that's too bad. Poor McDougal. Hi, Max. <laughs> <laughs> he must have gargled. <laughs> uh, it did sound pretty good, but... No, I'll still have to stay close to him to see how the medication I'm giving him catches on. I'll get to lunch as soon as I can, though. Ah, good old Jacques Monet. He's a real man's man. You've been wrong before, Brother Boynton, but never like this. <laughs> Here's a nice table, Mr. Monet. Let's sit down. Oui. Uh, yes, Miss Wolf. This is certainly a big restaurant. It's a cafeteria, Mr. Monet. Uh, yes. Uh, now then, shall we look at the carte du jour, bill of fare? Bill of fare? Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean menu. They don't have any menus here, Mr. Monet. No? Then how do you select an order? Well, here you don't exactly select an order. You just sort of point and holler. <laughs> I'll show you in a minute. But first, I'd like to ask a little favor, Mr. Monet. As you know, Mr. Boynton is joining us for lunch. Oh, yes. Yes, fine fellow, Mr. Boynton. A real uh, man's man. On him, it fits. <laughs> I mean, he is a very nice man, but he's sort of shy. Shy? Mm -hmm. Why should he be shy? He is tall, muscular, with a fine head of hair, good teeth, pleasing manner. What else is new? <laughs> what I wanted to ask of you is very simple. You see, Mr. Boynton is too bashful to ask you himself, but I'm sure he'd get a tremendous kick. That is, he'd enjoy it if you spoke nothing but French during our lunch. But why? Well, he's trying to learn how to speak your language. He understands it fine, but he's not sure of his pronunciation. He could learn a lot from you about a lot of things. <laughs> well, I suppose I could help him. He's coming over now, Mr. Monet. Uh, remember how you kissed my hand this morning? Uh, Would you do it again, please? What? Uh, but uh, Quickly, I... Mr. Monet. It's part of Mr. Boynton's education. <laughs> Hurry, in my hand. Uh, Miss Brooks, I don't like to be, how do you say, gouchy, but you're pushing out one of my feelings. <laughs> What's the trouble, Mr. Monet? Got something caught in your teeth? <laughs> Just an old cuticle of mine. <laughs> Sit down, Mr. Boynton. Comment ça va aujourd'hui, monsieur? Yeah. <laughs> uh, how do you like our cafeteria? C'est bon. Mr. Monet says it's lovely, but not half as lovely as I am. Why, Mr. Monet, how flattering. <laughs> well, let's see now. What do we eat today? Well, uh, how about the roast beef? That's what I'm going to have. Me too. How about you, Mr. Monet? Tell him in French. Uh, je désire un petit mamite, ou oh, vichyssoise, une salade et une tranche de roast beef, des haricots verts, des crêpes suzettes et une demi-tasse. Oh, Mr. Monet, you and your compliments. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now stop that and tell Mr. Boynton what you want to eat. <laughs> But I do not understand. I, uh, uh, Mr. Monet, uh, hmm? uh, quel voulez-vous manger? Mr. Uh, Boynton, you little spy, you can't speak French. Uh, well, no, I can't, Miss Brooks, not really. Those are just a few words I picked up when I was in the Army. The Army? You were stationed in New Orleans, and you know it. But near the French Quarter. <laughs> well, uh, let us not delay any longer. I don't suppose they have what I really want for lunch, but maybe, eh? Do they ever have frog's legs? What? Oh, don't say it, Mr. <laughs> Monet. <laughs> well, uh, why not? Frog's legs are delicious to eat. Let's all have them, huh? Me? Eat frog's legs? What? I'd feel like a... 
Like a cannibal. If you'll excuse me, I, I'm afraid I've lost my appetite. I, I'll see you later, Miss Brooks. Why, uh, why would he feel like a cannibal if he ate frog's leg? He is not a frog. <laughs> Only in some ways is he not a frog, Mr. Monet. But don't worry about Mr. Boynton now. Oh, yes, you're right. You're right, Miss Brooks. You know, in a way, in a way, I'm glad we're alone. There is something I would like to ask you. You see, I, I have been searching for just the right one ever since I come to America. Now, now, well, I feel that my search is at an end. You are the one I've been searching for. Oh, Mr. Monet, but Mr. Boynton's gone now. You don't have to talk like that to me. It's... Oh, I don't think of Mr. Boynton. I, I think of you, Miss Brooks. Ma chère, Miss Brooks. I have something personal to talk to you about. But right now I'm late for an appointment with Mr. Conklin. Can you meet me someplace, right after school? How about the Casbah? I mean... <laughs> I mean the park, Mr. Fine, Mr. fine. Of course, I have several papers to mark, and besides, I have to formulate my plans for tomorrow's class, and there are some other routine affairs I must take care of. Oh, I realize this. How long will it all take? Well, school doesn't let out until three, and it's a 20-minute walk to the park. Would 310 be all right? <laughs> I, I will come right to the point, Miss Brooks. I have met you here in the park to make you what you call proposal. Proposal? But, Mr. Monet, you hardly know me. Oh, I know you well enough for this, Miss Brooks. After talking to many, many women, Mrs. Conklin, little Mrs. Conklin, about Harriet. Mm. I mean, I know you are the ideal woman for me. Oh, this is very flattering, Mr. Monet, but... Marriage is a serious step. Marriage? I cannot marriage with you. I am already married. With you? <laughs> well, with my wife, Helene. She arrives here next week. For you, I have another proposal. Any other proposal is only good for a sock in the nozzle. <laughs> no, no, you, you do not understand. I want you to accept a position as tutor for my three children. Three children? Oh, Mrs. Davis will love this. Well, they need very badly coaching in English before they can enter school here. And, well, what do you say, Miss Brooks? Will you help us out? Mr. Monet, may I ask you one question? Of course. What is it? Among your children, is there a tall, dark one in the crowd? <laughs> Arden as our Miss Brooks returns in just a moment. Well, I promised Mr. Monet I'd help him out with his children, but I must admit I was a little let down when I found out he wasn't a bachelor, and I said as much to Mrs. Davis. Yes, Connie, it's a shame that such a darling man is already married. But he served his purpose as far as upsetting Mr. Boynton goes. What do you mean, Connie? Well, the day after we had lunch together, Mr. Boynton was so concerned about the situation, guess what he did? What? He put a brand new lock on his frog's cage. <laughs> Next week, tune in to another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Palm Olive Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, dream girl hair. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written and directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Boynton is played by Jeff Chandler, Mr. Conklin by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Gloria McMillan, and Gerald Moore. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North, the exciting, fun-packed adventures of an amateur detective and his beautiful wife. Tune in Tuesday evenings over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at the same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. I'm Olive Soap, your beauty hope, and luster cream shampoo for soft, glamorous, dream girl hair bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden.
Like many of her colleagues in the teaching profession, our Miss Brooks, Madison High School's English teacher, watched the year 1948 come to an end with mixed emotions. As she puts it, Although the year didn't start off brilliantly or develop too sensationally, it certainly wound up in a blaze of nothing. Uh, (laughs) Of course, I did enjoy my two weeks' vacation. In fact, I spent most of the money I was going to borrow in the next three months. (laughs) The afternoon of New Year's Eve, Friday, December 31st, for those that still can't remember... I was chatting with my landlady, Mrs. Davis. Well, Connie, I guess you've got big plans for this evening. Frankly, I haven't got any plans at all, Mrs. Davis. Of course, I do have a date with the bashful biologist. (laughs) Mr. Boynton, what are you going to do, Connie? Probably the same thing we did last year. Pool our money and go to Hip Sings for dinner. (laughs) Fine way to spend New Year's Eve. Two Americans go to a Chinese restaurant, Dutch. (laughs) What are you going to do, Mrs. Davis? Oh, I'm going to visit my sister, Angela. She's so absent-minded, poor thing. She'll probably be surprised to see me, although it was only last week that she invited me over. What time do you think you'll be leaving, Mrs. Davis? Leaving? For where? (laughs) For your sisters. For my sister's what? (laughs) For your sister's house. Oh. Oh, I'm glad you reminded me, Connie. I've been making... (laughs) I've been making up my New Year's resolutions, and that's the first thing on the list. I've resolved to correct Angela's absent-mindedness. Angela's absent-mindedness. What else is on the list? What list? (laughs) Maybe I'd better talk to Minerva the cat for a while. We were talking about New Year's resolutions, Mrs. Davis. Oh, yes. I'm sorry I wasn't paying attention, Connie. Tell me the rest of your resolutions. Well, first of all, I've resolved not to... What resolution? (laughs) We were speaking of yours, Mrs. Davis. And before you say my what, I'd like to ask you again the question I asked when we were both younger. (laughs) Namely, when are you going over to your sister's house? Maybe you better not go out tonight, Connie. You sound very strange. (laughs) It's just the way you're listening. (laughs) Or are you, Mrs. Davis? Of course I'm Mrs. Davis. (laughs) Now, you lie down and let me fix you some hot tea. I don't want any hot tea. I just want an answer. Thanks, Minerva. (laughs) Now, about this evening, Mrs. Davis... Hello, Minerva. Want some milk, dear? Yeah. I'll get you some in a minute. You were saying, Miss Brooks? This evening? Your sister's house? Yes, I'm going over there tonight. I know, Mrs. Davis. Yeah. Right away, Minerva. What time, Mrs. Davis? It's, um, a quarter of four now. <laughs> then I'm always back. <laughs> get away from those curtains, Minerva. I'll fetch your saucer right away. Keep an eye on her, will you, Angela? I'll be glad to, Connie. (laughs) Come on, just hop into my lap, Mrs. Davis. There's a good dog. This is getting contagious. (laughs) Oh, coming. Excuse me, Minerva. Why, it's Monsieur Monet. Come in. Merci, mademoiselle. Thank you. It's nice you remember me. Remember you? Why, Monsieur Monet, you're Madison High's favorite French teacher. Uh, for that, Miss Brooks, permit me to kiss your hand. <laughs> well, let's not give the other hand the complex. <laughs> Certainly not. Tell me, go in the living room. I, uh, I trust that I'm not arrived at how you say inopportunity time. What? Oh, you know? <laughs> no, this is very opportunity time. Won't you sit down, Monsieur Manet? Oh, thank you, Miss Brooks. But now that I'm teaching in America, I would appreciate it if you would call me in America. All right. What's your number? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, call me Mr. Monet instead of Monsieur. Oh, certainly. Here you are, Kitty. Here's a nice saucer of... Oh, I didn't know anyone had come in. This is Mr. Monet, Mrs. Davis, our new French teacher at Madison. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Monet? How do you do, Mrs. Davis? I kiss your hand, madame. I'll hold your saucer, madame. (laughs) A 
lovely lady with a lovely hand. Meow. <laughs> Stick out your paw, Minerva. You're next. <laughs> If Mr. Monet came over to see you, Connie, I'm sure he doesn't want to talk to Minerva. I'll just take her into the kitchen. Come along, dear. There's a good kitty. Come drink your milk out here. So nice to admit you, Mr. Monet. Oh, likewise, I'm sure. She's very nice here, Mrs. Davis. But why she ran away so fast? In the words of some of my pupils, why she took some powder and put it on the lamb? <laughs> some powder. Oh, you mean she took a powder or took it on the lamb. May we. She flew out of here like a bat out of Mr. the... Mr. Monet. <laughs> you're learning faster than you're teaching. <laughs> no, Mrs. Davis was just being tactful. I guess she thought you wanted to be alone with me. Alone with you? But why, Miss Brooks? I'm a married man. Oh, I know, but Mrs. Davis doesn't know about your wife, Mr. Monet. Oh, oh, Miss Brooks, I, I don't know what plans you have made for New Year's Eve, but my wife, Elaine, and I would be very flattery if you would join us. Well, thanks, Mr. Monet. I'm flattery that you should ask me. <laughs> but as far as I know, Mr. Boynton is taking me out tonight. Oh, then you both must come. You see, this is not an ordinary party, Miss Brooks, although we're all going to wear evening clothes and try to have the best possible time. Elaine and I... We realize that among school teachers, there are very few, uh, how do you call it, malted millionaires? <laughs> Some of us are too thick to drink with a straw. <laughs> what you're trying to tell me is that the evening won't cost much money, is that right? Oh, it will cost you no money, Miss Brooks, but there is an admission charge. Kind of blood? <laughs> no, 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 just some old clothes. You see, I am in charge of a committee to send clothing to the poor people in France. Any sort of clothes would do, Miss Brooks. Anything that is made of cloth. Why, that sounds like a wonderful idea, Mr. Monet. I'll be delighted to come. And Mr. Boynton, do you speak for him as well? Mr. Boynton has been spoken for many times. The trouble is he doesn't answer. <laughs> oh, you mean about tonight. Yes, Mr. Monet, I feel sure I can speak for Mr. Boynton. Oh, fine. I'll be leaving then. I'll walk you to the door, Mr. Monet. Oh, my address is uh, 9066 Shawm Drive. Try to get there before ten. And I'm sure that as my students say, we will have a ball. <laughs> I'm sure that we will. Yes, until tonight then, Miss Brooks. Stay in the groove. Oh, Natch, Mr. Monet, Natch. And Mr. Monet. Yes? Don't take any wooden francs. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will return in just a moment. But first, here is Vern Smith. Ladies, regardless of age, skin type, or previous beauty care, doctors prove you too may win a lovelier complexion with palm olive soap. But to win this lovelier complexion, the kind men admire and women envy, you must stop improper cleansing. Instead, use palm olive soap the way doctors advised. Remember, 36 doctors, leading skin specialists, advised 1,285 women, many with complexion problems, to use palm olive this way. Some have dry skin, some oily, some coarse looking. Using palm olive soap alone, two out of three won lovelier complexions. Now here's what the doctors advise. Wash your face with palm olive soap. Massaging for one minute with palm olive soft lather. This cleansing massage brings your skin palm olive's full beautifying effect. Rinse. Do this three times a day for 14 days. It's that simple. But doctors have proved this way, using nothing but palm olive, really works. So forget other beauty care. Use palm olive soap alone for a lovelier complexion. For loveliness all over, use big thrifty bath size palm olive in your tub or shower. <laughs> After Mr. Monet left, I tried to get Mr. Boynton on the phone to tell him about the invitation. But ours is a party line, a four-party line to be exact, and every time I picked up the receiver, it was in use. Always careful not to lose my temper, I sat by the phone and drummed lightly on the top of the table until my five fingernails were impaled in the mahogany. <laughs> then I tried it once more. As sure as my name is Lucy Schofield, that's the only way to treat man, Emma. Believe me, if I had to do it all over again, Emma, I'd... Oh, excuse me a minute, dear. I think I smell my roast burning in the kitchen. Now, that's a coincidence, Lucy. I smell my grapes burning in the living room. <laughs> Hang up now. I'll call you back. 
So much for Emma and Lucy. I'll try it again. Oh, it worked. At least I can dial now. I hope Lucy doesn't think Emma was kidding her. Happy New Year, Daisy. Is Fred there? <laughs> this isn't Daisy, and Fred isn't here. Will you please get off the line? I'm trying to... get off the line. Just what I said. Get off this line. Oh, Mrs. Telephone Company, huh? Look, this happens to be a party line, and I happen to be the party using it at the moment. Oh, well, that's different. If you want me to come to a party, I'll be glad to talk to you. <laughs> My name is Frank Pollock. What's yours? It doesn't matter. I only... Say, Frank. Frank, are you still there? Sure, I'm still there. I was mighty nice of you to call me, Daisy. What I think of the way I treated you. <laughs> the shameful, horrible way I treated you. Don't cry, Frank. I had it coming. No. Now, will you please hang up? Your bottle is falling out of the chandelier. <laughs> well, thanks, Daisy. You're a great girl. And tell Fred to give me a buzz when he gets in. Bye now. <laughs> He's getting an early start. When a body meets a body, he's had too much rye. <laughs> Hello? Hello, Mr. Boynton. This is Miss Brooks. I assume we still have a date for tonight. Tonight? Oh, this is Friday, isn't it? Yes, December 31st. The 31st, eh? Yes, you know, the day we celebrate the appearance of the first enchilada north of Laredo, Texas. <laughs> What are we going to do to kill a few hours together? We'll think of something, you mad, impetuous boy. <laughs> As a matter of fact, that's why I called. Mr. Monet and his wife are having a little impromptu party at their house, and they've invited us. Uh, what kind of party? Well, you have to have some old clothes, and then you should... Hello? Is that you, Emma? I didn't quite understand you before. No, this is not Emma. This is your friendly, cooperative, party-line neighbor. Oh, the magpie. Magpie? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you talking to? I'm talking to nonstop Nellie, the human dial tone. <laughs> now, well, will, you, never will you please stop this filibuster and get off the line? Well, the phone company will hear about this. Are you there, Miss Brooks? Yes, Mr. Boynton. As I started to tell you, although it's a formal party, we're supposed to have some piece of apparel that we can... Happy New Year. Oh, <laughs> yes. Well, who's that? Well, it's about time you got home, Fred. That is not Fred. Oh, well, it isn't, huh? No, it isn't. Uh, as Fred's oldest and closest friend, I demand to know who it is. <laughs> now, see here, old man. I'm not your old man. <laughs> I don't even know where your old man is. I don't even know where my old man is. No, you see, but I don't even know where my old man is. Oh, look, Mr. Boyd. We'd better hang up now. You can't, Daisy. You can't hang up. Not without you tell me where my old man is. Daisy. Listen, Mr. Boyd. Nobody wants to tell me where my old man is. All you have to do is bring some old clothes. Frank, and I love you for it. <laughs> if you don't get off this phone, I'll have you thrown out of the bar you're calling from. Bar? Oh, is that where I'm calling from? Bless you, Daisy. You've helped me find my old man. <laughs> sure, he's sitting on the stool next to me. <laughs> I better hang up now. Fred hates it when I talk to strangers. Oh, Mrs. Davis. Yes, Connie. I wonder if you'd give me a hand. I've been invited to a formal party tonight, and I just don't know what to wear. Well, what have you got, Connie? Oh, nothing. That is nothing but an old evening gown I've had for five years. Well, come on into your room, Connie, and we'll look it over. Here we are. It won't take long to find in my closet. Well, let's see. Here's a skirt and blouse. The suit I got two years ago. Here's one of the dresses I wear to school. Here's the other one. <laughs> Oh, there we are, my pride and joy. Why, that's real pretty, Connie. And look at the fringe. 
Silly moths, they left the best part. <laughs> While I'm in here, I'd better find something to donate as well. Donate? Yes, the price well. Find something to donate as well. Donate? Yes, the price of admission to the party is some old clothing. I know I've got some because I've been wearing it. Oh, dear, I forgot to tell you, Connie, but just last week when the Goodwill truck came around, they pick up old clothes, too, you know. I gave away everything of mine I could possibly spare. Well, that's all right, Mrs. Davis. You're not going to the party. I know, but uh, I also gave away a big bundle of your stuff. You had it lying in the closet, and Mrs. I Davis, that, that was for the cleaners. I had some of my newest clothes in that bundle. 1945 stuff. <laughs> I'm sorry, dear. Maybe you can borrow some old clothes to give. Well, I guess I'll have to. I know. I'll go over to the Conklins. He's got one suit I know could use an ocean voyage. <laughs> Come on in. Thanks, Harriet. Are your folks at home? Mother's out shopping, but Daddy's upstairs taking a nap. Come on into the living room, won't you? Walter Denton and I were just playing pass it. Look who's here, Walter. Well, if it isn't my favorite English teacher. Sit down, Miss Brooks. Harriet and I were just playing pass it. So she told me. What's pass it? Well, it's a game we read about. Lots of high school kids play it. All you do is take a piece of Kleenex and hold it to your nose by sniffing. And then with both hands behind your back, you pass it down a long line of kids by sniffing it away from your neighbor. Oh. <laughs> Sounds fascinating. But where's the long line of kids? Oh, it's just as much fun with the two of us. More. <laughs> yeah, it saves wear and tear on the Kleenex, too. Uh, Harriet and I go steady. That's why I'm here. But what brings you to the dread sanctum sanctorum of your school principal during a holiday? Please, Walter. You make Daddy sound like an ogre. Yes, Walter. Just because Mr. Conklin is my superior at school is no reason for me to live in dread of him. Harriet! <laughs> <laughs> what is it, Daddy? Try to be a little more quiet, can't you? I've got to get some sleep. Sorry, Daddy. We'll be more careful. I don't think now is a good time to tell him you're here, Miss Brooks. You see, he's going to a big party tonight and wants to get some rest. Well, then maybe you kids can help me out. I've just got to get some old clothes somewhere right away. Why, Miss Brooks? The ones you've got on look fine. <laughs> Thanks, Walter, I think. But I'm talking about clothes I can donate. Golly, Miss Brooks, Mother just gave away every stitch we could possibly spare to the Salvation Army. Wait a minute. Daddy's new tuxedo is being delivered today. And he's got an old suit of evening clothes that I'm sure Mother would love to see given away. Say no more, Harriet. Do you think you can get it without waking your father? Well, sure. It's right here in the hall closet. Here it is, Miss Brooks. This is the suit Daddy wore when he first became a principal. Let me look at that. Hmm, I'll bet he was a sensation in these tales. Why? There are three of them. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, that's just where one of them is torn. You could patch that up in a jiffy. Thanks very much, Harriet. It's cloth anyway. Well, I'll be getting along home now. Mr. Boynton's picking me up soon, and I've got to see if my evening gown still fits me. I've had it for over five years. Oh, I think that's nice, Miss Brooks. What's nice, Walter? How you and your evening gown have grown old together. <laughs> well, not that you're falling apart at the seams or anything. I mean... Well, to me, you're still all wool and a yard wide. <laughs> you have just failed in English for 1949. Would you care to try for 50? Uh, hello. Hello, Mr. Conklin? Yes, who's this? This is Kane from Kane's Classy Cut Clothes with four Ks. Oh, yes. Where's my tuxedo, Kane? You promised it to me by 5 o'clock. It's 10 of now. Oh, that's what I'm calling about, Mr. Conklin. I can't get the suit to you by 5 o'clock. You can't? Well, then when will it get here? Next Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Next Tuesday? But I've got a very important party to attend tonight. Oh, no, no, I've got... Now, please, Mr. I... Conklin, don't yell at me. What? Yell at the lapel makers union. They went out on strike yesterday. But isn't there something you can do? Somebody who can fix now, this? Now, calm yourself, you... Mr. Conklin. <laughs> Even if I gave the suit to another shop to be finished, it wouldn't do any good. The buttonhole boys went out in sympathy. But how could you... Why do you... When did this... No, 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 how were you easy, able... Mr. Conklin. When my take suit... it easy. My blood be... pressure is just as high as yours. So let's be good to ourselves and exercise some control. Control? But how can I... What will I... Even if I have... Now, there's no use no for both of us aggravating. Yeah. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Conklin. 
Happy New Year. Happy Shnally. <laughs> Harriet! Yes, Daddy, we're here in the living room. Harriet, I've had a great disappointment. My taxi. Oh, hello, Denton. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Conklin. We're playing pass it. Want to sniff this Kleenex off my nose onto your nose? <laughs> I can think of nothing more loathsome to do. <laughs> Harriet, you know where your mother put my old suit of evening clothes. Your old suit, Daddy? Yes, yes. I've got to wear it tonight. Oh, but that old evening suit isn't any good, Mr. Conklin. It would make you look like a, like a head waiter in a cabaret. A head waiter in a... That happens to be one of the finest dress Please, suits. Please, Daddy. Th- I gave it to Miss Brooks just a little while ago. She and Mr. Boynton are going to a party where you have to bring some old clothes to get in. What? That does it! Not only do my teachers openly flaunt my wishes about fraternizing... But they take my evening clothes along with them. <laughs> Children, do you know what I'm going to do? No, we don't. But I know one thing. If I was Miss Brooks, I'd hop in bed and pull the covers up over my head. <laughs> there, how does Old Faithful look on me, Mrs. Davis? Lovely, Connie. And fringe is more popular than ever. It's amazing what a tuck here and a stitch there will do. About what time did Mr. Boynton say he'd be over? About this time, Mrs. Davis. I'll get it. Good evening, Mr. Boynton. Won't you come in? Oh, thanks, Miss Brooks. Say, that's an interesting overcoat you have on. Raccoon, isn't it? Yes. (laughs) It's a relic of my college days. You mind if I hang it up here? It's pretty warm. Go right ahead, Mr. Boynton. Then come on into the living room. All right. Oh, hey, that's better. Well, Miss Brooks, you certainly look lovely tonight. Thanks, Mr. Boynton. You look... Mr. Boynton, I told you we were invited to a New Year's Eve party, didn't I? Well, yes, you did. Do you always go to a formal party in white flannels with a blazer and a beanie? <laughs> formal? But you said you had to have some old clothes to get in. Some odd piece of wearing apparel is what you told me. Oh, great. I hope your sneakers are vulcanized. <laughs> I don't understand, Miss Brooks. Just what kind of a party is this? It's a formal party, Mr. Boynton, but the price of admission is some old clothes to be shipped abroad. Oh, well, I don't know. I I don't usually go to parties on New Year's Eve. You don't? Well, how do you like to spend the evening, Mr. Boynton? Well, I usually have an early dinner, then catch the first show at the movies and hit the sack about 10.30. What does your doctor say about such carrying on? (laughs) Look, Mr. Boynton, I've already accepted for both of us, and... Wait a minute. I've got a dress suit that might fit you. Then we can bring the stuff you've got on as our, our admission. Just go into my room, Mr. Boynton, and take off those clothes. Oh, Miss Brooks, what in the You'll world... You'll find is... a suit of evening clothes right on the bed. Please slip them on. Mrs. Davis. Yes, Connie? Have you finished sewing Mr. Conklin's tail together? Just finishing now, Connie. Here it is, as good as new. It would make any head waiter proud. Oh, hello, Mr. Boynton. My, what a nice beanie. Three propellers. I wish you'd tell me what this is all about, Mrs. Davis. Well, you're going to an ideal source for information. Just take this suit and put it on, Mr. Boynton, please. Well, all right, Miss Brooks, but this is all highly irregular. Now, Mrs. Davis, let's go into your room. I want you to fix my hair in the back. I'm wearing it up, you know, and it's not quite high enough. My goodness, Connie, how high do you want it? High enough so that I'll have to stand on a chair to pull it down. Well, it doesn't fit too badly, I get... Uh, Miss Brooks, I've got the suit on. That's fine. I'll just be a few minutes. Oh, would you answer that, please, Mr. Boynton? Mrs. Davis is still rummaging in my scalp. All right. Oh, well, it's Mr. Conklin. Good evening, sir. Good evening. I'd like a table down front, but not too near the drum. <laughs> It's you, Boynton. Uh, Yes, sir. Won't you come in? No, I won't come in. Boynton, how did you... When did you... Who gave you... What are you doing? New Year's Eve, I'd swear that Mr. Conklin had come by. Oh, it is you, Mr. Conklin. Miss Brooks, I demand the return of my evening clothes at once. Your evening clothes? I cannot tell a lie, Mr. Boynton. Take it off. Take it off? Take it off! Well, don't just stand there, Mr. Conklin. Applaud a little. (laughs) 
Get ready, everyone. It's 12 o'clock. Turn up the radio. Well, Miss Brooks, nice party, no? Oh, very nice, Mr. Manet. Ah, but it's midnight now. The band is playing Auld Lang Syne, and everyone should be kissing someone. Where's your Mr. Pointer? Oh, haven't you heard, Mr. Manet? He hit the sack at 10.30. Well, Mr. Boynton didn't show me such an exciting New Year's Eve, but we had another date the next day, today. After spending the afternoon at the zoo, we came back to my house. Uh, do you mind if I turn on the radio, Mr. Boynton? Oh, not at all, Miss Brooks, but I'm afraid I can't stay to listen to it. Why not? Well, actually, I didn't get into bed on New Year's Eve until ten minutes of eleven. I've got to catch up on my sleep. (laughs) (laughs) And so, as Philip Boynton faded slowly into the West, I bade him farewell in true Zulu fashion by saying, Tunga Lunga Bimba Lakta, which means, how can you leave now? Jack Benny has switched over to CBS. (laughs) Tune into another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Palmolive Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous dream girl hair. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written and directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North, the exciting, fun-packed adventures of an amateur detective and his beautiful wife. Tune in Tuesday evenings over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at this same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Stay tuned now for Lum and Abner, Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Soap, your beauty hope, and luster cream shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. To most people, a warm May day suggests a drive in the country or a leisurely picnic. But to Our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, It has a far different significance. Yes, indeed. To me, a warm May day means just one thing. Mr. Conklin, our beloved principal, is putting the heat on. Uh Some people feel that Mr. Conklin makes his teachers miserable because of his fosterousness. I don't agree. You can't make so many so miserable so often without giving it plenty of thought. (laughs) Well, but perhaps I'm being too harsh in my judgment. A principal's life can't be all a bed of roses, either. There must be many nights which he spends tossing and turning in his bed until the wee small hours, hoping, planning, thinking, saying to himself, What can I do to them this week? (laughs) Well, during the free period last Friday morning, his nocturnal efforts seemed to have borne fruit. He started an impromptu quiz without prizes. Miss Brooks. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, (laughs) Yes, Mr. Conklin? Conjugate the verb strive, please. Strive? Uh, strive, strove, thriven. Now, thrive. Thrive. Thrive, throve, thriven. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> really, Mr. Conklin, these sudden little tests are quite disconcerting. I don't uh, see... Silence, Miss Brooks. We're not finished. Yes, sir. More verbs? Five. Five. Five, foe, thriven. <laughs> Five isn't a verb. Uh, Thank you, Miss Brooks. I knew my visit to your room would produce some valuable bit of information. (laughs) Now, my main reason for dropping in, however, was to ask you to do me a favor, Miss Brooks. As you know, Sunday is Mother's Day. Yes, I know, Mr. Conklin. Thanks to a special savings plan I started in February, I was able to send my mother a card this morning. (laughs) But what did you want me to do for you? I'd like you to take this package home with you and keep it until Sunday morning. It's a little Mother's Day remembrance for Mrs. Conklin, and I don't want her to stumble upon it before time. Wonderful woman, Mrs. Conklin, 
And she's trained our daughter, Harriet, to be a duplicate of herself. Really? Yes. Yes, between them, they're the two biggest snoopers in the county. <laughs> that makes it unanimous. Uh, I mean, I'll be happy to keep the package for you. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Brooks. I hope my daughter Harriet remembers Mother's Day. Lately, she's had her mind on nothing but that moronic manager of the baseball team, Walter Denton. <laughs> uh, Walter isn't so bad, Mr. Conklin. Of course, he's not a brilliant student. Brilliant? Walter Denton is Madison's gift to subnormality. <laughs> the thing that annoys me most is the way he bounces. He never goes anywhere. He always bounces there. Hiya, Miss Brooks. I just thought I'd bounce in for a minute. <laughs> well, if it isn't the human handball. Oh, hello, Mr. Conklin. If I'm interrupting anything, I'll just bounce along. No, and... Walter. Mr. Conklin was about to dribble back to his office. <laughs> that is, you were finished with me, weren't you, Mr. Conklin? Quite. Good morning, Miss Brooks. Goodbye, Mr. Conklin. Hasta la vista, Mr. Conklin. I learned that in Spanish. It means see you later. Oh. Well... No se lo veo a usted primero. Oh. What does that mean, Miss Brooks? That means not if I see you first. <laughs> now, what can I do for you, Walter? Well, I need some advice, Miss Brooks. And as is my won't when I want advice, I've hide myself to my favorite English teacher. Or for that matter, my favorite any kind of teacher. Are you sure it's only advice you want? Oh, sure, Miss Brooks. It's about a Mother's Day gift. But a very special type of mother, Miss Brooks. That is... Well, I know it's impossible right now, but just for supposition's sake, suppose you woke up one day and found yourself a mother. I have a mother, so she's miles away. <laughs> no, Brooks, I didn't mean it that way. I mean, if you awoke to find that you were a mother, now what would your first question be? What does it weigh, Doc? <laughs> Are you quite certain you wouldn't say, how is my husband? Not me. I might say, who is my husband? <laughs> I'm serious, Miss Brooks. My dad told me that was my mother's first concern after she knew that I was all right. You know, she thinks of us constantly and never of herself. But me, what do I do in return? I, I don't get out of bed when she wakes me. I leave my clothes all over the house. Uh, Sunday's Mother's Day, Miss Brooks, and I've got to make it up to her. Well, that's pretty short notice, Walter, but I have a suggestion for you. You have? Yes. Sunday morning, wait till your mother starts to make breakfast. When you're sure she's in the kitchen, close the door quietly behind her. Then? Then gather up all the clothes that you've scattered around the house. Then? Then put them in a big suitcase. Then? Then run away from home. <laughs> oh, I'm just teasing you, Walter. There's only one way you can make your mother happy, and that's by turning over a new leaf. Well, I'll try, Miss Brooks, but meanwhile, that's just supposing again. Oh, uh, what kind of a present would you like if you were a mother? Oh, I wouldn't care much about presents, Walter. I'd just be happy if I had all my beloved children around me. Gee. Well, of course, my mother only has this one beloved child. <laughs> me. <laughs> well, it is a lovely sentiment. However, I'd still like to figure out a little gift of some sort. Now, what would make a young mother like yourself happy? A young father like Mr. Boynton. <laughs> that always reminds me, Walter. It's time for me to get down to his laboratory and pick him up for lunch. Oh, did he invite you for lunch today? Of course he did. About ten minutes from now. <laughs> Tell me, Walter, were you able to find out what kind of a gift she'd like? I couldn't find out a thing, Harriet. But we've got to get her something. What's the good of naming Miss Brooks our mother away from mother if we can't surprise her with something she wants? Gee, I'm sorry, Harriet, but all she'd say was that she'd be happy with all her beloved children around her. Uh, she was kidding, of course. I hope. <laughs> kidding? She wasn't kidding. She met us. Oh. Now, let's see. We'll organize a committee to pick out a gift and give it to Miss Brooks. Great, Harriet. Then tonight will officially become Mother Away from Mother's Day night. Well, now that we're finished with lunch, Miss Brooks, I, I've got a surprise for you. Surprise? What is it, Mr. Boynton? Uh, yes. You're picking up both checks. No. <laughs> I'm picking up both checks. No. Then I give up. 
Uh, Miss Brooks, I want you to meet my folks. Why, Mr. Boynton, you've only known me for five years. This is so sudden. <laughs> I just found out they were coming to town myself. You see, they usually spend Mother's Day with my married brother, but Mom decided that this year it's my turn. To do what? Oh, your turn to spend Mother's Day. <laughs> That's right. You, you'll love my mother, Miss Brooks. She used to be a school teacher too, you know. As a matter of fact, she worked herself up until she was a principal. You got to get pretty worked up to be a principal. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm sure we'll get along splendidly. And you'll be crazy about my dad. Oh, what a sense of humor he's got. He's the one who told me the joke about the quiz master who called out, I've got a lady, doctor, but before he could ask her any questions, she stuck a thermometer in his mouth and took his pulse. Isn't that a scream? <laughs> Your father sounds like more fun than a barrel of nothing. <laughs> May I ask you a rather personal question about your folks? Oh, certainly, Miss Brooks. What is it? How long did they go around together before they were married? Nine years. I see. <laughs> folks believed in long engagements in those days, I guess. Hmm? Oh, they weren't engaged until six weeks before the wedding. Six weeks? Mm-hmm. Once Dad makes up his mind about something, he's greased lightning. <laughs> he could have used a little greasing in the first eight years. <laughs> You'll be looking forward to seeing them, Mr. Boynton. When are they arriving in town? Oh, this afternoon, Miss Brooks. I'll have to check them into a hotel for the weekend. I've just got a small bachelor apartment. Yes, I know. You've told me about it. <laughs> Maybe your folks would like to drop over to my place tonight. I'm sure my landlady, Mrs. Davis, wouldn't mind my dusting the living room a little. Oh, that's just fine with me, Miss Brooks. That'll give my folks a chance to rest up from their trip and have some dinner before they, well, before they meet the girl about whom I... Well, they've heard so much. Why, Mr. Boynton, you mean you actually wrote to your folks about me? And how, Miss Brooks? I've written them many times about how gay and youthful and exuberant you are. I am? You, I mean, do you have? Darn <laughs> right. I remember in one of my most recent letters to them, I, I said you were more like a pupil than a teacher. In fact, I think that was a letter in which I described you as a great, big, overgrown kid. <laughs> Maybe I'd better take something. You should have seen the answer I got from Dad. He said, whatever you do, son, don't rob the cradle. <laughs> yeah, leave it to Dad. Oh, he was jesting, of course. He, he loves youngsters. Mr. Boynton, you've given me an idea. Well, what kind of an idea, Miss Brooks? If your father turns me down when I ask him for your hand, maybe he'll adopt me. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will continue in just a moment. But first, here is Vern Smith. Here's wonderful news, ladies. Wonderful, wonderful news. Now there's something thrillingly new in Palm Olive Soap's famous beauty lather. Yes, something thrillingly new. Palm Olive's famous beauty lather now brings you new fragrance, new charm, new allure. Millions of women will prefer beauty lather Palm Olive over all other leading toilet soaps the minute they try it. For Palm Olive Soap's famous beauty lather now has a new, clean, flower-fresh fragrance for new allure. New charm. So, ladies, forget all other beauty care and use palm olive soap the way doctors advise for a lovelier complexion. Just stop improper cleansing and instead wash your face with palm olive soap three times a day, massaging palm olive's wonderful beauty lather onto your skin for 60 seconds each time to get its full beautifying effect. Then rinse. That's all. All types of skin, young, older, oily, respond to it quickly. Don't wait another day to try Palm Olive's Beauty Lather. You'll be thrilled by its new fragrance, new charm, new allure. Thrilled again by the fresher, brighter complexion doctors prove may soon be yours. For new loveliness all over, use big, vast size Palm Olive in tub or shower. <laughs> home right after school and put Mr. Conklin's gift to his wife on my dresser. Then I started to make myself and the house as presentable as possible before Mr. Boynton's parents came over that evening. First of all, I shampooed my hair and set it in pin curls. Then I put on an old oversized house dress, which I'd borrowed from Mrs. Davis. This intriguing combination achieved the happy effect of making me look like a pat rack drowning in a Quonset hut. <laughs> then I went into the living room to get things in order. 
When I got there, Mrs. Davis had just finished vacuuming. Oh, uh, Connie, will you pull the plug out for me? My back's been bothering me lately. Oh, certainly, Mrs. Davis. There. Hey, this vacuum cleaner's pretty old, isn't it? Yes, indeed. But it's held up remarkably well. I bought it in 1932. 1932? Yes. Miss Hoover came in when the other one went out. <laughs> well, just how the place looks nice and neat for tonight. You know, I've never met Mr. Boynton's parents before. I know you haven't, Connie. And first impressions are so important. Mm-hmm. That's why I sent our sofa and all the chairs out to be recovered. What? Every chair in the house is at the upholsterer's, Connie. But don't worry. Stretch Snodgrass took them down for me, and he promised to bring them back by six o'clock. Stretch Snodgrass? Look, Mrs. Davis, Stretch may be a fine athlete, but when it comes to mentality, he's strictly a third strike. Why, he's liable to forget where he took the chairs. Oh, I don't think so, Connie. You know how absent-minded I am, and even I couldn't forget the name of this upholsterer. Why not? Because he has a very odd name. What is it? What is what? <laughs> the name. Who's the name? The upholsterer. Upholsterer? Yes. Look, Mrs. Davis, the sofa and all our chairs are being recovered today. Well, they can certainly use it. <laughs> Where did you send them, Connie? <laughs> Fellow with a very odd name. I never can remember it. I'm sure it'll come back to you later. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got to get out in back and look for our cat. Minerva? Is she missing again? Mm-hmm. She had a date this morning. A date? Yes, I heard her making it last night. <laughs> but she should be back by now. She knows how I worry about her. Well, you let me know if she comes in the front way, Connie, and I'll take a look back here. All right, Mrs. Davis. That's funny. Minerva never bothered to ring before. <laughs> How do you do, my dear? How do you do? I'm Philip's mother. Philip? Yes, Philip Boynton. I'm Mrs. Boynton. But that's impossible. You won't be here till tonight. Oh, well, I mean, come in, Mrs. Boynton. <laughs> you don't have to tell me who you are, my dear. Philip has written so much about you. He has? Yes, he says Miss Brooks wouldn't know what to do without you, Mrs. Davis. Mrs. Davis? <laughs> Mrs. Davis? Yes, Connie. That's Mrs. Davis, Mrs. Boynton. I'm Miss Brooks, such as I am. We've got company, Mrs. Davis. Oh, she came in the front way, did she? Yeah, she's oh. right here in the living room. Well, you tell her she's a wicked cat and put her under the piano. <laughs> yes, Mrs. Davis. You're a wicked cat and get under the... Oh, no. No. <laughs> Oh, you'll have to forgive me, Mrs. Boynton. I didn't expect you until after dinner. Oh, well, that's perfectly all right, Miss Brooks. As a matter of fact, I owe you an apology for not recognizing you. But it was rather dim in here. Not dim enough. <laughs> but where's Mr. Boynton? Or should I say, where are Mr. Boynton? Or Mr. Boynton? <laughs> well, they had a little trouble parking the car, and I wanted to meet you myself first anyway. Philip's written so much about you. You must see an awful lot of each other. Well, we do teach at the same school. I understand you were a teacher at one time, Mrs. Boynton. <laughs> yes, indeed, for many years. Well, it's remarkable. You still look so well fed. Uh, you <laughs> May we come in? Oh, it's the boys. Hello, Philip, my dear. Hello, Mom. Well, I see you two have met. Yes, indeed. We're old friends by now. Well, here she is, Dad. You slip me five, my dear. Five what? Oh, fingers. <laughs> How do you do, Mr. Boynton? Well, I do pretty well for an old codger. Old codger? A codger that time, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> What a sense of humor. <laughs> He's hot stuff, all right. <laughs> hey, Phil's written is all about you, my dear. I hear you're just like a mother to Miss Brooks, Mrs. Davis. This house dress has got to go. <laughs> Mrs. Davis, Harvey. It isn't? Oh, of course not, Dad. But this is Miss Brooks. Uh, why are we all standing out here in the hall? Yes, let's all go in and stand in the living room. <laughs> Follow me, please. Well, here we are. Now then, Mrs. Boynton, if you'll just come over to this lamp, that's a very comfortable place to stand. <laughs> Mr. Boynton, you stand over there by the piano. I don't understand, Miss Brooks. Where are all the chairs? They're out being recovered. I didn't expect you for hours yet, Mr. Boynton. This is 
isn't a terrible thing to do to anybody. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Brooks, but it couldn't be helped. You see, there was a convention in town, and I couldn't get the folks' accommodations anywhere. You know how big my room is, and, well, I wondered if you and Mrs. Davis could put the folks up for the weekend. Why, Philip, I'm surprised at you. You know better than to whisper in front of others. No, oh, I'm sorry, Mother. I was just explaining our predicament to Miss Brooks. She was saying how delighted she'd be to have you stay for a couple of days. Well, now, that's what I call whopping hospitality. It's a whopper, all right. <laughs> I wish you'd give me a hand with the garbage, Connie. I just can't... Oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, this is Mr. and Mrs. Boynton, and this, contrary to popular opinion, is Mrs. Davis. How do you do? Hello, Mrs. Davis. Hey, good afternoon, Mrs. D. Nice little place you've got here. I just invited the folks to spend the weekend with us, Mrs. Davis. If you don't mind my doubling up with you, I figured they could have my room. Oh, that's perfectly all right. Oh, dear, the upholsterer. You folks must be tired after your trip. Why don't you go to bed? <laughs> bed? It's only 4.30 in the afternoon. Oh, Mrs. Davis was only kidding, Mrs. Barton. She's got quite a sense of humor, too. Now, just remember one thing, Mrs. Davis. You can't kid a kidder, kiddo. <laughs> Doesn't he get off some cracks, Mrs. Davis? <laughs> yes, he's a gym dandy. <laughs> now, if you folks will just follow me, I'll show you to your room. Or rather, Miss Brooks's room. Well, I could do with a bit of freshening up at that. Oh, nonsense, Mother. You're as fresh as the day I got you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now, cut it out, oh. Dad. <laughs> yes, cut it out, Dad. Oh, what well, <laughs> his stuff. I don't know where he gets some of his ideas. He's terribly original, don't you think, Miss Brooks? Oh, a second Oscar Hammerstein, Mrs. Boynton. <laughs> or to put it another way, the corn is as high as the elephant's eye. <laughs> Well, Miss Brooks certainly has a comfortable room, Harvey. Yes, indeed. That shower and a little tap nap's just what the doctor ordered. Tell me, Harvey, what do you think of Miss Brooks? Well, it's hard to tell in that outfit she had on, but once she combs her hair and climbs out of that gunny sack, I'll bet she's a looker. Yes, but what is she looking for? Oh, now, Mother, you think that every girl who meets him immediately sets her cap for Philip. Hey, what's this package on the dresser here? It says, uh, for Mother. Huh, must be for you. Oh, wasn't that thoughtful of Miss Brooks. She got a Mother's Day gift for me when she heard I was coming. I'm going to open it right now. Oh, but Mother's Day isn't until Sunday. Well, you know I never have the patience to wait. <laughs> Let's see. Why, what's this? A black sheer negligence. Well, happy Mother's Day. For the time? Happy <laughs> for me. Hey, look, hey, look, this card fell out when you opened the package. It says for baby from her goodies. Yes. So it belongs to Miss Brooks. Harvey, you don't think that Philip... Ooh, would... certainly not. He yes. wouldn't have nerve enough to ask for that in the store. Well, I'm going to find out just where this came from. Oh, Miss Brooks. Yes, Mrs. Barnum? Would you come here a moment, please? Certainly, Mrs. Barnum. What can I do for you? Well, I opened a package by mistake and found this inside of it. <whistles> a black sheer negligee. There was a card with it that said, For Baby from Goody. Goody. Oh, that must be short for Osgood. Why, of course, that was Mr. Conklin's gift. Mr. Conklin, the principal of Madison High? Yes, isn't he a devil? <laughs> <laughs> he has to keep it for him so his wife wouldn't discover it before Mother's Day. Oh, it's for his wife. Oh, yes, who did you think it was for? Don't answer that. <laughs> I can tell from the position of your eyebrows. My eyebrows? Yes, Mrs. Boynton. You'd better drop them a notch. You're pushing back your hairnet. <laughs> oh, it certainly was nice of you to invite us all to dinner, Mrs. Davis. Yes, indeed. It's delicious, too. Oh, thank you, both of you. But Miss Brooks is the one who deserves the credit. She prepared it all. Oh, come now, Mrs. Davis. You opened every bit as much as I did. <laughs> Too, isn't it? There's beef represented in it, yes. <laughs> Eat it slowly, Philip. Uh, yes, Mother. Yeah, they say your stomach has no teeth, but maybe it's just as well. If it got too hungry, it could chew off your suspender button. <laughs> <laughs> always 
gets me when I've got a mouthful. Now, Philip, he's such a baby. Yes. He's nothing but a great, big, overgrown kid. Now, that's funny. That's the same phrase that Philip used in describing you in one of his letters. Well, she is, Mother. You ought to see her around the school. Why, the students just treat her like one of themselves. Oh, yes, indeed. We kids have some great old times together. Oh, I'm glad. I like Philip to have lots of useful friends. The younger, the better. Well, they don't come much younger or better than Miss Brooks, Mother. Well, thank you, Mr. Barney. Call me Philip tonight. <laughs> I won't sleep, Connie. Excuse me, Philip. I wonder who that could be. Well, come in, please. Hi, Mrs. Davis. Mrs. We're a committee. Who is it, Mrs. Davis? Walter and Harry and Tommy. I bring them in. Oh, we didn't mean to disturb you, Miss Brooks. Oh, that's all right, Walter. I was just telling the folks how informal we are at Madison. Mr. and Mrs. Boynton, may I present Walter Denton and Harriet Conklin? Hey, how are you? How are you? How are you? And now, Miss Brooks, we would like to present something to you that expresses the devotion and reverence felt toward you by the entire student body. What is it, Walter? It's a shawl. A shawl and a handsome pair of knitting needles to go with a rocking chair to which you're so attached. <laughs> rocking chair, but... Oh, I'm not finished, Mrs. Boynton. Miss Brooks, you have been chosen our mother away from mother. Oh, no. <laughs> I'll go to the piano, Walter, and you sing the song we've written. Okay, Harriet. Why do you hear this, folks? All set, Walter. The B stands for the book. She helps us study. The R is for she's righteous, also pure. <laughs> the O is for the fact that she's our buddy. The second O is likewise, I am sure. <laughs> the K is for okay. She rates about the yes is for her sadly wrinkled brow. <laughs> She's motherly just like Elsie the cow. <laughs> Miss Brooks, we love you dearly. Miss Brooks, that's me. I'll always be. Miss Brooks. Steve Arden as our Miss Brooks returns in just a moment, but first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful, luster dream girl. Tonight, show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a Luster Cream shampoo. Only Luster Cream brings you K. Dumas' magic formula blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Gives loveliness lather even in hardest water. Glamorizes your hair as you wash it. Luster Cream. Not a soap, not a liquid, but a dainty cream shampoo. Leaves hair fragrantly clean. Free of loose dandruff. Glistening with sheen. Soft. Manageable. Gives new beauty to all hairdos or permanence. Four ounce jar, one dollar. Smaller sizes, either tubes or jars. Tonight, try Luster Cream Shampoo and be a dream girl, dream girl, beautiful Luster Cream girl. You owe your crowning glory to a Luster Cream Shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, several days later, Friday night came to an end. As I escorted Mr. Boynton to the front door, he was in a strangely mellow mood. You know, Miss Brooks, I'm a man of many dreams, but more often than not, I find I'm shooting too high. Shooting too high, Mr. Boynton? Well, yes, in trying to find the right girl, for instance. It seems that subconsciously I'm always looking for a girl who's just like my mother. Attractive, yet sweet and unselfish. Well, don't give up the search, Mr. Boynton. Someday you're liable to find such a girl right under your nose. And I think that's a very nice location. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is, when you gave up your room for Mother, I suddenly realized that you're not only attractive, but also sweet and unselfish. So, 
Miss Brooks, instead of just shaking hands like we usually do... Yes, Mr. Boynton? I'd like to say goodnight to you the way I do to my mother. With a kiss. A kiss, Mr. Boynton? <laughs> yes, on the forehead. There you go, shooting too high again. <laughs> Next week, tune in to another Hour Miss Brooks show, brought to you by Tom Onyx Soap, your beauty host, and lustrous cream shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair. Hour Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written and directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Boynton is played by Jeff Chandler, Mr. Conklin by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Gloria McMillan, Frank Nelson, and Myra Marsh. <laughs> Men, do you shave with a lather or brushless shave cream? Palm Olive shaving cream comes both ways. And whichever way you prefer to shave, you'll find that using Palm Olive brushless or Palm Olive lather shaving cream can bring you more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Here's the proof. 2,548 men tried the new Palm Olive way to shave described on the tube. And no matter how they had shaved before, three out of every four got more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Get Palm Olive Brushless or Palm Olive Lather Shaving Cream today. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North, the exciting fun fact adventures of an amateur detective and his beautiful wife. Tune in Tuesday evenings over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at the same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. Stay tuned now for Life with Luigi, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Eve Arden. It's time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks, written by Al Lewis. Well, many of us find it extremely difficult to get up early every morning, but Our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, has been doing it for years. Yes, and I've learned one thing about early rising that's helped me immeasurably. Once I jump out of bed, close the window, and do my setting up exercises, there's only one more thing I want to do, and that's to get right back in bed again. <laughs> Last Friday morning, though, I was up and almost dressed by the time my landlady knocked on the door. Time to get up, honey. I am up, Mrs. Davis. Come on in. I'm trying to get to school early so I can chat with Mr. Boynton for a few minutes before our first class. Is Mr. Boynton still as unapproachable as ever, Connie? I guess so, Mrs. Davis. But you know something? During this past week, I've gotten closer to him than ever before. Really, dear? How did you do that? I've been wearing my sneakers to school. <laughs> I hope I've got time for breakfast before Walter Denton comes to pick me up. There's something he wants to talk to me about before school starts. Well, he can talk to you at breakfast, Connie. My goodness, you've got to keep your strength up some way. We both know you don't get enough sleep. Well, I didn't last night. Minerva slept in here with me, and she was very restless. I don't know what's the matter with that cat lately. Between you and me, Connie, I think she's got something. Between you and me, I think she's got several. <laughs> Maybe it's a mistake to let her get so friendly with the collie next door. They play together all the time, you know. Oh, so that's the source. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Minerva had me up half the night with her pounding. That's just her tail beating on the floor while she's hunting. Oh, I don't mind her tail thumping so much, but every time she catches something with one paw, she applauds with the other three. <laughs> Suppose we join Minerva in the breakfast milk. I've just given her some milk. Fine, I'll have a saucer full, too. <laughs> Sit right down, dear. I'll boil you a couple of eggs. Just one egg will be plenty, Mrs. Davis. Mm. Well, I... Oh, <coughs> Walter... That must be Walter Denton now. Just six eggs will be plenty, Mrs. Davis. <laughs> the door isn't locked. Come in, Walter. Ah, oh, hiya, Miss Brooks. Mrs. Davis. Hello, Walter. How do you want your eggs, Walter? Quickly, please. <laughs> Any breakfast yet? Oh, sure, but it's 7.30 almost, and we eat an awful early breakfast at my place. How early? Quarter to seven. <laughs> I don't know how you're still standing up. <laughs> I'll whip up an omelet for all of us. Miss Brooks, I'd like to ask you about something. What's that, Walter? Well, as you know, Halloween is usually celebrated tomorrow night, Saturday. 
But Per Conklin's going up to her folks' bungalow at Crystal Lake for the weekend. So we wondered if it would be all right with you if we celebrated the holiday tonight. Well, why come to me? Shouldn't you contact the Goblin Union? <laughs> we wanted to sort of have a little party. You know, Harriet, my pal Stretch Snodgrass and I, and uh, we were planning on inviting you, too. Oh? Uh, where were you planning on holding this party, Walter? At your place. <laughs> of you to invite me along. <laughs> but I'm afraid we couldn't have any Halloween parties here, Walter. After all, I don't own this cottage. I just rent a room for Mrs. Davis. Oh, we've already got her permission. She's going to the movies tonight. Harriet asked her on the phone yesterday. It's just up to you, Miss Brooks. Well, I'm afraid I'm not interested in Halloween parties, Walter. I've got quite a bit of work to catch up on, and tonight looks like an ideal time to do it. Sorry, but you'll have to hold your party someplace else. Well, gee, Miss Brooks... Harriet and Stretch will be awfully disappointed. And so will Mr. Boynton. Mr. Boynton? Yeah. I was talking to him yesterday, and he was saying what swell fun he always thought Halloween was when he was a kid. And then we invited him to the party, too. And he accepted. And now there's no place to have the party. What's wrong with having the party right here? <laughs> Hello, Principal's office. Osgood Conklin himself speaking. Hello, Osgood. It's me, Martha. We've been married 18 years, woman. I know your name. <laughs> Do try not to be so testy. Do you realize that you left home this morning without even saying goodbye? Well, that's easily remedied. Goodbye. <laughs> I am well aware of that fact. I've had plenty of time to think about it during the sleepless hours I spent listening to your dog thumping his tail at the foot of our bed all night. But Prince was so lonesome, dear. After all, we've got each other. He's all alone. Well, he wasn't alone last night. <laughs> I never heard such scratching in all my born days. What's he got, anyway? Well, he can't possibly have anything, dear. You know he doesn't play with other dogs. In fact, he would have died of loneliness last week if I hadn't taken him over to Mrs. Davis's to play with her cat, Minerva. <laughs> well, you've got to keep him away from me. My blood pressure is higher than it's been in years. To make my morning complete, when I bent down to tie my shoelaces, my glasses fell off. Did they break? Not until I straightened up and stepped on them. <laughs> well, darling, in a couple of days in Crystal Lake, that will make a new man of you. Now go down to the doctor's and get a nice sedative to take with you. Very well, Martha. It's a good thing I have an extra pair of glasses with me or I couldn't find my way to the door. Now, whatever you do, Osgood, don't break gold. Thank you, my dear. I think that's sterling advice. <laughs> Goodbye. Uh, later than I thought. I'd better hurry. So you see, Walter, if we all meet in the cafeteria at lunchtime, we can make the plan for... Oh, good. Miss Brooks, I presume. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Conklin. I didn't see you coming. Oh, dear, I seem to have broken your glasses. Do you have another pair? No, Miss Brooks, I haven't. <laughs> but uh, perhaps I could get you a long stick and let you smash the windows in my office. Do you seem to be in quite a hurry, Mr. Conklin. Could I maybe take you somewhere? Who is speaking? It's me, Walter Denton. Your daughter Harriet's dream boat. My daughter Harriet's dream yeah. I'll talk to you later, Miss Brooks. Denton, pick up that shattered glass. Yes, sir. Well, what should I do with it, Mr. Conklin? Eat it, you lame brain dunce! <laughs> right, Mr. Conklin's sure in a bad mood today. He looks pretty purple, doesn't he? Even for him. He certainly is excitable. Hi, Walter. Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. Hi. Hello, Harriet. Did you run into Daddy yet this morning? It's in the hands of the insurance company now. <laughs> His temper's pretty miserable today. Yes, I know. Poor Daddy's been depressed all week long. I don't know what it is. We all try to please him. What he needs is some recreation and diversion. 
Say, I have an idea. What is it, Miss Brooks? Well, instead of my place tonight, why don't we have our Halloween party at your house, Harriet? That way we could surprise your father and cheer him up a little bit. <laughs> Wonderful. Miss Brooks, you've done it again. <laughs> as I was to get back into Mr. Conklin's good graces, I determined to make the Halloween party Friday night a roaring success. I had asked the kids to meet me in the school cafeteria at lunchtime, and the first one to show up was Madison's star athlete, Stretch Snodgrass. Although a whiz on the football field, Stretch's outstanding scholastic achievement occurred during a test last week when he spelled his name correctly. <laughs> coffee when he approached my table. So here I am, Miss Brooks. Mind if I sit down? Not at all, Stretch, but wouldn't you like to bring some food over before we discuss the party? Oh, no, ma'am. I already ate. Please, Stretch. <laughs> I've already eaten. Oh, good. Then we can get right down to business. <laughs> Walter said he thought we all had a masquerade or something tonight. That's a fine idea, Stretch. You could come as a student. <laughs> It all set, Miss Brooks. I got some chaps home and spurs and, and two six-shooters that shoot real blanks. I'm coming as Hopalong Cassidy. That is, if nobody minds. Why should anybody mind unless Roy Rogers shows up? <laughs> well, what are you going to masquerade as, Miss Brooks? Oh, I haven't made up my mind yet, Stretch. Of course, every good Halloween party should have a witch. Yes, I might come as a witch. Perfect. <laughs> so enthusiastic. Pretty short notice to get a costume made, and I may not... Why go to all that trouble? Why don't you just wear what you got on? <laughs> Big as he is, I'll have to slug him. Now, look, Stretch. I... Hi, Miss Brooks, Stretch. Well, things are sure shaping up. Look at these tall noisemakers I bought this morning. When did you find time to get all this junk, Walter? I sneaked out of one of my morning classes. Walter, you didn't. Well, it was important, Miss Brooks. Besides, there's no harm done. Nobody even noticed I was gone. That's what I like, a nice, observant teacher. Oh, it wasn't the teacher's fault. You were facing the blackboard at the time. <laughs> Look at this horn. It's got a siren in the mouthpiece. Listen. Please, Walter, you're in the cafeteria. So what? One more blast like that, and the beast stew will pull over to the right. <laughs> Tell me, how are you going to the masquerade? I got a terrific idea, Miss Brooks. I'm just going to put on an old sheet. Do you think Mr. Conklin will get a kick out of me as a ghost? If he thought it was on the level, it would add ten years to his life. <laughs> well, what are you coming at, Miss Brooks? Oh, I haven't quite decided yet. Any suggestions? Well, just one. I don't want you to think I'm being fresh or anything, but, oh, this is going to be a Halloween party, and, oh, I'd be glad to furnish you with a broom. <laughs> I guess I'm a natural for it. Uh, look who's coming over. Oh, it's Mr. Boynton. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Hello, Walter. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Hello, Stretch. Hello, Miss Brooks. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Goodbye, Walter. Goodbye, Stretch. <laughs> we ain't going nowhere. Stretch. Don't you know the old expression, two's company, three's a crowd? Mm, sure I do. But there's four of us. <laughs> Hurry and figure out a costume for tonight. Uh, see you later, folks. Yeah, see you later, folks. Oh, so long, boys. Well, Miss Brooks, I think it's a splendid idea you're giving this little surprise party for our principal tonight. It should do him a world of good. It should do us a world of good, too, if he brightens up a bit. What kind of an outfit do you think you'll wear, Mr. Boynton? Well, I've got a skeleton costume home that I used to have quite a bit of fun with in my college days. It's just a black, tight-fitting garment with a bunch of bones hanging on it. Bones? Yes, they're treated with a phosphorescent paint that makes them glow in the dark. It's quite a startling effect, the more so since I gathered the bones when I was an anatomy student. From anyone I know? <laughs> I don't mean to dwell on it, Miss Brooks, but I find bones a rather fascinating subject, don't you? That depends on what they're wrapped up in. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, how, how are you masquerading tonight? Oh, I don't know. If you're coming as a skeleton, maybe I'll come as a bottle of vitamin. <laughs> I'm really a little stumped, Mr. Boynton. 
What do you think I should be? Well, the two most popular figures associated with Halloween are a black cat and a witch. And I'm much too tall for a cat. <laughs> Walter! Oh, Walter! Get a lube job on that broom, boy. Constance Brooks rides tonight. <laughs> I'm glad we're going away in the morning, Martha. Dr. Benson told me I'm very close to the breaking point. Yes. Of course, Arthur. Uh, Judith, don't shout so. <laughs> he said that some of my trouble was caused by my blood pressure, but that part of it was due to an overactive imagination. He wants me to be calm, relax more. <laughs> I can see him relax with that recurring dream I've had. You mean the one where the ghost visits you at night? Yes. Only the last couple of times it's gotten worse. Instead of a plain ghost, I've been getting one with Walter Denton's head on it. Really, Osgood, I, I just don't know what you've got against that poor boy. Harriet's very fond of him. Then she should see a doctor, too. Where is she, Martha? Well, she's in her room, dear, getting dressed. She said something about a party tonight. Party? All kids nowadays think about well, there won't be any parties at the lake. There won't be any nightmares either. Why, Martha, do you realize that while I was sitting in the doctor's office today, I saw a bulldog by his desk? A bulldog? It was the shadow of his umbrella stand. But I almost jumped out of my skin before he explained it. Things like that happen to people every day are good. Not to me, they don't. At least they'd better not. How do you think the Board of Education would like it if they thought one of their principals went around seeing bulldogs? <laughs> Just don't mention it to anyone, darling. Now I'm going to get you a glass of warm milk and you stay right comfy in your chair till I get back. You're very well. <laughs> yes. That thing looked like a bulldog. <laughs> Martha's right, though. I'd better not mention it to a soul. Now, who in the world can that be? Coming! Good evening, Mr. Conklin. May I come in? There's no tactical way I can refuse you admission. <laughs> come in, Miss Brooks. Have the others arrived yet? Others? What others? You'll see when they get here. Is Harriet at home? Yes, yes. She's putting on her party dress. Oh, then you know about it. It should do you a lot of good, Mr. Conklin. There's nothing like a house full of people to get your mind off yourself. A house full of... Uh, Miss Brooks, is this party to be given in this house? Of course. I see. And if you'll excuse me, I'll just take my hat and coat and beat an orderly retreat. But, Mr. Conklin... My doctor has forbidden any excitement whatsoever. Your doctor? This is a fine time to tell me. I mean, I didn't know you were in such bad shape, Mr. Conklin. I am on the verge of a nervous collapse, Miss Brooks. But I don't want to spoil everybody's fun. I'll just leave quietly. Leave? But, Mr. Conklin, where will you go? What's the difference where I go? <laughs> I'll just wander around the park like a homeless gypsy. You can't do that. You wouldn't look good in earrings. I mean, you're not a well man, Mr. Conklin. Look. Mrs. Davis is going to the movies tonight. Now, why don't you let me drive you over to our place until I can eliminate the horde of pets, uh, guests who are coming here? <laughs> You'll love it over there, Mr. Thompson. You'll be able to relax completely. If it will stave off my breakdown, Miss Brooks, it's the least I can do for my family. <laughs> left right after dinner, Mr. Boynton. I guess she forgot to buy a few items for the party tonight. I'm sure she'll be right back. Fine. Swell. This way our surprise will work out even better. Surprise? Yes, ma'am. We thought we'd try out some of our Halloween tricks on Miss Brooks before we go over to Mr. Conklin's house. That's a wonderful idea. I hope I didn't scare you in my ghost outfit. No, I thought you were the laundry man. <laughs> How do you like my costume, Mrs. Davis? My, you've lost weight, haven't you? This, this is a skeleton suit in honor of Halloween. <laughs> Isn't that terrifying? And who's this cowboy with you? I'm Hopalong Cassidy, Mrs. Davis. 
But I'm really stretched snodgrass. Oh. I never have known. Well, if you'll all go into the house, I'm sure Miss Brooks will be delighted to see you. I've got to get down to the theater now. Oh, what movie are you seeing tonight, Mrs. Davis? Jolton Sings Again, Again. <laughs> again, Again? I saw it last week, also. <laughs> have a nice time, children. And what should I do with this bucket of water we're ducking for apples in, Waller? Oh, and just put it down by the piano, Stretch. Now, I'll tell you what we'll do. Before Miss Brooks comes back, let's all hide somewhere so we can really surprise her. Good idea, Walter. Now, why don't you get behind that couch, stretch you, hide behind the kitchen door, and I'll get into the hall closet. Great. And we'll all come out when I blow this whistle. <whistles> okay? Got you, Walter. Hey, look, out the window. Miss Brooks is coming up the walk, and she's got Mr. Conklin with her. Mr. Conklin? Oh, she probably wanted to get him out of the way while we were getting things ready at his place. So much the better. We'll surprise both of them at the same time. Now, first I'll put the lights out. Quick, let's get out of sight. Well, here we are, Mr. Conklin. I guess Mrs. Davis has left for the movies. The lights are all out. But it does seem quite deserted in here. I'll turn on this hall light so you can see to hang your things up in the closet. I'll turn some lights on in the living room while you put your hat and coat away. Thank you, Miss Brooks. Miss Brooks! Miss Brooks! What is it, Mr. Carpenter? What's the trouble? Your closet! In the hall! What do you keep in there? My coat, Mr. Carpenter. I see. I see. Tell me, Miss Brooks. Is it a long black coat with luminous bones? <laughs> luminous bones? Oh, no. Mm-hmm. Oh, please wait right here, Mr. Conklin. I'll investigate. Oh, it's me, Miss Brooks. You should have seen Mr. Conklin's face when Get he Get was... behind those other coats immediately, Mr. Boynton. But, Miss Brooks... I can't explain now, but don't you dare come out of there until you get a signal. Well, Miss Brooks, what did you see? See? I didn't see anything, Mr. Conklin. It must have been your imagination. My imagination? <laughs> then the doctor was right. Is that, Mr. Conklin? I'd, I'd rather not talk about it, Miss Brooks. If I could just lie down somewhere. Oh, of course, Mr. Conklin. Just stretch out on this couch. I'll go get another cushion for you. All right. Uh, uh, that's better. I must be quite a sick man. (laughs) If I weren't sick, I wouldn't be moaning like this. been asleep. Asleep? Yeah. You just hit the couch, Mr. Carter. <laughs> Which reminds me, maybe you'd better see a good psychiatrist. This screaming of yours can lead to something dangerous. Just, just do me a favor, Miss Brooks. Look behind that couch. Certainly, sir, if it'll make you feel any better. But I assure you, there's absolutely nothing behind this couch. <laughs> I'm sorry if I startled you, Mr. Conklin, but my cat Minerva's back here. With a sheet? She was making her bed. <laughs> Stay out of sight, Minerva. There's a good gurga boy. A girl. If you don't mind, Miss Brooks, I'd like to take a couple of pills my doctor prescribed. May I have some water, please? Certainly, sir. 
If you've got an extra pill or two, I'll be happy to join you. <laughs> Just sit right here, Miss Conklin. I'll go into the kitchen and get some water. Now, on second thought, you'd better come with me. I don't want you to get nervous again. Yes, I, I think you're right, Miss Brooks. It doesn't do for me to be alone lately. Now, where is that light switch? Well, dog bite catch it, but ain't roundup time. <laughs> Actually taken leave of my senses. Oh, it isn't a real leave, Mr. Conklin. You're just on a weekend pass. <laughs> oh, lots of people get temporary hallucinations. Maybe we'd better go back to your house. Yes, yes, at a time like this, I suppose I should be near my loved one. <laughs> my coat coming over. Get back to the closet. Well, it's me, Mr. Conklin. I'm a skeleton, see? Look at me, Mr. Conklin. I'm hop along Cassidy, and I'll plug the first ombre that makes some moves. Snodgrass. I... Oh, stop that! <laughs> I must control myself. What's wrong, Mr. Conklin? You don't seem to be enjoying yourself. Yeah, you act all jumpy and funny. Gosh, Miss Brooks went to a lot of trouble to get this thing organized. Walter, please. Oh, Miss Brooks organized it, did she? Sure, she planned the whole thing. She deserves every bit of credit. Well, she's certainly going to get it. Miss Brooks, I want to... Miss Brooks, Miss Brooks, get your head out of that bucket. This is no time to be ducking for apples. Oh, who's ducking for apples? I'm trying to drown myself. <laughs> Now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, Mr. Conklin was so glad to find out that the things he thought had been happening to him had been happening to him that he excused us all and hurried home. Shortly afterwards, I excused Walter and Stretch, which left just Mr. Boyden, the parlor sofa, and me. Well, here we are, Miss Brooks. You know, with that lamplight shining on your hair, you're, you're absolutely, well... Yes, Mr. Boyden. Yoo-hoo! Yoo-hoo, folks! What's that? Look at the window. It's Mrs. Davis with a pumpkin head. Just what I needed. Happy Halloween, Connie. Trick or treat. I've got a trick, Mrs. Davis. Here's 60 cents. Treat yourself to jolt some things again, again, again. Be sure to listen to Mr. and Mrs. North Tuesday evening over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at the same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob LeBond speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay and luster cream shampoo with soft, glamorous, caressable hair brings you Our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden. It's time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks, written by Al Lewis. For many teachers throughout the country, the past week marked the beginning of a new semester. And for Our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, it was quite a busy time. Thanks to our beloved principal, Osgood Conklin, it was even busier for me than for the rest of the faculty. For in addition to my school duties, he had me typing reports at home in the evenings. All week long, I didn't have a moment to myself. And worse than that, I didn't have a moment to Mr. Boynton. <laughs> Friday morning at breakfast, I couldn't help bending my landlady's sympathetic ear. So you see, Mrs. Davis, not only have I spent the past four nights working for nothing, but I haven't been able to spend any time with Mr. Boynton. That's a shame, Connie. But why did you take on all that extra work? You told me yourself you volunteered to do it for Mr. Conklin. Of course I volunteered. I'm too young to face a firing squad. 
But it's not the work I mind. There's something else that bothers me. Now, look, Connie. I know that Mr. Boynton is tall, dark, handsome, charming. That's what bothers me. (laughs) It's where he's been while I've been busy. Mr. Boynton? Why, he's probably been at home every night, twiddling his thumbs. You're wrong, Mrs. Davis. He's been at Miss Enright's three nights in a row. And for all I know, he's been twiddling her thumbs. I don't think you have to worry about Miss Enright, Connie. She may be a capable English teacher, but when it comes to looks, she's no competition. I don't know about that. She's quite an attractive person these days. These foggy days, that is. <laughs> I appreciate this pep talk, Mrs. Davis, but I'd better get ready to leave. Walter Denton said he'd pick me up early. Good, Connie. That'll give you a chance to plan your counterattack. If you really believe that the enemy has secured a foothold in your territory, you've got to get busy and storm the heights. You're so right. Boynton Heights, here I come. <laughs> I'm glad you were prompt this morning, Walter. There's something I want to attend to before my first class. I know, and I hope he's in his biology lab when you get there. (laughs) (laughs) Look, I don't mean to pry into your personal life. Good, let's keep it that way. But I couldn't help noticing how little you and Mr. Boynton have seen of each other during the past week. Now, listen, Walter. Oh, I know it's because of all the extra work you've had to do. Well, even Harriet Conklin, our principal's own daughter, told me she thought he's been driving you like a horse. Oh, I don't know. I always whinny while I work. (laughs) And you've noticed something else, too. Miss Enright hasn't let any grass grow under her feet. Please, Walter, Miss Enright's gardening problems don't interest me. (laughs) You know what I mean, Miss Brooks. She's had dates with Mr. Boynton one night after another. Walter, I know you're fond of me and mean to be helpful. But if this intensely personal conversation doesn't stop, I'll get out and walk to school. Gosh, Miss Brooks, I didn't mean to intrude on your privacy, but it just happens that I have a wonderful plan to get Mr. Boynton out of Miss Enright's clutches once and for all. You want to hear it, Miss Brooks? How can I help it? I'm not going to get out and walk to school. (laughs) But now you're talking. Oh, the scheme is very simple. We just fight fire with fire. For the past three nights, Mr. Boynton has had dinner at Miss Enright's place. Everybody knows that. What does she live in, a television studio? (laughs) Please, Miss Brooks, you'll stop the flow. Sorry. Obviously, Mr. Boynton keeps coming back there because he gets some good food, and the price is right. Hence, the old saying is proved again, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Well, that may be one of the better routes, Walter, but how do we interrupt Miss Enright's regularly scheduled trips? (laughs) That's where the fighting fire with fire comes in Please, Walter, burning down a fellow teacher is arson No, you don't burn her down You simply tap the same source that she uses for tempting recipes Then you invite Mr. Boynton to your lair Your place (laughs) Well, what is her source of recipes? Miss Dugan's domestic science class The girl's learning to cook at the best recipes you've ever seen And Miss Enright borrows them? Sure after school, she takes them right off the bulletin board in Miss Dugan's room. And they print new ones every day. And Harriet tells me they're so simply written that a sub-moron could follow the instructions. Uh, thanks, Walter. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean it that way, Miss Brooks. But I know you haven't had much experience cooking, and You're I... You're right, Walter. Mrs. Davis does all our cooking. Oh, Harriet's going to meet us at school this morning and take you into the domestic science class for a little brush-up. And then you invite Mr. Boynton to dinner tonight and let nature take its course. Well, here we are. Uh, You get out, Miss Brooks, and I'll find a place to park. All right, Walter. Oh, I keep forgetting. You've got tin slats where the doors should be. (laughs) Give me a hand, will you? Oh, sure, Miss Brooks. Uh, uh, There you go. Well, the corrugated tin looks nice instead of doors, doesn't it? I got the idea from the new Hudson. The new Hudson? Yeah, This is the car you stepped down out of. (laughs) Oh, there's Harriet. Hi, Miss Brooks. Walter. Hi, Harriet. Uh, Take our charge in tow. I'll just be a couple of minutes. Okay, Walter. See you later. Come on, Miss Brooks. Let's go in. All right, Harriet. You seem to be the doctor. You just leave this thing to us, Miss Brooks. We'll have that certain part eating out of your hand in no time. If I break any more dishes at home, he'll have to. (laughs) Now, here's our plan, Miss Brooks. 
Mr. Boynton's favorite dish is Boston stew. Boston stew? How do you know? Miss Enright pumped him for it yesterday. Seems like a lot of trouble to go to. <laughs> now, if Miss Enright suggests Miss Susan is going to get the best possible recipe for Boston stew and put it on the bulletin board sometime today. Then Miss Enright will stop by and... Excuse me, Harriet. I think I'll drop into the domestic science room for a minute. I knew you'd catch on. I've got to stop by Daddy's office, but I'll join you in a little while. We've still got some time to brush you up on some fundamentals. All right, Harriet. Well, if it isn't Miss Brooks. Miss Enright. What brings you to the domestic science room, darling? Oh, I've always been domestic. Only nowadays, you've got to make a science out of it. <laughs> Well, if I've said it once, I've said it a dozen times. The way to a man's heart is through his stomach. By now, that should seem like the old ox road to you. <laughs> I suppose you're referring to my constant dinner companion of the past week. Yes, I am. While I was home alone working overtime, you were home with Mr. Boynton working overtime. And I don't think it's fair, Miss Enright. Oh, fair in love and war, darling. You're just loaded with goodies today, aren't you? <laughs> After all, if Mr. Boynton likes good food prepared with loving care, who's to prevent him from getting it? If I may borrow one of your best-used clichés, two can play at that game. I'm going to prepare a dinner for Mr. Boynton that he'll never forget. You? Oh, darling, you're not the type. Think of the time and money you spend in a beauty parlor to make yourself fairly presentable. <laughs> a steaming kitchen would play havoc with your fragile charm. You don't say. Well, for your information, Miss Enright, food can be cooked just as well on a pretty modern range as it can on an old pot-bellied stove. <laughs> Are you inferring? If the girdle fits, wear it. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will continue in just a moment. But first, here is Vern Smith. No other dentifrice offers proof of such results. Proof that Colgate Dental Cream helps stop tooth decay before it starts. Two years' research at leading universities using Colgate Dental Cream, hundreds of case histories, makes this the most conclusive proof in all dentifrice history on tooth decay. Conclusive proof that when teeth are brushed with Colgate right after eating, Colgate Dental Cream helps stop tooth decay before it starts. Yes, the toothpaste you use to clean your breath while you clean your teeth now offers a safe, proved way to reduce tooth decay. Modern science shows decay is caused by mouth acids, which are at their worst right after eating. Brushing teeth with Colgate, as directed, helps remove acids before they harm enamel. Colgate Dental Cream has been proved to contain all the necessary ingredients including an exclusive patented ingredient for effective daily dental care. Get Colgate Dental Cream today. Big economy size, only 59 cents. Always use Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay before it starts. Remember, no other dentifrice offers proof of such results. <laughs> Well, when lunch period came, I hastened toward the school cafeteria to invite Mr. Boynton over for dinner. As I passed the principal's office, however, the door opened and I heard Mr. Conklin murmur, Halt! <laughs> Step into my office a moment, Miss Brooke. Aye, aye, sir. Uh, sit down, please. Thank you. Since this is your lunch hour, I'll be brief. I just want to tell you that I appreciate your getting out that typing during this past week. Oh, you're welcome, Mr. Conklin. Well, see you later. Uh, one moment, please. The spirit with which we tackled a difficult task was most admirable. In fact, as I watched your fingers flying over the keys, putting in carbon paper, second sheets, making erasures, oiling and cleaning the machine, then washing up and starting all over again, I realized that to me this wasn't work at all. To you it wasn't. <laughs> No, indeed, it was actually, well, fun. Now, there's another report I must have typed, about 30 pages. 30 pages? Uh, yes, yes. One long evening will do it. Oh, good for her. Those Chinese secretaries are really marvelous. <laughs> now, if you'll excuse 
and Miss I... Brooks. <laughs> I'll be over at your home about seven tonight. Mr. Conklin, don't you think you've been a little partial to me lately? Partial? With these honorary jobs, I mean. You know how carefully we teachers try to avoid making pets out of any students, and, well, you've got to be doubly careful in your high office not to pet any teachers. I mean, uh, <laughs> show any partiality. <laughs> Look, I'd like to make a suggestion. Mine is an ever-open mind, Miss Brooks. I know. <laughs> Why don't you give some other teacher the opportunity of working with you tonight? Uh, who, for instance? Well, it's not my place to mention names, but I'm sure Miss Enright would love the opportunity. Miss Enright, eh? She is a competent sort of an individual. Even more competent than some I've used. Yes, yes, I, I think I'll ask her about it right now. Oh, don't ask her now, Mr. Conklin. Surprise her. Just drop over to her place tonight with the work under your arm. But how can I be sure she'll be at home? She'll be at home, all right. If you'll just get there at 7 o'clock sharp, Mr. Conklin, I can promise you, you'll find Miss Enright cooking, with and without gas. <laughs> It's nice to be having lunch together again, isn't it, Mr. Boynton? Oh, it's more than nice, Miss Brooks. It is? It certainly is. This goulash is terrific. It's all right for cafeteria food, I guess, but there's nothing like a home-cooked meal. Don't you think so? Oh, I sure do. I've been very fortunate that way during this past week. I've had a couple of home-cooked meals. You've had three, but who counts? <laughs> What I'm so subtly suggesting, Mr. Boynton, is that you have dinner at my place tonight, for a change. Your place? Yes, I thought I'd prepare dinner for two. Perhaps some special recipe you're fond of? Well, I wish you'd ask me sooner, Miss Brooks. I've promised to have dinner with Miss Enright tonight. Not again. Yeah, not again. Walter! <laughs> Walter, how long have you been eavesdropping behind that history book? Oh, I haven't heard a thing, Miss Brooks. I was just thinking about what to go and get at the steam table. Well, you're excused any time, Walter. Oh, thanks, Mr. Boynton. But all I can say is, anybody that'd eat dinner with Miss Enright instead of a certain other English teacher must have some of his marbles missing. Walter! <laughs> I can't understand his attitude. Oh, I, I guess he just doesn't like Miss Enright. I can understand his attitude. <laughs> Look, Mr. Boynton, I happen to know that Miss Enright will be extremely busy this evening. Mr. Conklin's bringing her a report to type. Mr. Conklin, are you sure? It was the least he could do. But don't worry about your dinner engagement, Mr. Boynton. All you have to do is transfer your appetite to my table. Well, if Miss Enright is going to be busy, I guess I could accept your invitation. That eat somewhere. <laughs> You're too gracious. Is it a date? Oh, it's a date. But, Miss Brooks, did I understand you to say you were going to cook the dinner? Certainly. That's strange. I never thought you knew anything about cooking. Oh, you'd be surprised. I know some very strange things about cooking. Hi, Walter. What brings you to the domestic science room? You'll see, Harriet. I'm glad the others have all gone. Yeah, there. Yeah, it's up. What is it, Walter? What did you put on the class bulletin board? It's a recipe for Boston stew. I printed it myself. You printed it? Sure. I got the idea when I heard Mr. Boynton say he was having dinner with Miss Enright tonight. But Walter, you don't know anything about Boston stew. What ingredients did you use in the recipe? Believe me, Harriet, what I printed in this recipe would be banned in Boston. <laughs> Golly, it's not poisonous, is it? Of course not. Just pleasantly sickening. Uh, now, we better get out of here before old Enright comes in. Boy, this will teach her to try and take up all Mr. Boynton's time just because Miss Brooks is busy working. Miss Dugan! Oh, Miss Dugan! Oh, I guess everybody's gone home. Uh-oh. What's this on the bulletin board? Recipe for Boston stew. Now, that's what I call a coincidence. Come to Connie, baby. <laughs> Mr. Boynton should be here soon, Mrs. Davis. How is the Boston stew coming along? Uh, all right, Connie, but there's so many strange ingredients. I must have 15 things cooking in four different pots. <laughs> How does it look to you? 
Well, frankly, Mrs. Davis, it looks like the stuff they pulled the big mo out of. <laughs> but it must be a good recipe, or it wouldn't have been tacked on the bulletin board. Now, then, did you saute the codfish balls in beef gravy and baste the frankfurters with molasses? I did, Connie. And did you stuff the olives with shredded wheat before frying them? <laughs> yes. And now I'm just bringing the horseradish and turnip greens to a slow boil, Henry. <laughs> Good. And now we come to the main part of the recipe. Wait a minute, I'll read it for you. Under a low flame, gently stir codfish balls in shallow pan while adding one cup popcorn. <laughs> Add bay leaves and wintergreen lifesavers. <laughs> then fold in three cups peanut brittle. <laughs> Garnish with diced carrots and allow to simmer in one bottle of warm Coca-Cola. <laughs> well, every man to his own taste, I suppose. Oh, it was very nice of you to help me with this cooking, Mrs. Davis. But remember now, it's our secret. Of course, dear. As far as Mr. Boynton is concerned, your loving hands alone prepared this masterpiece. Now, I'll just eat my coat and be running along, Connie. I'm having dinner at my brother Victor's house. You told me that before, Mrs. Davis. What time are you due at Victor's? Six o'clock. Uh, what time is it now, Connie? Six thirty. Then I better hurry. I wouldn't want to be late. <laughs> It's Victor's birthday today, you know. You told me that before, too. Really? I am getting absent-minded. Now, where did I put his present? Oh, here it is on the cupboard shelf. Six nice golf balls. See? Yes, they're very pretty. Wait a minute, Mrs. Davis. There are only five golf balls here. Oh, that's all right. Victor never plays golf anyway. <laughs> Well, I'll be going now, dear. Just let the Boston stew simmer for another few minutes and then turn off the gas. I may not have to turn off the gas. This stuff looks strong enough to blow it out. <laughs> oh, that must be Mr. Boynton now. I'll just slip out this back door and be on my way. Lots of luck with the dinner, dear. Thanks again, Mrs. Davis. Wish your brother a happy birthday for me. I will. Good night. Good evening, Miss Brooks. Welcome, Mr. Boynton. Let me put your umbrella in the closet. This is Miss Enright. <laughs> Sorry. They both have the same type frame. <laughs> Come in, I suppose. Thank you, Dottie. Give me your coat, Mr. Boynton. I'll hang it up for you. Oh, thank you. Here's my coat, dear. Just throw it over that chair. <laughs> Your hospitality is overwhelming. Uh, you see, Miss Brooks, I took the liberty of bringing Miss Enright along for dinner because we did have a prior date and she didn't have anything else to do. But what about Mr. Conklin? Well, fortunately, he phoned me about that typing assignment you arranged for me. But I told him that as much as I'd love to help him, I couldn't because of my sore finger. What sore finger? The one that got better as soon as I phoned Mr. Boynton. <laughs> I don't see why we can't have a fairly jolly dinner party. Oh, I'll bet you've got a swell dinner ready. Mm -hmm. what, what's that I smell? Is it coming from the kitchen? I wouldn't be surprised if it was running from the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I'll have to set another place at the table Don't now. you lift a finger, darling. I'll set my own place and pitch right in like a good little sport. <laughs> we girls have to stick together, you know. I'm stuck with you, all right. Well, I'm going into the kitchen, if I may, and help carry things out when they're ready. All right, Mr. Boynton. Oh, I'll answer the door. You just go on back to the kitchen. Oh, don't worry about me, Miss Brooks. I'm pretty handy around the house. Yeah, the wrong house. <laughs> Walter! Hiya, Miss Brooks. I knew you were going to be all alone tonight, so I got permission from my folks to eat with you. Well, uh, can I come in? Why not? Although, about my being alone... Boy, I've got a story to tell you that'll really cheer you up. I can use it. Come into the dining room, Walter. We're about ready to start. Oh, swell. Of course, I've got a date with Harriet tonight, so I'll have to go right after dinner. But I want you to hear the rib I pulled this afternoon. Well, I... if it isn't one of my favorite pupils, how are you, Walter? Miss Enright, 
But I... Why, didn't you expect me either? We're all being surprised tonight, aren't we? Well, I put everything in this big platter, Miss Brooks. Oh, oh hello, Walter. Oh, well, hello, Mr. Boynton. Well, what are you doing here? I was invited. So was Walter. We're all invited. Now, let's sit down and get this over with. Uh, start eating, shall we? <laughs> fine, fine. I, I, I'll be the papa bear and do the serving. <laughs> Here's yours, Miss Enright. Thank you. I think. <laughs> Here's your dish, Miss Brooks. Thank you. Now you, Walter. Oh, boy, I'm starved. Well, go on and eat, my boy. This is food that's fit for a king. Yeah, I'll try one of these round things first. Uh, oh, oh, this is kind of slippery. Look out, Walter. It's rolling off your plate. <laughs> I caught it on the fourth bound. <laughs> Here you are. Say, this is a pretty strange kind of food. It says Spalding Crow Flight on it. Spalding Crow Flight? Don't give it another thought. Victor never plays golf anyway. <laughs> Just what kind of a dish is this, Miss Brooks? Oh, can't you tell? This is Boston stew. Well, sure, anybody knows that. You can tell at a glance that this is good old... Boston stew! <laughs> the recipe wasn't on the bulletin board in the domestic science room. You took it, Miss Brooks. Why not? First come, first served, I always say. Now, let's dig in, shall we? Uh, but, Miss Brooks... You better start eating, Walter. Remember what you told me. You've got to go right after dinner. I know, but this isn't the way I want to go. <laughs> I gotta talk to you privately for a minute Come on into the kitchen Hey, excuse us, folks Just continue eating, won't you? I'll be back as soon as I see what's wrong with Walter What is it, Walter? What's the trouble? That recipe for Boston stew That didn't come from the domestic science teacher I printed that myself You? Sure, that was the rib I started to tell you about I thought Mr. Boynton was gonna have dinner with Miss Enright So I wanted to fix her wagon I just put down everything I could think of in that recipe. Oh, this is terrible. I've got to stop them. Yeah, you better. I'm going to take a powder out the back way. If Miss Enright finds out about this, she'll kill me. And if she doesn't, it's my turn tomorrow. <laughs> uh, listen, folks, don't touch the... Where's Miss Enright? The strangest thing happened, Miss Brooks... She took one spoonful of the stew and got the most peculiar look on her face. <laughs> and then she excused herself and ran out the front door. I don't know what got into her. I do. <laughs> Mr. Boynton, oh, please... She never acted that rudely before. I can't understand Well, never it. mind that now. I hope you didn't taste that stew. Taste it? Well, I've eaten two plates of it. <laughs> oh, it's delicious, Miss Brooks. Well, I feel warm all over. Just... <laughs> It just goes to prove the old saying, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Mr. Boynton, with two plates of that stew in there, the super chief couldn't get through. <laughs> Eve Arden as our Miss Brooks returns in just a moment, but first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight? Yes, tonight. Show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a luster cream shampoo. Luster cream, world's finest shampoo. No other shampoo in the world gives K. Dumas magic blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Not a soap, not a liquid. Luster cream shampoo leaves hair three ways lovelier. Fragrantly clean. Free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen, soft, manageable. Even in hardest water, luster cream lathers instantly. No special rinse needed after a luster cream shampoo. So gentle, luster cream is wonderful even for children's hair. Tonight, yes, tonight, try luster cream shampoo. Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. You owe your crowning glory to a luster cream shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, Mr. Boynton was so grateful for the Boston stew, 
He could hardly wait till the dishes were finished before inviting me to a movie. But as we headed for the closet to get our coats, the front door opened and a familiar voice murmured, Hey! <laughs> Mr. Conklin. Oh, hello, Barton. Well, Miss Brooks, since Miss Enright has a bruised finger tonight, I brought over this 30-page report and I'm going to let you type it. Thanks a million. Oh, gosh, Mr. Conklin, well, we were planning to see a movie. Well, you'll have to go alone, Boynton. This is business. Oh, awfully sorry, Miss Brooks. I'll go get my coat out of the closet. All right, Mr. Boynton. Mr. Conklin, can't this typing be postponed? I'm afraid not. This is so important, I even skipped my dinner so that we could buckle right down to work. Uh, by the way, while we're working, I could use a little snack. Do you have anything around that I could eat? Eat? Yeah. I have just the thing for you, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> Mr. Boynton. Yes, Miss Brooks? Stick around. I'll be with you in a minute. Next week, tune in to another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Mustard Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair and Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Boynton is played by Jeff Chandler, Mr. Conklin by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Gloria McMillan, and Mary Jane Croft. Here is Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> Last Friday was Student Government Day, a day upon which the entire administration of the city is handed over to high school pupils who have been elected by their classmates. Well, ordinarily, Our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, would have very little to do with this event. But unfortunately, Miss Johnson, the civics teacher, took ill on Thursday, and our principal, Mr. Conklin, suggested that I take over her class. Of course, I didn't have to accept the assignment. I just figured that teaching is better than being totally unemployed. <laughs> In some states, it's better. <laughs> At any rate, I conducted Miss Johnson's civics class on Thursday, and on the subject, what would I do if I held public office, the class and I had quite a spirited discussion. And in view of later developments, I'm sorry I didn't listen. But Friday morning finally rolled around, and the entire student body and faculty gathered in the assembly hall to hear Mr. Conklin officially proclaim it Student Government Day. Mr. Boynton, my bashful biologist, was sitting in the front row. And accidentally, with the aid of two bloodhounds, I found myself sitting right next to him. <laughs> Hello, Miss Brooks. Why, Mr. Boynton, this is a surprise. To you, anyway. <laughs> I didn't see you sit down. I believe I left my notebook on that seat. It, it's just some lecture notes on the North American porcupine. Oh, sorry, Mr. Boynton. I didn't even notice it. He must have pulled in his quills. <laughs> Here you are. Oh, thanks. I, I'll just hold it in my lap. Why don't we let the notebook have the seat and you could hold... No, not in school like that. <laughs> You know, Miss Brooks, something just occurred to me. We're always sitting next to each other in assembly. Fate seems to be throwing us together. Compared to my throwing, fate is a sandlot pitcher. <laughs> but perhaps you're right, Mr. Boynton. Maybe we should give fate a helping hand. I'm free for lunch today. How about you? Or would you rather ask me? <laughs> or am I being too subtle? <laughs> oh, darn that bell. I'll have to get him in the next round. <laughs> Students, faculty members, and honored guests. First of all, as your principal, I would like to announce that because this is Student Government Day, school will be suspended. Please, please, please. I sympathize with your disappointment. But as you know, Student Government Day has been tried successfully in many other communities. And I have always been ready to experiment in any progressive plan to foster good citizenship. That is why you see before you on this platform our honored guest, Mayor Rimson. <laughs> now, Mayor Rimson, would you care to say a few words? Of course not. He only brought those nine pages along to put his gum in. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Conklin, for your generous introduction. <clears throat> As I look out upon this host of young, eager, intelligent faces, 
The tide of emotion swells up in me. I'm getting a little seasick myself. And as I think of the glorious future which this community can look forward to at the hands of these youths, I am deeply touched. I have always been well informed on the affairs of young people. He ought to be. He's kissed so many babies you can't see his tie for the pablum. <laughs> and so it is with considerable pride that I now inaugurate for the first time in this community Student Government Day. Therefore, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to you your duly elected mayor, Miss Harriet Conklin. You may applaud now. Thank you. My constituents, friends, and Mayor Rimson, I intend to show this community something new and different by making my term of office a clean and honest administration. Well, no. We will not tolerate graft and corruption. We know. Thank you, Harriet Conklin. As Miss Brooks said in our civic class yesterday, the racketeers must go, no matter what politician is protecting them. Oh, that Miss Brooks certainly is a card. <laughs> that will be all, Harriet. Did you really say that in civics class? I don't know. I wasn't listening. <laughs> Mayor Rimson, allow me to apologize for my daughter's enthusiasm. Uh, uh, she was obviously referring to the aims of city governments in general, without realizing that those aims have already been attained in our community. Uh, gosh. <laughs> and now, it is my extreme pleasure to introduce the student who has been elected your chief of police. Walter Denton. Thank you. Thank you, friends. As your incumbent police chief, I cannot re-emphasize too forcefully the remarks Miss Brooks made in civics class yesterday. <laughs> to wit, every crook and grafter who has been malting the city treasury of funds has gotten... <laughs> Thank you, Chief of Police Walter Denton. I haven't finished my speech. Oh, yes, you have, Denton. But, Mr. Conklin, as Miss Brooks said just yesterday... This is not a symposium on the memoirs of Miss Brooks. Or maybe it is. Miss Brooks, you here? No, I couldn't make it today. What's that? Oh, oh, there you are. Before we go any further, isn't there something you'd like to say? Yes, sir. Is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> For me, Mr. Conklin? Yes, Miss Brooks, I did. In spite of my abject apologies, Mayor Rimson left here in a very ugly mood. Now, Miss Brooks, just what happened in civics class yesterday? Well, we had an open discussion, and somebody opened it wider than I realized. <laughs> but we only discussed corrupt city administrations in general, Mr. Conklin. We made no specific mention of Mayor Rimson's corrupt administration. <laughs> uh, never, never mind what you mean. Thanks to you, we've got a band of young malcontents on our hands. Why, not five minutes ago, a student delegation was in here demanding a three-day school week. And that's not all. They also informed me that they would like a four-hour day, starting from the moment they leave home till the moment they arrive back there. <laughs> and portal to portal. Next thing you know, they'll be wanting time and a half for leaving the room. <laughs> No telling how far this thing can go. They've got the whip hand. They're in public office today. Student government day indeed. Whoever thought up that crack-brained idea ought to have his head examined. Bend over, Mr. Conklin. What? It was your idea. Oh, well, don't change the subject. There's no telling... <laughs> As I was saying, there's no telling what that student reform party is capable of doing. Miss Brooks, it's up to you to see that they stay out of mischief. But, Mr. Conklin, you said this was a holiday, and I've got a very important lunch date to make. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry, Miss Brooks, you've got to chaperone those students. But, Mr. Conklin... Dismiss, but Miss Brooks. I said fall out. On the double. Aye, aye, sir. <laughs> Fine way to spend a holiday, chaperoning a bunch of... What am I running about? I'm halfway down the hall. 
Oh, well, that's funny. I stopped right outside Mr. Boynton's biology lab. <laughs> well, I might as well go in now that I'm here. <laughs> oh, hello, Miss Brooks. Well, say, I hope Mr. Conklin wasn't too severe with you. Not at all, Mr. Boynton. How are you at setting bones? <laughs> and speaking of lunch, which you weren't, the date we almost had but didn't quite because you didn't get around to asking me and which I was going to talk you into but which I would have had to cancel because Mr. Conklin wants me to chaperone the students who are acting as government officials today. Oh, just a minute, Miss Brooks. I can't quite follow you. Me either, Mr. Boynton. <laughs> I suppose I'm trying to apologize for standing you up. When? Today. You were supposed to have lunch with me today? How nice of you to ask me. <laughs> say the front steps in 15 minutes? Oh, but... I just uh, want to powder my nose and fix up a bit. But you said something about chaperoning the... Oh, that stuff. can wait till after lunch. See you in a little while, Mr. Boynton. I wonder if I'm playing too hard to get. <laughs> now, if I can just avoid her honor, the mayor, and Walter Denton. Well, Walter, there's Miss Brooks. Uh -oh. Hiya, Miss Brooks. We've been looking for you. I've been lurking from you, too. <laughs> Miss Brooks, as mayor of this community... I feel that I have you to thank for many of my high ideals. Me too, Miss Brooks. When you stood up in civics class yesterday with a, a kind of glowing, luminous light emanating from your skull and your chalk <laughs> poised in front of the blackboard, you know who you reminded me of? Joan of Arc at the Battle of the Erasers. <laughs> Look, kids, I promised Mr. Conklin and I'd chaperone you today, Wonderful, but I have... Miss Brooks. We're really going to clean up this town. You have no idea what's going on in this town, Miss Brooks. If you'll just stick with us, we'll show you graft and corruption, infamy and greed. I'd rather have Mr. Boynton show me spaghetti and meatball. <laughs> now, if you'll just keep quiet about it, I'll meet Mr. Boynton for lunch. Lunch? But what about the ideas of decent, honest government that you had yesterday? Yeah, and don't you want to be in at the kill? Who are we killing? I'm afraid we'll have to take an executive action, Walter. Right. Miss Brooks, I assume you still believe in obedience to duly elected authority? Of course I do, Walter. Then, as chief of police, I hereby appoint you deputy sheriff. For the rest of the day, Miss Brooks, you'll take orders from me. But, Walter... Silence. Oui, mon capitaine. Here, with this badge, I hereby make you a deputy sheriff. Look, Walter, to you I'm a deputy sheriff, and to Harriet I'm a deputy sheriff. But to a deputy sheriff, am I a deputy sheriff? Hmm? You'd better pull over, Walter. Why, Miss Brooks? Oh, oh, the siren. No, that's on our car. I put it on this morning. I don't want to see insubordinate, Chief, but just where are we going? To the Jackpot Amusement Company's warehouse. We've been watching the place for weeks, Miss Brooks, in preparation for today. And we've seen truckloads of slot machines delivered there. Slot machines? Sure. The kind they put in the back of candy stores where little school kids can spend their lunch money in a futile effort to get rich quick. You know, where you pull a lever and try to hit as many bumpers as possible. Oh, the game I play in my car. <laughs> It's the one-armed bandits that keep the kids broke. Oh, they're all fixed. Fixed? Sure. If a machine pays back more than five cents on a dollar, they break its arm. Here we are. The Jackpot Amusement Company. What are we going to do here? We're going to raid the place. We three? No, there's another bunch of kids coming any minute. You see, the fire commissioner had to go home and change his pants. He tore him sliding down the pole at the firehouse. <laughs> well, are you all ready, men? Speaking for some of us, men, no. Now, when I blow my police whistle, we'll charge. Sorry, I don't have an account here. <laughs> Let's go. I'm with you, Walter. Oh, now, Walter, Harriet, listen. Let's go to a movie. Open up in the name of the law. Are you going to open up or do we have to break it in? Walter, please. Stand in back of Miss Brooks, Harriet. Oh, fine. Now they're going to use me for a battering ram. <laughs> What's going on out here? Trick or treat. <laughs> What's that? Are you one of the employees of the Jackpot Amusement Company? What if I am? You're under arrest. What? Miss Brooks, you're a deputy sheriff. Arrest this man. <laughs> Pull over to the curb, bud. <laughs> Look, lady, I'm a busy man. 
Why don't you just take your kids over to the playground and shove them down a sharp slide? <laughs> now, beat it. Oh, resist the arrest, eh? This may go hard with you, my good man. What's going on here? Who blew the police whistle? I did. Officer, arrest this man. What did he do? He tried to get fresh with you, lady. No, and that's the story of my life. <laughs> And what do you want him arrested for? Yours not to reason why. As your chief of police, I gave an order. Your duty is to obey. How does that go again, Sonny? You heard him, officer. As mayor, I decree that you arrest this individual. Well, let me get this straight. You're the mayor, and he's the chief of police. Ah. Who are you, lady? I'm Joan of Arc, and stop breathing on my armor. <laughs> I do not wish to be rude, but I have to go in now. You see, I am Little Miss Muffet, and I have to go sit on my tuffet for a while. <laughs> this is your last chance, officer. Arrest that man in there, or tomorrow you'll be pounding a beat in a swamp. Oh, pounding a beat in a swamp, is it? Do you realize this is insubordination? Oh, insubordination, is it? You've just got to arrest that man. Oh, arrest that man, is it? This is getting monotonous, was it? <laughs> well, folks, why don't you all run along and we'll forget about the whole thing? Oh, that settles it. Miss Brooks, arrest this policeman. Arrest this policeman, is it? Now, don't start that again. Will you go quietly, or do I have to use the bracelet? Take it easy, lady. We'll settle this in a minute. That doesn't frighten anybody. I got one of those, too. Good for you, Sonny. Some people don't seem to be familiar with the Constitution of the United States. Which says, we the people of the United States of America, America that matter, the in order to form a more perfect union, which says, establish justice. Little it's Jack Horner sat in the good. corner Why eating his Christmas good. pie. Uh, <laughs> he stuck in his thumb and pulled out a plum, and along came the Black Mariah. <laughs> Miss Brooks. He won't even listen to us. Let me call him. After all, I'm still mayor. Fine mayor. She's been in office six hours and the whole administration's up the river. <laughs> Much your fault is mine. You and your police whistle. Now, don't start bickering, children. Maybe if we behave ourselves, they'll make us trustees. Hello out there. Oh, God. Jailer. Turnkey. Shut up. My, what ill-bred screws. <laughs> yes, yes, Mrs. Denton, I'll call you the minute I hear from Walter. Goodbye. Imagine that, Martha. Mrs. Denton wanted me to call the police department. How would they know where her son Walter is? I can't understand it, Martha. You can't understand what, Osgood. That's the fifth parent who's called me up to ask why her child hasn't come home for dinner yet. You'd think they'd keep track of their children and not suddenly discover at 7 o'clock that they haven't come home for dinner yet. By the way, where's Harriet? She hasn't come home for dinner yet. What? Well, don't just stand there. Do something. Call Miss Brooks. I put the children in her charge. Call the police. The Bureau of Missing Persons. Get the district attorney. Contact the mayor. Find out if there's somebody else. Why don't they... Be... Well, maybe you could get a hold of them. But I don't know what you... What are you just standing there for? I'm here to... I'm here to... you not Why don't you do something? a walrus caught in a Turkish bath. <laughs> I did call Miss Brooks. Mrs. Davis says she wasn't home yet. Poor woman. She's had dinner on since six. She's terribly worried about her stewed tomatoes. Please stop sniveling about Mrs. Davis's tomatoes. We've got our own tomato to worry about. <laughs> Dear, calm down a little. Here, have some fruit. It's very good for the nerves. I don't want any fruit. Oh, that's probably Harriet now. I'll answer it. I must lose my temper. I must be calm. <laughs> Hello. Osgood. You're talking in a banana. No wonder with the house all cluttered up with fruit bowls. Hello? Is that you, Harriet? No, Osgood. This is Martha Davis. Oh. Uh, uh. I just had the call from Miss Brooks. You have? Yes, Osgood. Oh, 
Harriet, Walter, Denton, and several of the other students are with her. Oh, well, thank heaven. Tell me, Margaret, where are the children and Miss Brooks? They're in jail, Oscar. <laughs> fine, fine. You see, Martha, I told you there was nothing to worry about. Miss Brooks and the children are all in jail. <laughs> this phone out of my hands and put back the banana. <laughs> Here are the prisoners, young fella. You may talk with them, but don't try to pass anything through the bar. Oh, thank you. What, Mr. Boynton? Hi, Mr. Boynton. We've been framed. About that luncheon date, I don't think I can make it. <laughs> What is all this, Miss Brooks? Haven't you heard? We're celebrating Student Convict Day. <laughs> we were only doing our duty as public servants, but Mayor Rimson must have forgotten to notify any of the other authorities. Yeah, we raided some racketeers, and the next thing we knew, we were in the pie wagon. Well, they, they have no right to hold you here. Oh, officer? Officer? What is it now? Why, there, there's been a mistake. Please open this cell and let these people out of here. Oh, let these people out of here, is it? Well, yes, it just happens that I've had quite a bit of legal training in addition to my biological background, and I can tell you that you have no legal basis upon which to hold them any longer. Good for you, Mr. Boynton. And I'm telling him, Mr. B. And furthermore, I'm sure you don't want to get into any trouble. Oh, I don't, don't I? Tell him you'll have him pounding a beat in the swamp. Uh, <laughs> if you persist in this belligerent attitude, you're liable to be pounding a beat in a swamp. That's done it. <laughs> I knew you'd see it my way. At last, Mr. Boynton, just you and I and the children. <laughs> it's absurd. I don't belong in this cell. Now oh, behave yourself. Behave yourself or I'll put you in solitary. Oh, there you are, Connie. What, Mrs. Davis? I would have been here sooner, but I just had to stop at the mass meeting. What mass meeting, Mrs. Davis? Oh, Mr. Boynton is with you. How nice. Uh Please, Mrs. Davis, we've got to get out of here. Now, if you'll only... Everybody in town was there, Connie. And I told them what you said to me on the phone about student government day being run all wrong. Good for you, Mrs. Davis. Now maybe we'll get some action. Where's the brook cell? <laughs> the line forms on your left. <laughs> So told those parents how you said that if you had been running student government day instead of Mr. Conklin, there wouldn't have been so much dunderheaded bumbling. Uh, bumbling? Oh, hello, Osgood. We were just talking about you. Anybody want to buy a used teacher's license? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I'll be running along. Now that Mr. Conklin's here, I'm sure there's nothing further to worry about. Miss Brooks, how could you put... Why did you have to... When were you... Oh, please, Mr. Mr. Conklin, remember your blood pressure. It wasn't Miss Brooks' fault, Daddy. Don't blame her. And you, Harry, in prison. How could you do this to me? My own flesh and blood. If you've got his blood, Harry, you better watch your pressure, too. <laughs> Quiet, gentlemen. Miss Brooks, my painful duty to inform you that you are under suspension for conduct unbecoming a teacher. Have you anything to say in your own defense? Yes, Your Honor. I'd like a new trial. <laughs> on, uh, on what ground? On the grounds that I'm not doing so well in this one. <laughs> we'll discuss that at the proper time. Meanwhile, you children remain here in Mr. Boynton's charge until I can arrange to have... Mr. Boynton? <laughs> what in the world are you doing here? I'm just visiting, Mr. Cartman. One of those guests you just can't get rid of. <laughs> Well, we'll see all about this. I'm going straight to Mayor Rimson's office. I'll handle this matter personally. Oh, but what'll I do in the meantime? With a little luck, 30 days. <laughs> well, you've done a lot for me, H.J., but I can't understand why we're dumping this slot machine deal. Because it's too hot, Mayor. Besides, our cut ain't big enough. Also, the people are up in arms. The people? What do they know about it? Ed, I'm surprised at you. What do my initials stand for? H.J., Honest Jim. I'm the people's friend, Ed, and we got an election coming up. We can't afford to let the people get upset, or the first thing you know, they'll start thinking for themselves. And then where are we? <laughs> okay, Jim, okay. I'll have the jackpot company get rid of those machines right away. No, I've got a better idea. Ed, you're going to make yourself a hero with every parent in this community. Huh? You're going to let the kids do this job, the kids who were elected to public office for this one day. 
Wonderful, Jim, wonderful. I'll call all my department heads and I'll tell them the students holding office that I have complete authority. Fine, Ed. It's democracy in action. That's what it is. Yes, sir, democracy in action. <laughs> and Mayor Remsen is solidly behind it. Until after election. <laughs> Which one of you is Mayor Harriet Conklin? I am. Step out, please. Now, which one of you is Chief of Police Denton? Oh, that's me. Come on out. I've had orders to release the both of you. Oh, but what about Miss Brooks and myself? Sorry, my orders didn't say anything about you two. But I insist that you release them immediately. Quiet, Walter. Orders are orders. <laughs> Once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, in spite of everything, Walter and Harriet got us out of jail promptly. And that wasn't the only thing Student Government Day accomplished. The racketeers left town almost immediately. In fact, the very next day, Walter took me out to the jackpot warehouse for a last look at the place. Pretty deserted now, isn't it? Yes, it is, Walter. Let's go in and see if they've cleaned out the slot machine. I'm going to look around in back, Miss Brooks. Go ahead, Walter. Hey, here's one of those nickel machines. <laughs> What a racket. Naturally, two lemons and an anchovy. <laughs> if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. Crime does not pay. Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, was produced and directed by Larry Burns, written by Arthur Alsberg and Al Lewis, with the music of Lud Bluskin. Mr. Conklin was played by Gail Gordon. This program came to you from the Frankfurt studios of the American Forces Network Europe, and was prepared for rebroadcast over this network by specialist Ed Barron. Now, Amison, the tablets thousands of physicians and dentists recommend for fast relief of pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia, and Bicidol mints, that quickly rid stomach of gastric distress, present Armis Brooks, starring Eve Arden. It's time once again for another comedy episode of Armis Brooks Transcribed. But first, may I make a suggestion that you will probably thank me for someday? It is simply this. The next time you suffer from headache, neuritis, or neuralgia pain, try Anison. The reason we suggest this is because we feel sure you will be surprised at how incredibly fast Anison gives you relief. Thousands of people who have tried Anison say its action is truly astonishing. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thus, in taking Anison, you are following sound principles. The next time you suffer pain from headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, don't wait for relief. Try Anison on this guarantee. If the first few Anison tablets do not give you all the relief you want, as fast as you want it, return the unused portion and your money will be refunded. You can get Anison in any drug counter in handy boxes of 12 and 30 tablets and economical family size bottles of 50 and 100. I'll spell the name for you. A-N-A-C-I-N. Well, there are many reasons why our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, and her landlady, Mrs. Davis, get along so well. Having lived together for many years, they've developed a system of cooperation that begins the first thing in the morning. Yes, we do everything on schedule. At 7 o'clock sharp, the alarm goes off in Mrs. Davis's room. She gets up, brushes her teeth, and promptly at 7.10 comes into my room and wakes me up. I hop out and brush my teeth, 
And then at 7.20, I walk into Mrs. Davis's room and wake her up once more. <laughs> then she combs her hair, slips on a house dress, and by 7.30, she's all ready to dash in and get me out of bed again. <laughs> but by 7.40 or so, when we sit down to breakfast, we're both as chipper as two larks, eager, bright-eyed, and ready to face the new day. Take last Friday morning, for instance, when Mrs. Davis set my plate before me, her first words were, Connie, oh, Connie, wake up and eat your eggs. Huh? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm wide awake, Mrs. Davis. Good. Then get your chin out of your tomato juice and eat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty hungry now that I'm up. Mmm, this juice is good. Feels nice and cool on my chin. <laughs> now I'll just do a job on these scrambled eggs. Hmm, they seem a little different today. I, Oh, where did you get these eggs, Mrs. Davis? Now, Connie, you're just not used to powdered eggs. <laughs> powdered eggs? The grocer assured me that we'd never be able to tell them from the genuine article. He's right. They taste just like real powder. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll settle for toast and coffee. Uh, pass the butter, please, Mrs. Davis. Certainly, dear. But it's margarine. Margarine? Yes. It's quite a bit cheaper than butter. Oh, I see. Here. Care for a part of the paper, dear? No, I'll just eat a big lunch. <laughs> oh, you mean to read. <laughs> yes, thanks. I know the breakfast isn't what it should be today, Connie. But frankly, it was my way of hinting that it's difficult to make ends meet. I know, Mrs. Davis. I owe you eight weeks back rent now. It'll be nine tomorrow. <laughs> I don't like to dun you, dear. But I've got to raise $50 by next week or lose all my living room furniture. But you own that furniture outright, Mrs. Davis. You made the last payment two months ago, don't you remember? Certainly, dear. But then last month I had to have the roof repaired. So? So I borrowed on the living room furniture. <laughs> this is getting pretty involved, but since it's my fault that you don't have the money, I'll try to get it for you someplace. Maybe Mr. Conklin will advance it to me. Well, that's very considerate, dear. Things could be worse, I suppose. Look at this story in the newspaper, the third robbery in this vicinity in a week. Last night in the next block, a house was robbed by cat burglars. Cat burglars? Who did they rob? Mr. and Mrs. Katz. <laughs> My goodness, some people have all the luck. Luck? Why couldn't they have broken into this house while we were out? I could have collected enough insurance to pay what I borrowed on the furniture and get some new stuff besides. Well, that's no way for you to think, Mrs. Davis. After all, that must be Walter Denton to drive me to school. Oh, dear. Do you suppose he's got a big appetite this morning? That's like asking if John L. Lewis has eyebrows. <laughs> now, come on in, Walter. I'll set a place for him. Top of the morning, gracious ladies. And the rest of the day to yourself, Barry Fitzgerald. <laughs> we haven't much to offer today in the way of breakfast, Walter, well, but... what's wrong with the stuff on this platter? I'll just help myself to a plate full, if I may. Certainly you may, dear. Here's a knife and fork. Mmm. Oh, this is delicious. You like it? Sure I like it. Oh, this is one of my favorite dishes. You know what it is? Well, I ought to know what it is. I've been eating it since I was four years old. You have? Well, sure. No, I don't want to sound like a connoisseur or anything, but these are absolutely the best hominy grits I ever had. <laughs> hominy grits? Yes, doesn't Mrs. Davis prepare them wonderfully, Walter? If you'll excuse me a moment, I'd better clean up the kitchen. I thought you had. I mean... <laughs> I'll see you later, Mrs. Davis. Yeah, I'll see you later, Mrs. Davis. Well, now that we're alone, Miss Brooks, I'd like to ask a favor of you. It's in connection with Harriet Conklin. What about Harriet Conklin? She's broken three dates with me this week, and she won't tell me why. Now, Miss Brooks, you're a woman. Warm, attractive, desirable. Have some more hominy grids. <laughs> I mean, go on, Walter. Well, being the kind of person you are, you can ascertain better than I how another such person would act toward a person like myself if a third person entered such a person's life. From the adage, one man's meat is another man's person. 
Look, Walter, I've got to see Mr. Conklin this morning about getting an advance. So if Harriet's around his office, I'll try to find out whether or not there's a new romantic interest in her life. Wonderful, Miss Brooks. How do you propose to accomplish this? In a very devious, feminine, and mysterious fashion, Walter. How? I'll ask her. <laughs> but, Daddy, just because you and Mother are going to be away until tomorrow doesn't mean someone has to stay over with me. Well, I think it's ridiculous. Silence, Harriet. <laughs> After the years we've been married to one another, your mother and I ought to be better judges of what is ridiculous. What I mean is we have better judgment in these matters. <laughs> but just because of a few silly hold-ups in the other end of town... Honestly, I was too ashamed to even tell Walter Denton why I couldn't go out with him all this past week. Ashamed? With gangs of hoodlums roaming the streets? I want your mother's mind to be at ease about you tonight. She's worried enough about that emergency call from your grandmother as it is. Oh, there's nothing really wrong with Granny. She's just lonesome. And, Daddy, you must look at my side of this. Why, well, here I am, a 16-year-old girl, and you want to get me a babysitter. Why, if any of the kids at school find out about this, they'll laugh me right out of Madison. Well, don't worry about that. I'll giggle you right back in. <laughs> Now then, it's just a question of whom to persuade to stay over with you. I'd like someone dependable and reliable. Someone who could think fast in an emergency. Who is it? It's Miss Brooks, sir. I may have to settle for less. <laughs> One moment, Miss Brooks. Now then, Harriet, to avoid any unnecessary discussion, you will kindly leave through my inner office. But Daddy won't... March, Moppet! <laughs> Come in, Miss Brooks. Good morning, Mr. Conklin. I know you're busy, so I'll come right to the point. I have a favor to ask. Now, isn't that a coincidence? I, too, have a favor to ask. Well, you know what I always say, one hand washes the other. Yes, I know, but the last time you said it, my hand didn't even get into the basin. <laughs> <laughs> what I wanted to ask you, sir, uh, Later, this... later, Miss Brooks. Mine is by far the more pressing business at the moment. No doubt you heard of the recent robberies around town? Yes, I have, Mr. Conklin. I don't like to sound redundant, but just last night, cat burglars robbed the catses. Yeah. <laughs> Disgraceful. Nobody knows where they'll strike next. Now, it so happens that my wife and I have to be out of town tonight, and we want someone to remain in our home with Harriet. Well, I'd like to help you out, sir, but tonight is Friday. Oh, thank you for a most illuminating prognostication. Well, what I mean is I have a previous engagement, sir, with Mr. Boynton. For the sake of your principal's peace of mind, Miss Brooks, a mere social engagement can easily be broken. But, Mr. Conklin, he'd be very disappointed and... Oh, wait a minute, I've got an idea. Maybe Mr. Boynton could spend the evening with me over at your house. At my house? Well, I'm only suggesting it in case of an emergency, Mr. Conklin. I was thinking of Mr. Boynton's good right arm. Uh, since when have you become partial? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Miss Brooks, I'm afraid you won't have any time for Mr. Boynton. It just happens I have a long report to the board, which I expect you to type out for me in triplicate. A report? Yes, and I'll need it as soon as I return. So you see, Miss Brooks... Mr. Boynton would just be in the way. Uh, but, sir, Miss I... Brooks, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your coming in here and volunteering for this assignment. <laughs> Think nothing of it, Mr. Conklin. I don't. <laughs> what about my favor? Remember, one hand washes the other? Oh, we must get around to your favor by all means. Please be sure to remind me of it next week. <laughs> Mr. Conklin... I said next week, Miss Brooks. Now, I'm quite busy, so that will be all. Miss! Miss! <laughs> yes, sir. Here we go again, me and my unwashed hands. <laughs> well, of all the nerve, forcing me to break a date because he has to leave town. Oh, Miss Brooks, I've been waiting until you got out of Daddy's office to talk to you. Well, if it isn't my little roommate. What's up, Harriet? I knew Daddy would hook you into staying over at our house tonight, but you've got to promise me you won't breathe a word of it to a soul. Oh, golly, if anyone heard I needed a babysitter, why, I'd die of shame. But what'll I tell Mr. Boynton when I break my date with him? Well, just tell him it's a secret. 
Please, Miss Brooks. It's vital. All right, Harriet. I won't say a word about it. Will you take an oath on that? In blood, Harriet. And I know whose blood I'd like to use. (laughs) Friends, if you suffer from acid indigestion, I hope you didn't miss reading this wonderful news. A headline that says, New mints, medically proven, quickly rid stomach of gastric distress. That headline is talking about new Bicidol mints. Doctors recommend Bicidol mints because the Bicidol medication acts at once to make painful acid harmless and give you fast, five-way relief. One, speeds relief from gas. Two, sweetens your breath. Three, gives complete, longer-lasting relief than baking soda. Four, Relieve stomach upset from too much eating, drinking, smoking. Five, lets you sleep when acid indigestion strikes at night. So don't suffer acid indigestion, heartburn, or gastric distress from excess acidity. Remember, new mints, medically proven, quickly rid stomach of gastric distress. And remember the name, Bicidol Mints, B-I-S-O-D-O-L. Get Bicidol Mints for fast relief. Well, it was bad enough having to look forward to a night at Mr. Conklin's typing reports, but I faced my most unpleasant task at lunchtime. That's when I had to break my date with a man I hoped would someday make me the proud babysitter for my own babies. It was doubly difficult, since I'd promised Harriet I wouldn't mention the real reason. So when Mr. Boynton sat down at our usual table in the cafeteria, I decided to sneak up on the subject in a subtle manner. Mr. Boynton? Yes, Miss Brooks? I can't keep our appointment tonight. You can't keep it? May I ask why not? Of course you may ask. Well, I'm asking. Well, I'm not telling. (laughs) You see, I promised the person I am going to be with that I'd keep it a secret. Oh, so it's that way. That way? What is that way? Oh, come now, Miss Brooks. You know, and I know that you know exactly what way that way is. Oh, you do? Well, what would you say if I were to tell you that you may think you know that I know exactly what way that way is, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I do know what way the that way is that you're talking about? (laughs) If any members of my English class are listening, please don't. (laughs) Dissembling will get you nowhere, Miss Brooks. All right. Then I'll try assembling. (laughs) I didn't want to break this date, Mr. Boynton, but I honestly didn't think it would matter so much to you. No, it doesn't. doesn't matter in the least. (laughs) Not in the least. Good. If you found some other man you'd rather go out with, go right ahead. Well, that's very... Some other man? (laughs) You've probably met someone who's taller, more handsome, and with a better personality than I have. If so, good luck to you. If so, who needs it? (laughs) Uh, That is, you don't understand, Mr. Boynton. Oh, oh, don't, don't try to spare my feelings. I don't blame you for preferring to drive around in a Cadillac instead of my old heap. A Cadillac? After all, why should a girl waste her time on a poor school teacher when she can enjoy the comfort and luxuries a wealthy playboy has to offer? Well, that clears up where the Cadillac came from. <laughs> but, Mr. Boynton, as far as tonight's concerned... Oh, I, I said it was all right, Miss Brooks. I couldn't expect you to pass up cocktails and dinner and dancing in some swanky restaurant to go out with me. Well, I'm sorry you're disappointed about tonight, Mr. Boynton. Well, you'd be disappointed, too, if you had to go to a boring ladies' bazaar because somebody broke a date with you. Ladies' bazaar? Oh, in a weak moment, I promised my landlady that I'd attend if anything unforeseen happened to my engagement this evening. Well, it just happened. Well, cheer up, Mr. Boynton. The bazaar may not be so bad. Not so bad? I'll have to work in one of those booths. Doing what? Selling kisses, that's what. (laughs) (laughs) Yipe. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to get myself some milk and wash this all down. Get two, will you? I might as well be loaded as the way I am. I'll bring it back to the table. Here's the dime for mine, Mr. Boynton. Well, that's all right. I'll lay it out. <laughs> all the times to get a stand-up. Oh, Mr. Boynton, will you come over a moment? Well, Mr. Conklin, well, this is quite a surprise. 
As a rule, you don't eat here in the cafeteria. I thought I'd live dangerously today. <laughs> Boyman, I noticed you talking with Miss Brooks, and I thought I ought to warn you. If you're entertaining any thoughts of coming over to my house tonight to see her, dismiss them. To your house, sir? Yes. Miss Brooks will be much too busy typing a report for me to engage in any social activities. Well, so that's where she's going to be tonight. Didn't she mention it? With all these robberies lately, I asked her to remain overnight with Harriet, since Mrs. Conklin and I will be away. Well, what do you know about that? What do I know about what? <laughs> she told me she had a date to go out with a wealthy playboy in a big Cadillac. <laughs> I've got a good mind to teach her a lesson. By Godfrey, I'll do it. I'm going to drink both glasses of milk. <laughs> Armis Brooks will return in a moment. Well, by that evening, the babysitter brigade had multiplied. I was babysitting for Harriet Conklin, and Mrs. Davis was babysitting for me. Oh, listen to that wind howling. I'm glad you came over after all, Miss Brooks. It's a great night for a robbery, all right. Now, Harriet, we said we weren't going to mention the word robbery again. Just close that window near the piano and you won't hear the wind. All right. It was nice of you to invite me over, too, Harriet. I get awfully jittery sitting home alone with my cat Minerva on such a dark, gloomy night. I get jittery sitting with Minerva on a sunny day. <laughs> she just gives me the creep sometimes. Maybe the cat burglars will swipe their namesake. <laughs> now, Connie, that's no way to talk about Minerva. You know how fond she is of you. Yes, I know. She won't manicure her nails with anybody else's nylons. <laughs> I read where one of the robber's latest victims suffered a concussion, and the picture showed three huge bumps on his head where he'd evidently been blackjacked. Don't be an alarmist, Harriet. For all you know, he was just a tall man who forgot to duck when he went into a pawn shop. <laughs> now, let's change the subject. Yes, let's discuss something else entirely. Anybody read any good books lately? I just read a corker the other night. What was the name of it? She knifed her mate. <laughs> or... The way to a man's heart is through his chest. <laughs> well, maybe we ought to discuss the robberies again. But if conversation won't help, maybe some good music will. Harriet, suppose you put a few cheerful records on the phonograph. Oh, good idea, Miss Brooks. Oh, gee, I just remembered. I lent most of my collection to Nellie Miners. All I've got left are those on top of the machine. Well, they're better than nothing. Let's see some of the titles. Oh, here's a dandy one to perk us up. What's it called, Connie? Slaughter on 10th Avenue. <laughs> Maybe the one on the back's more lighthearted. Oh, sure. Murder, he says. <laughs> Guess we'd better turn on the radio, Harriet. I'll do it. Trying to determine whether or not broadcasting race results is in the public interest. And now for the local news. Those burglars who have terrorized the residential sections of our city three times during the past week have stepped up their pace tonight. Already two more homes have been robbed. Two more tonight? One of the victims, Mr. George Stewart, a high school principal, was found unconscious in his living room. How could they tell? <laughs> the police have requested that we broadcast this warning. Keep your home brightly illuminated until bedtime. I repeat, keep some illumination in your home throughout the night. If the phone rings and there's no one on the other end when you answer it, it may be one of the gang calling to see if your home is empty. Women especially should exercise extreme caution. If you are... Miss Brooks, why did you turn off the radio? Because you two are nervous enough without it. But two more robberies tonight. One of them a principal's house. And did you hear what he said about the phone calls? Well, we haven't had any phone calls. And there's no reason to assume that we will. Even if the telephone should ring, there's no point in getting panicky about it. We'll just cross that bridge when we come to it. Take everything in stride, so to speak. <laughs> the cat <bird. 
it. <laughs> don't answer that phone, Miss Brooks. But if we don't answer it, Harriet, they'll think there's nobody home. Let them think what they like. The announcer said that women especially must exercise extreme caution, Connie. <laughs> oh, I'm scared, Miss Brooks. I don't know what to do. Nonsense. There's absolutely no reason to get so frightened. After all, it's a... That's funny. Stop ringing. Oh, well. Now, let's all calm down and stop being so fearful. One thing we can do is put some more lights on in this room. But they're all on now, Miss Brooks. No, not quite, Harriet. There's a bulb missing in that lamp by the sofa. <laughs> well, we've got a bulb for it right here on the bookcase, but Daddy says that's a faulty socket. Well, this is no time to worry about Daddy's faulty socket. <laughs> I'll just take this bulb, screw it in here like this, and... Ow! The lights. The lights. What happened to the lights? They're out all over the house. Oh, you must have caused a short circuit. Where's the fuse box, Harriet? In back in the garage. Are you going out there? I certainly am. About nine o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> but we can't leave the house in darkness like this. Well, the burglars may be here any minute. But I don't know anything about fuse boxes, Harriet. Maybe Mrs. Davis would know how to... By the way, where is Mrs. Davis? <laughs> right over here, dear, under the piano. <laughs> what are we going to do, Miss Brooks? Don't worry, Harriet. I know exactly what to do. What? Mrs. Davis, move over. <laughs> I'm sorry if my phone call disturbed you, Walter, but I've got to know if you've been out with Harriet tonight. No, Mr. Boynton, I haven't been out with her in a week. But aren't you with Miss Brooks tonight? No. She's supposed to type some report at Mr. Conklin's house tonight and stay over with Harriet. Mr. Conklin wanted somebody there because he and his wife are out of town and... Well, if the Conklins are out of town and Miss Brooks is with Harriet, what are we waiting for? <laughs> Please, Walter, listen. I heard a report on the radio that alarmed me. So I telephoned the Conklin's house to see if everything was all right. But there was no answer. No answer? Well, maybe they all stayed over at Mrs. Davis's tonight. No, I tried that number and it doesn't answer either. Frankly, Walter, I'm worried. Well, now that you mention it, so am I. Ah, uh, well, just sit tight for now. I'm going over to the Conklin's. But how will you get in? Well, I'll get in some way and find out just what's happening one way or another. <laughs> Well, dark house or no dark house, now that we're ready, we'll give those burglars a warm reception. Are you all set, Mrs. Davis? All set, Harriet. I can swing this waffle iron like a tennis racket. <laughs> if you hit anybody with that, it should be loads of fun for the interns. They can play tic-tac-toe on his head. <laughs> this skillet I've got is no slouch as a weapon either. And I've got the double boiler. It ought to be... <gasps> Quiet. I think I saw something move outside this window. Battle stations, everyone. He's coming in. He is in. Okay, girls, pots away. <laughs> when you hear the tone, the time will be 9.31. Let him have it again. Oh, oh, oh. Wait. It's me, Mr. Boynton. Mr. Boynton? I know teachers aren't paid very well, but <laughs> this is a fine way to pick up a couple of bucks. You don't understand, Miss Brooks. I phoned here, but there wasn't any answer. So I came over to see if you were all right. Now, wasn't that sweet? <laughs> I hope we didn't batter you too badly, Mr. Boynton. Well, I'll probably have a few bumps, but I don't think oh, it's... Just a minute. I think there's someone else at the window. Yes, it's a big shadow this time. <laughs> this must be the real burglar. Now, don't be alarmed, ladies. Thanks, thanks to heaven, I'm here to protect you. Okay, girls, pots away! <laughs> <laughs> I got him! Hold his arm, someone! <coughs> Miss Brooks, will you kindly remove those pointed knees from my chest? <laughs> Mr. Conklin! 
<laughs> this is outrageous. Had a man return to his own home after his car breaks down without being assaulted by one of his teachers? <laughs> we didn't know it was you, Mr. Conklin. Of course, we didn't, Osgood. We couldn't see who it was, Daddy. So there are four of you in on it. <laughs> Miss Brooks, what have you to say? How about a rubber bridge? <laughs> Thomas Brooks, Karen Rudd, and Frank Fry, the tradition directed by Larry Burns, written by Arthur Oldsburg and Al Lewis, with the music of Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Conklin was played by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Bob Rockwell, Gloria McMillan, and Joel Samuels. Be sure to be with us next week for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Palmolive Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, is as sociable as the next teacher, especially if the next teacher happens to be Mr. Philip Boynton. But unfortunately, Mr. Boynton, who teaches biology at Madison, is uh, a rather shy individual. Yes, indeed. For a fellow who spends so much time studying life, he certainly manages to get very little on him. <laughs> of course, there are rumors around the school that I'm that way about Mr. Boynton. Now, I don't know exactly what that way means, but if feeling that way means feeling this way, then I guess I'm that way about Mr. Boynton. <laughs> Anyway, last week, he accepted my invitation to invite me to the faculty dance Saturday night. And so bright and early Saturday morning, I asked one of my pupils, Walter Denton, to drive me down to the beauty parlor in his jalopy. Unlike the new Hudson, Walter's car isn't one you step down into. His car, most people back away from. (laughs) It's a very streamlined little job. No windows, no top, and no windshield. All in all, it's the coldest hot rod in town. (laughs) If it's too cool for you, Miss Brooks, I can put up the top. The top? Where is that? In the back on the floor. (laughs) No, thanks, Walter. It doesn't matter how my hair looks now. Antoine will change me into something believable. I appreciate your giving me this lift today, Walter. Oh, it's a pleasure, Miss Brooks. A pleasure and a privilege, because I'm so fond of you both as a person and a teacher. You know, that's one thing about Madison High. They sure got some wonderful teachers. Now, take Mr. Boynton. Granted. He sure is tops. I ran into him the other night at the movies. Incidentally, he was with another member of the faculty, Miss Enright. Please, Walter, not so soon after breakfast. (laughs) I forgot you and Miss Enright aren't exactly stuck on each other. That, Walter, is an understatement. Now, let's just forget about her, shall we? Sure, I'll be happy to forget about her. I never think about her much anyway. Fine. Walter. Yeah? Was she sitting close to Mr. Boynton? (laughs) Who? The lady we decided to forget about. Well, I can practically give you a blow-by-blow because I sat right behind him in the movie. And what's your report, G2? (laughs) Nothing. Nothing? They were so dull I spent half my time watching the picture. (laughs) You should have asked for your money back. Of course, she did whisper a couple of things into his ear, but I couldn't hear what they were very well. She has a funny way of purring when she talks. There's nothing funny about it. To her, purring comes naturally. (laughs) Of course, she tried to hold Mr. Boynton's hand once or twice, but she didn't quite make it. Why not? Most of the time, he had it in a bag of popcorn. (laughs) Well, it would serve her right if she got salt all over her manicure. Here's the beauty parlor, Walter. Uh, would it be convenient for you to pick me up in a couple of little hours? Oh, sure, sure. I gotta get a haircut anyhow, and I usually go to Barney's Barbershop right down the street. I was thinking of getting a butch haircut this time. Well, from what I've seen of the kids who get their hair cut at Barney's, he can butch up any kind of a haircut. <laughs> Hello, Antoine. Well, if it isn't Miss Brooks, a long time no see, like the man says. What man? 
Oh, there you go. You're not in my shop two minutes and you're pulling my leg. But I don't care. I'm delighted to see you at any time. You're such a challenge to a beautician. Challenge? <laughs> yes, you see, you come into my shop so infrequently, I have to start from scratch each time. <laughs> of course, you do have a load of natural beauty. Thanks, loads. <laughs> but then so does a rosebush. And even it, with all its natural loveliness, must be properly and frequently cared for in order to retain that beauty. Its soil must be irrigated, its roots watered, its leafy branches gently sprinkled. Well, don't stand there. Turn the hose on me. <laughs> uh, before I assign you to a booth, uh, tell me, Miss Brooks, what prompted you to come in this morning? Oh, it's very simple, Antoine. There's a faculty dance at Madison High tonight, and I thought it would be nice to look like a human being. All the big jobs they bring to Antoine. <laughs> It's a feeble artist, indeed, who cannot rise above his subject. I shall make you my masterpiece. All I ask in return is that you promise to visit Antoine's once a week. Aren't you forgetting something? I'm a school teacher. You know, it isn't an accident that we of the faculty have a faculty for always looking like the faculty. <laughs> Beauty parlors are a luxury we can rarely afford. Well, apparently that doesn't apply to all teachers. One of my best customers is a teacher. In fact, she has an appointment here in a few minutes. Uh, uh, Miss Enright, uh, do you know her? Yes, we both teach English at Madison. Oh, then you and Miss Enright have something in common. I suppose you could call in that, yes. <laughs> oh, she's a wonderful person. Very active in the Parent Teachers Association and in all sorts of civic functions. Uh, what do you think of her? She's fine. Good teacher. Uh, confidentially, I don't like her either. <laughs> And even though I should be grateful for the new customers I get through her connections, I can't help feeling that she's very overbearing. That's my honest opinion, and when it comes to people, I believe that honesty is the best policy. Well, here I am, Antoine. Miss Enright, how wonderful to see you. Your policy just lapsed. <laughs> Why, Miss Brooks, what are you doing in a beauty parlor? Oh, I just thought I'd let Antoine do a little lily gilding. I haven't started yet. I'm going to make Miss Brooks look like a thing of beauty. Is there time? <laughs> this is Saturday, you know. We have to be back at school by Monday. Oh, I'll make it. Antoine's going to put more men on the job. <laughs> well, uh, if you'll excuse me for a moment, I'll arrange booth three for you, Miss Antoine. Oh, do that, Antoine. Uh, Miss Brooks, now that we're alone, there's something I think you should know. That you were at the movies with Mr. Boynton last night? Well, how did you... Were you there, too? No, just my emissary. <laughs> <laughs> I must admit, Miss Brooks, I thought you'd be a little more upset about it. Upset? Me? Because Mr. Boynton chooses to go out with another English teacher? Of course I'm not upset. In fact, I had quite a laugh over it. A laugh? I thought I'd split my infinitive. <laughs> <laughs> You see, I happen to know that Mr. Boynton once heard the expression, let's live a little. Yes. So that's what he does. He lives as little as possible. <laughs> no, I'm not worried about what Mr. Boynton does when he's not with me. Look, Miss Brooks, I like to do things in an open and above board manner. I'm going to lay my cards on the table. Good. Take them out of your sleeve and deal. <laughs> What's the first card? Just this. I know you've booked Mr. Boynton for the faculty dance tonight, but remember, there's always tomorrow, and I don't give up easily. Well, good for you, Salty Nail. <laughs> don't underestimate me, my dear. The next time Mr. Boynton and I walk down a middle aisle, it may not be in a theater. Be sure to invite me to the wedding. And Miss Enright, if you ever become a mother, remember, I'd love one of the kittens. <laughs> Now, Miss Enright. Yes, coming, Antoine. I'll see you and Mr. Boynton at the dance, Miss Brooks. I'll be looking forward to it with considerable revulsion. <laughs> oh, oh, booth three. Here it is. Uh, sit right down here, Miss Enright. Antoine, before you do anything for me, I want you to take care of Miss Brooks. Uh, but your appointment... I'll was... wait. There's a certain way I want you to take care of Miss Brooks. First of all, I want you to comb her hair up in back and give her bangs in front. But that wouldn't suit her face at all. Exactly. 
Then I want you to be sure and see that she's got pounds of makeup on. Plenty of rouge, eyeshadow, everything. But she won't like that. Neither will Mr. Boynton. I know the type. And whatever you do, don't let Miss Brooks look into a mirror. Tell her, uh, tell her to wait for her first reaction from a member of the opposite sex. But, Miss Enright, suppose she doesn't want me to... She'll agree to anything you suggest. She knows you're an expert beautician. Well, then how can I betray her faith in me? I'd feel like a traitor. A despicable traitor. Antoine, dozens of women patronize this shop at my suggestion. And at my suggestion, they go elsewhere. Now, are you going to give Miss Brooks the works or not? Well, Benedict Arnold made a nice living for years. <laughs> We are all finished. Remember now, no mirrors, Miss Brooks. All right, Antoine, if you say so. I'll leave it up to the public. Oh, there's Walter, parked as usual, right in front of a fire plug. <laughs> well, here I am. Let's go. Uh, sorry, lady, I'm waiting for Miss Brooks. Take another look, Walter. It's me. Holy cow, get in quick. I'll take you to the receiving hospital. <laughs> Or better yet, I'll give you first aid. I'm the Red Cross chairman of our class, you know. Well, why do I need first aid? Your mouth, it's all cut. Oh, yeah. you're just not used to seeing me with lipstick on. Start the car, Walter. I didn't intend to take so long. Mrs. Davis will be wondering what happened to me. When she sees you, she'll still be wondering. <laughs> Gosh, that hair comb. Those bangs. What's wrong with these bangs? Are they too long? Oh, well... In all the time you've known me, Miss Brooks, have I ever consciously been fresh or tried to hurt your feelings? No, Walter, never. Then I can answer your question honestly. They're not long enough. They're frustrating, Miss Brooks. <laughs> what are you talking about, Walter? Well, they start out all right, but just when they really get going, boom, they stop. <laughs> right at the tip of your nose. <laughs> what? Oh, that's just a few hairs that were blown out of place in this hopped-up pie plate of yours. How do I look otherwise? Well, frankly, Miss Brooks, I thought you were more beautiful without all that stuff. I mean, well, gosh, with your natural beauty, you could have been a famous stage actress or even a model or a big movie star. I've often wondered, what made you become a school teacher anyway? I couldn't resist the money. <laughs> Martin will continue in just a moment, but first, here is Vern Smith. Regardless of age, skin type, or previous beauty care, doctors prove you too may win a lovelier complexion with palm olive soap. But to win this lovelier complexion, you must stop improper cleansing. Instead, use palm olive the way doctors advise. Thirty-six doctors, leading skin specialists, advise using palm olive soap this way for 1,285 women with all types of skin. Young, old, dry, oily, normal. And using palm olive soap alone, two out of three won lovelier complexions. Oily skin looked less oily. Dull, drab skin wonderfully brighter. Coarse-looking skin appeared finer. Here's what the doctors advise. Wash your face with palm olive soap three times a day. Massage with palm olive's wonderful beauty lather for 60 seconds each time to get palm olive's full beautifying effect. Then rinse. Look for improvement within 14 days, for doctors prove this way, using palm olive alone, really works. So get palm olive soap and start today to win a lovelier complexion. And ladies, enter the $100,000 49 Gold Rush Contest. The makers of palm olive soap offer $49,000 first prize and over 4,900 other prizes. Get entry blanks and complete rules from your dealer now. You may win a fortune in cash. <laughs> Walter took me home from Antoine, and as my new bangs and I entered the front door, my landlady, Mrs. Davis, came out of the living room. Hello, Mrs. Davis. Oh, how do you do, madam? If you're looking for Miss Brooke, she isn't in. I'm her landlady. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I can refresh your memory. Good morning, Mrs. Davis. I can't pay the rent till next week. Connie Brooks, where in the world did you get that makeup? Antoine's beauty parlor. You didn't leave much there, did you? <laughs> Although I suppose it is attractive to a male. By the way, has he called? Mr. Boynton, you mean? Not this morning, Connie. 
And I know why you didn't get any calls last night, either. Why? I discovered our phone wasn't working. But I fixed it about an hour ago. You fixed it? Yes, I went downtown and paid the bill. <laughs> you know, Connie, as one gets used to your new look, it's not half bad. Well, I should hope not. After spending three hours in a hot booth, the least I can expect... I'll get it. Hello? Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. This is Mr. Poynton. I thought I'd better call to ask what time I can pick you up tonight. I wouldn't want to barge in without giving you ample time to get ready. Oh, you can come over any time, Mr. Boynton. It never takes me more than a few minutes to fix up. Well, then I'll be over about seven. Uh, you know, I tried to reach you several times last night, but your phone was out of order. Yes, I just heard about it. I was quite disappointed when you didn't answer, but while I was combing some new white mice I've acquired, Miss Enright dropped by and asked me if I wanted to go to the movies. What did you do with the other mice? I mean... <laughs> Where did you go after the movie? Ice cream parlor? Oh, no, I was full. The popcorn's very good at the Paramount. Yes, I know. Don't they have a slogan that goes, if it's Paramount picture, it's the best popcorn in town? Well, I don't know about that, Miss Brooks, but this wasn't a Paramount picture. It was an independent. It's about some girl with a lot of money who wants her sweetheart to quit being a poor songwriter and work in her father's doorknob factory. <laughs> No, but he writes a big hit song after they separate. And when he's got as much money as her father, he asks her to marry him again. And this time she says yes. I can't understand it. Me either. She ought to see the girl this fellow proposes to. She's got two inches of makeup on and she wears bangs. Bangs? The most ridiculous looking getup you ever saw. How any man in his right mind could fall for anybody like that one. Well, I won't keep you any longer, Miss Brooks. I'll pick you up at seven. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, I wish I hadn't let Walter go home. He could have taken me back to Antoine. I'll get it, Tony. Well, Osgood Conklin, how is Madison's handsome principal today? Uh, fine, Margaret, fine. As you know, my wife's preparing all the refreshments for the dance tonight, and she wondered if you'd be kind enough to help her out with a few sandwiches. Why, of course, Osgood. Shall I make the same kind of sandwiches I did last time? White fish and peanut butter. <laughs> No, thank you. I've brought some Hello, things. Mr. Conklin. Miss Brooks has been to the hairdressers, Osgood. Doesn't she look interesting? Well, uh, I really don't know. It's hard to tell. I, uh, I can see you all right, Miss Brooks, but how in the world can you see me? <laughs> oh, it's easy, Mr. Conklin. I just blow a little, <laughs> and there you are. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I've got to get back to the beauty parlor right away. Do you think you could give me a lift? I suppose so, Miss Brooks. And, Mrs. Davis, you'll find the ingredients for the sandwiches in this package right here. All right, Osgood. I'll get started right away. See you later, Father. Goodbye, Mrs. Davis. Well, come along, Miss Brooks. I'll drop you off. White fish and peanut butter? <laughs> As I recall, Mr. Conklin, the beauty parlor is only a couple of blocks past your house, so I won't be taking you too far out of your way. Uh, that's perfectly all right, Miss Brooks. I hope you'll forgive me for seeming so taken aback when you first came in, but, well, you did look quite unlike a school teacher. Is that bad? On Saturdays, no. In fact, <laughs> I, uh, I rather admire a woman who takes the time to enhance her charms. Confidentially, I've been trying to stampede Mrs. Conklin into a beauty salon for years, but she just can't see it. Doesn't believe in powder, rouge, lipstick, none of the refinements. What does she want with refinements? She's got you. That is, she's, uh, got you. <laughs> Excuse me, we're just passing my house. I always honk the horn when I'm in the neighborhood. It gives my wife and daughter a feeling of security. <laughs> but as you just said, Miss Brooks, she's got me. That's the trouble. She doesn't have to patronize beauty shops to hold on to me, and she knows it. Of course, if she had some reason to be jealous of me, she... Jealous. Miss Brooks, do you think that if Martha were jealous... Oh, pardon me, Mr. I... Conklin, but if you'll just pull up here, this is Antoine. Where? It's that little building with the dimple in the door. <laughs> Thanks for the lift, Mr. Conklin. You're welcome, Miss Brooks. And we can pursue the topic of my wife's peccadilloes at the dance tonight. Oh, definitely. I'm one of the best peccadillo dancers in town. <laughs> well, that does it, Miss Brooks. Am I completely plain again, Antoine? If you were any plainer, you'd fade right into the woodwork. You! 
I'm home, Mrs. Davis. She should be back any... Oh, wait a minute. She just came in. Come to the phone, Connie. It's Mr. Boynton. Again? I wonder what he wants now. Thanks, Mrs. Davis. Hello? Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. Mrs. Davis told me you were at the beauty shop. I was delighted to hear that. Delighted, Mr. Boynton? Yes. You see, I was afraid you might misconstrue my remarks about the girl in the movie and think that I dislike all spectacular hairdressings. Actually, the new styles fascinate me. They do? Yes. <laughs> uh, what sort of hairdo did you get, Miss Brooks? Well, what I got was more of a hair don't. But, uh, <laughs> I'm sure you'll like what I'm going to get again, Mr. Boynton. Oh, uh, fine. When we walk into that dance tonight, I want those other teachers to really notice you. I've even bought a brand new blue serge suit. Do you think it'll fit me? <laughs> That's a hot one. I'll see you at seven. Goodbye, Miss Brooks. Goodbye, Mr. Boynton. Well, back to the beauty parlor. You know something, Mrs. Davis? What, Connie? In moments like these, I almost wish I was Mrs. Conklin. What am I saying? <laughs> I'll have to be going down to the gym now, Martha. I want to see if it's fixed up properly for the dance tonight. Very well, dear. Oh, don't forget the keys to your car. They're on the table in the hall. And Osgood, I must say the car took a lovely polish. I got a glance at it when you were driving past the house with some woman. Yes. Well, I was just... You saw me driving with some woman, Martha? Yes, dear, I did. Well, there's no need to be jealous, of course, but she was quite pretty, don't you think? Oh, I'm sorry, Osgood. I didn't get a very good look at it. I was carrying some cold cuts at the time. Mm. <laughs> if you must know, she was gorgeous. The cold cuts were quite popular last year. Don't evade the issue, Martha. Who was that woman you saw me with this morning? <laughs> oh, I know that. That's a hot one. I repeat, who was that woman, Martha? What woman? Oh, in the car with you. Well, really, Osgood, you drive so many women from the Board of Education around. This one I... wasn't from the Board of Education. Ah, promise. Oh, please, dear. You're leaning against the potato sound. <laughs> Why don't you admit it, Martha? You're jealous. Five loaves of white. That should be enough. Martha, I said you were jealous. Yes, dear. Now, where did I put the rye bread? Martha, you're not even listening to me. Hello, dear. Hello! Oh, uh, all right. I mean, hello, Harry. Harry, as you've been crying. Is something wrong, dear? Oh, everything's wrong. Walter Dent told me he had to pick up Miss Brooks, but when I saw him, he was riding around with some, some creature and bang. I'm going up to my room now, Mother. And if Walter calls, just tell him I've taken a slow boat to China. Oh, no. <laughs> but after you've brooded a while, please come down and help me find the rye bread. Oh, Mother! Now there's a girl who will make some man a fine wife, insanely jealous. Oh, here's the rye bread. I do hope I win the door prize this year. Don't think I'm past noticing pulchritude, Martha. I'm still just a boy at heart. You know why I gave that other woman a lift in my car? Because she'd just come from the beauty shop. You hear me, Martha? I was bedazzled. If it hadn't been for all the powder in that store-bought hair... That man of mine wouldn't have gone nowhere, nowhere. So, what's the use? <laughs> Hello again, Miss Brooks. Uh, Tilly, prepare booth number four. <laughs> and now then, Miss Brooks, you said on the phone you wanted something fascinating, so I've decided to give you the famous Antoine Marcel. Is it really exciting, Antoine? Exciting? This is the very same coiffure I copied hair by hair from Gorgeous George. <laughs> Fine. Just give it to me, and then I'll wrestle you for the bill. <laughs> Well, this ought to be a very successful dance, Miss Brooks. Quite a few people in the gym. Yes, indeed, Mr. Boynton. And at the sound of the next voice, there will be one people too many. Oh, there you are. Good evening, Mr. Boynton. Oh, good evening, Miss Enright. The next number is a waltz, Mr. Boynton. Is it? Yes, and I'm just dying to waltz. Well, you do that. Mr. Boynton and I will be right behind you. <laughs> Look who just came in. It's Mrs. Conklin, isn't it? Oh, yes, but in a backless evening gown and an upswept hairdo. And I thought I was overdone. Alongside of Mrs. Conklin, I look like Carrie Nation after a bad night. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Conklin. Hello, Mrs. Conklin. Don't let me scare you. I got myself up like this to teach Osgood a lesson. 
<laughs> I wonder what he'll say when he sees me. Well, you won't have to wait long to find out. He's coming over now. Ah, uh, hello, folks. I... Oh, I see. We have a newcomer in our midst. And a... <laughs> a very charming one at that. Osgood Conklin at your service, Miss... Uh, Miss... It's Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Conklin. Well, I'm delighted to make your... <laughs> Mrs. Conklin. Hello, Osgood. Ma! What in the world? Your hair, your... Well, if that is... Your face is... Of all the... You look lovely, my dear. <laughs> I'm going to have every dance with you tonight. Oh, Boynton. Oh, yes, Mr. Conklin? I'd like you to take over my duties as host at the front door, if you please. Oh, but, sir, Miss Brooks and I will... To the door, to... Boynton. The... Yes, sir. Come along, Martha. If it hadn't been for powder and that store-bought hair, I would have... Oh, Miss Enright. Yes, Miss Brooks? Shall we dance? Steve Arden, as our Miss Brooks, returns in just a moment. But first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight, show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a luster cream shampoo. Only Luster Cream brings you K. Dumas' magic formula blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Gives loveliness lather even in hardest water. Glamorizes your hair as you wash it. Luster Cream. Not a soap, not a liquid, but a dainty cream shampoo. Leaves hair fragrantly clean. Free of loose dandruff. Glistening with sheen. Soft. Manageable. Gives new beauty to all hairdos or permanence. Four ounce jar, one dollar. Smaller sizes, either tubes or jars. Tonight, try Luster Cream Shampoo and be a... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful Luster Cream girl. You owe your crowning glory to a Luster Cream Shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, Mr. Boynton got away from the door just in time to ask me for the last half of the last dance. You look lovely tonight, Miss Brooks. I, I feel I put you to a lot of trouble today. Oh, it was nothing. Of course, I did lose about five pounds, but it was mostly around the scalp. Attention, attention, please. Ladies and gentlemen of the faculty, it is my pleasure at this time to announce the winner of the door prize. She is none other than our Miss Brooks. Congratulations, Miss Brooks Thank you, Mr. Conklin Now, I know you're all anxious to find out what the door prize is Well, I have here a ticket, Miss Brooks Entitling you to one free treatment at Antoine's beauty parlor <laughs> Mr. Conklin, would you tell me one thing? What's that, Miss Brooks? Is this for putting on or taking off? <laughs> Week, tune into another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Palmolive Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written and directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Boynton is played by Jeff Chandler, Mr. Conklin by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Gloria McMillan, Mary Jane Croft, Frank Nelson, and Margaret McDonald. <laughs> Men, here is actual factual proof of more comfortable, actually smoother shaves by using Palmolive Lather Shaving Cream. 1,251 men tried the Palmolive Lather way to shave described on the tube. And no matter how they shaved before, three out of four got more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Try Palmolive Lather Shaving Cream. See if you don't get more comfortable, actually smoother shaves the Palmolive Lather Shaving Cream way. <laughs> mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North, the exciting fun-packed adventures of an amateur detective and his beautiful wife. Tune in Tuesday evenings over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at the same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks, Bob Lamont speaking. This week marks the 37th anniversary of the Girl Scouts, and the Colgate Palmolive Peat Company takes this opportunity to wish a very happy birthday to all Girl Scouts of America, whose fine program trains the girls of today to be better citizens in the world of tomorrow. 
This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, our Miss Brooks. It's time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks, written by Al Lewis. Well, most of us spent Christmas Eve with our families and friends. But our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, wasn't quite so fortunate. No, my family was too far away to visit, and it seems my friends had other plans. But I made up my mind not to brood about it, and was trimming a rather tiny tree in our living room when my landlady, Mrs. Davis, joined me. What a nice tree, Connie. It isn't really, Mrs. Davis, but it's the only one I could afford. Oh, what did you pay for it? I found it in a vacant lot. (laughs) What I like about it is the size. It's not too big or too small. It's just too small. (laughs) I'd like to stay here and celebrate Christmas Eve with you, Connie, but I promised my sister Angela I'd come over to her place. You remember Angela, the absent-minded one? Oh, certainly, Mrs. Davis. She always got a big thrill out of the holidays, even when we were girls. Of course, the poor dear could never remember when it was actually Christmas and one Christmas morning... She did the funniest thing. What's that, Mrs. Davis? What's what, dear? (laughs) What did Angela do? Angela. Your sister. My sister. The absent-minded one. What did she do? I haven't spoken to Angela in some time. (laughs) What has she been up to? That's what I'd like to know. Maybe I can refresh your memory. Christmas morning, Angela did the funniest thing. Christmas morning isn't until tomorrow, Connie. (laughs) You must be confused. Well, don't worry about it. I only get these spells once in a while. (laughs) Well, you shouldn't let it go, Connie. If you don't mind my offering a little advice, I'd like to suggest that you train your mind to concentrate more. I'll do it, Mrs. Davis. (laughs) Now, I've developed a little scheme which works wonders for me. Supposing you have trouble remembering where you put things around the house. Well, you just keep repeating the location to yourself with a sort of rhythm. For example, I just chant to myself, the mustard's in the closet, the bread is in the box. The mustard's in the closet, the bread is in the box. The mustard's in the closet, the bread is in the box. Now, isn't that simple? Oh. Mustard's in the closet. <laughs> That's wonderful, Mrs. Davis. If anybody wants a mustard sandwich, you're really ready. <laughs> yes. Now, uh, before I do anything else, I want to invite you to join me tonight. Join you? Yes, dear. I'm going over to... Uh, uh, to... Uh... Angela's house? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> She's so cute with that little absent mind of hers. You find sometimes she forgets what she's talking about right in the middle of a sentence. And a, oh, dear me, I hope that cat's got enough milk. Well, I'm sure if we... Uh, <laughs> but then, maybe someday, or if it doesn't seem too... And that's why I can't join you tonight. <laughs> Thanks anyway, Mrs. Davis. I'll just spend a quiet evening at home here. But how about Mr. Boynton? Don't tell me he was too shy to ask you for a date on Christmas Eve. Why do you think there's mistletoe on all four walls? (laughs) No, Mr. Boynton asked me all right, but then he canceled yesterday. Said he's going upstate to visit his folks for a couple of days. But don't worry about me, Mrs. Davis. I'll have a gay time. I'll listen to the radio, read... And from this window, I can see our neighbor's television antenna. (laughs) But what about the little gifts you've got for Walter Denton and Mr. and Mrs. Conklin and Harriet? When are you going to deliver them? Oh, they told me not to bother. They said we'd exchange on the 26th. The 26th? But I don't think the day after Christmas is the time to exchange gifts. You don't? You should see the department stores. (laughs) that, Mrs. Davis? It's Minerva. Where are you, dear? 
Oh, she's over by the tree. Here, Rover, uh, Minerva. <laughs> Isn't it the strangest thing how she bites at the pine needles? I guess the rosin in them appeals to her. I'd swear she likes the taste of it. I guess to her it's like a Tom and Jerry, or rather a Minnie and Mickey. <laughs> Come on, Minerva, come on over here. We might as well get friendly. We're going to spend the evening together. <laughs> well, I'll be running along now, dear. I hope you won't feel too lonely. Oh, I'll be fine, Mrs. Davis. After all, I do have an imagination. I'll hang my stocking up in a little while, and then when I'm pretending that I'm asleep, I'll sneak in and fill it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, before you know it, it'll be midnight. Midnight of Christmas Eve. I can just picture it. A short, thin man in a black suit comes sliding down the chimney with an empty bag. St. Penniless, the schoolteacher, Santa Claus. <laughs> well, at least you're not bitter. Now, Connie, about my... <laughs> my sister, uh... Angela. Uh, oh, thank you, dear. About my sister, Angela. Yes? Good night, Dorothy. <laughs> Good night, Bernice. <laughs> Oh, stop drinking those pine needles, Minerva. Come on over here. There's a good kitty. Now I'll just settle down in Mrs. Davis's rocker and we'll have ourselves a nice, quiet rock. I've got to exercise more. My bones are rusting. <laughs> oh, it's the rocker. Kind of soothing at that. <sighs> you seem contented enough, Minerva. <laughs> Twas the night before Christmas And all through the house Not a creature was stirring Not even a mouse yeah! Oops, sorry, Minerva <laughs> I didn't mean to upset you, Minerva Oh, gosh, I'm sleepy Now, who can that be? Expecting anyone, Minerva? That's funny. There's nobody here. I'm here. Where? Oh, leaning on my knee. <laughs> what can I do? Well, I'm a salesman, but I don't believe in giving any sales talk or sob stories. All I do is tell you what I'm selling, and if you want to buy, okay, if not, okay. Okay? What are you selling? Well, it's Christmas Eve, and I'm just a small urchin, a little on the underprivileged side, and I'm trying to make a few dollars to get some wood to heat our tiny apartment. So that while she's singing to my three sick sisters, my mother's lips don't turn blue. <laughs> That's what I like, no sob story. <laughs> You're selling handkerchiefs, I'll take six. Well, no, ma'am, I'm selling Christmas trees. It's only a dollar a piece. But I've already got a Christmas tree. Then I'll make a 50 cent. But I don't need... How about a quarter? Look, little boy. Well, payments can be arranged. <laughs> Please take one, ma'am. These aren't ordinary trees, you know. They're magic. Magic? Yes, ma'am. You'd be surprised what miracles will happen to you if you buy one. Well, a quarter isn't too much to pay for a miracle. It's 50 cents. <laughs> I thought you said 25. That's when you sounded tougher to sell. <laughs> oh. Well, before I melt down to my coal buttons and the stovepipe hat, here's 50 cents. Well, you won't be sorry, ma'am. Here's the little tree. Say, it is kind of cute at that. Would you like to come in and help me set it up? I can't. I've got to get right home. My sitter's been alone long enough. Sitter? <laughs> well, what about your mother and the firewood? Well, that's just a routine. My folks are attending a dinner the other bank presidents are given for father. <laughs> With the pitch you've got, you'll have your own bank by the time you're 12. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Good night, lady, and Merry Christmas. Same to you, you little underprivileged millionaire. <laughs> oh, I'll put this tree over here. Maybe we can find some extra trimmings for it in the morning. Yeah. Minerva, will you stop gnawing on those pine needles? I wish I knew what made them so appetizing to her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fine. Now you come over here and let those things alone. There we are. Well, I guess I'm not the only one that's spending Christmas Eve alone without family or friends. But who can tell? Maybe Santa Claus has something up his big red sleeve that I don't even know about yet. 
course, I do have a squeaky rocker and Minerva. Jingle bells, jingle bells, and merry stuff like that. Oh, what fun it is to rock with a big, fat, drunken cat. <laughs> As I sat in the living room Christmas Eve with Minerva the cat on my lap, I couldn't help noticing that the tree which I'd bought from that wealthy urchin had a rather peculiar luminosity. Although there wasn't any artificial illumination, it seemed to glow from deep down in its branches. As I rocked back and forth, I started to get very drowsy. Ooh, little boy said this tree was magic, Minerva. No, I don't believe it either. Still, it is Christmas Eve, and some very strange things have happened on Christmas Eve. What, what, what's that? Oh, I, I must have been dozing. Coming! Well, it's Walter Denton. Come in, Walter. Noel, Noel, joy, you is Noel. <laughs> Gracias. Come on into the living room, Walter. Oh, thanks, Miss Brooks. Here, I brought you this little gift to put under your tree. Oh, that was very thoughtful, Walter. Put it under this tree over here. Okay. Say, you've got two trees, haven't you? Yes, one for Minerva and one for me. What? Don't pay any attention to her. She's pine needle happy. Oh. Well, Miss Brooks, as you know, I was supposed to spend the evening nestled snugly in the tight little confines of my own small immediate family circle. Oh, for heaven's sakes, come out of there. You're giving me claustrophobia. <laughs> But I went to my father and mother and crowed their permission to come over... Oh, wait a and... minute, Walter. You crowed their permission to... Yeah. Crave, craven, crove, isn't it? <laughs> oh, Walter, of course not. Crave, crave. Let's see. Crave, craven. After you crowed their permission, what happened? <laughs> Saved my presence for a long enough while for me to deliver to you, Miss Brooks, the little token of my esteem and affection, which is now ensconcing under the tree. Walter, are you still in my English class? <laughs> well, sure, Miss Brooks. Well, I'd better bone up a little. One of us is going to flunk this term. <laughs> well, it isn't just the gift, Miss Brooks. That's not the only thing that brought me wayfaring from the warmth and conviviality of my own heart. Oh, please don't start that again. I'm glad you dropped over, Walter. And if you want to spend the rest of the evening with your folks, oh, why, you Oh, there's no go... rush with them. They've got my present under our tree already. Now, what I'd like to say, Miss Brooks, though, is something I've wanted to say for a long while. Yes, Walter? Now, it's a... A little on the sentimental side, perhaps, for a so-called hep high school boy to be telling a teacher, but it's sincere, Miss Brooks. I'm sure it is. It's something I feel deep down inside of me, Miss Brooks, from whence so many of one's warmer emotions stem. That's whence they stem from, all right. <laughs> of course, even if it does seem over-sentimental or even downright sticky... Christmas Eve seems to be the time that you can say things like this and not sound over-sentimental or sticky. Christmas Eve is the time to say them. I just hope I hear them by New Year's Eve. <laughs> what I want you to know, Miss Brooks, is that I'm grateful. For what, Walter? For my association with you during the past semester at Madison High School. Well, thank you, Walter. I've tried to be a capable teacher. Oh, your teaching was nothing. What? <laughs> Oh, I don't mean scholastically. No, as a teacher, you were very adequate. I mean personally. The interest you took in me and my problems. For that, I could never thank you if I lived to be a hundred. Of course, you'd be gone a long time by then. <laughs> Merry Christmas to you, too. <laughs> you don't know what it's meant to me to have your ear whenever I needed it. Oh, it was nothing, really. I have another one. <laughs> 
silly about girls. Gosh, you remember how silly I used to act about girls? Every time one of them looked at me, I giggled like a kid. And then, overnight, I matured. I met the one woman who really mattered. Harriet Conklin. <laughs> She certainly made something out of you, Walter. I don't know what, but something. You saw me through the difficult transition period of that amour as well. While Harriet and I were adjusting to one another, it was wonderful to be able to come down to you for advice, Miss Brooks. It isn't every boy who has such an interest taken in him by some intelligent elderly person. Give me back my ear. I can't hear you. You're ancient or anything Gosh, I've seen girls who don't look as good as you do Girls? <laughs> what do you think I am? <laughs> Shut up, Minerva <laughs> By the way, Miss Brooks I see you got lots of mistletoe on the walls Were you expecting Mr. Boynton tonight? Yes, Walter, I was We were going for a wheelchair ride together <laughs> But he had to visit his folks upstate His folks? Gosh, they must be well along in years. His father's over 50. They may shoot him next spring. <laughs> Look, Walter, while you're here, you might as well pick up the little gift I got for you. Oh, but Miss Brooks, you shouldn't have. Where is it? <laughs> Under the tree on your right. It isn't much, just a remembrance. Oh, gee, I almost forgot. I can't open it yet. Why not? Oh, you mean you want to put it under your tree at home and open it with your family? Oh, not exactly, but... Well, I'll get it later, Miss Brooks. Oh, there they are now. I'll answer it. There who are now? Come on in, folks. She was all alone when I got here. But it's really a surprise, isn't it? We should have stayed home Christmas Eve. Besides, it's freezing out. Now, Osgood, don't be so grouchy. Hello, Miss Brooks. Merry Christmas. Why, it's Mr. and Mrs. Conklin. And Harriet, how are you all? I'm cold. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Come here, Minerva. Rub up against Mr. Conklin. Yeah, what's that? What did you... Go away, cat. Why, she seems to like you, Osgood. Or is she hungry, Miss Brooks? She's not that hungry. <laughs> I don't like cats. Why doesn't she go chase a mouse or something? Well, you forget, Mr. Conklin, this is Christmas Eve. There isn't one stirring. <laughs> hey, Harriet. Yes, Walter? There's a lot of mistletoe around this room. I know. It's real pretty. Ah, good. Notice all the mistletoe in this room? What? <laughs> oh, oh, that green stuff. Yeah. <laughs> More often than not, it makes me sneeze. Oh, come on, Osgood. Let's see if it does. Oh, now, Martha, don't embarrass me. It doesn't make I... you sneeze, does it, Harriet? I'm willing to find out. Here's a nice wreath of it on this wall. Yeah. Well, here we are. <laughs> yeah. Here we are. <laughs> and Mrs. Conklin? If it's all right with Harriet, it's all right with us. Oh, come on, Walter. We're getting old. <laughs> Gosh, you're sweet, Harriet. Oh, isn't that cute, Osgood? Come here, dear. How about one for your faithful old wife? Well, it is customary, I guess. <laughs> uh, I'm under the stuff. <laughs> Now, pucker up, dear. Very well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you see, I... T I, t I, t I, t I told you... <laughs> now, let's stop this romantic drivel and act like adult human beings. Miss Brooks, I'd like to take advantage of this visit to inquire as to your plans for the coming year's classwork. Do you have your schedule all laid out? Well, frankly, Mr. Conklin, I haven't had much chance to work on anything. Haven't had much of a chance. But you've been away from school all week. Your vacation started last Monday. I know, Mr. Conklin, and that's what I took the week as. I mean, a vacation is something you go on when you get the opportunity to. You don't work on it or during it. Unless, even though I didn't actually go anywhere, when my vacation came along, I went on it... 
or was on one, usually. <laughs> and you wanted to be the head of the English department. Please, Osgood, this is no time to talk of school affairs. We're here to spend part of our holiday with Miss Brooks. It was very nice of you to think about me, Mrs. Conklin. It was nice of all of you. Where are Walter and Harriet? Denton, get my daughter away from that mistletoe at once. But, Mr. Conklin, Harriet isn't allergic to mistletoe. No, but I'm allergic to you. <laughs> Harriet's almost irresistible sometimes, especially alongside of older women like Mrs. Conklin and Miss Brooks. <laughs> Saved by the bell. I'll get it. Why, Mr. Boynton, come in. Oh, thanks, Miss Brooks. I thought you were going upstate to see your folks. Well, I was, but they sent me a wire that they wanted to come down here for a week or so. They'll arrive in the morning, so I thought I'd drop this little gift off for you tonight. Oh, but you shouldn't have. Where is it? <laughs> Let's just put it under the tree in the living room. Look who's here, everybody. Well, it's Mr. Boynton. Hi there, Mr. B. This is nice. Hello, Boynton. <laughs> Hello, folks. This is beginning to get more like Christmas Eve every minute. Sit down, Mr. Boynton. I'm certainly glad your folks decided to visit you instead of vice versa. Oh, so am I. There's a particularly good reason why I'm glad. There is? Well, yes. It gives me a chance to see how my guinea pigs are affected by this cold snap. <laughs> so far, they haven't reacted at all. What do you expect them to do, blow on their paws? <laughs> Miss Brooks? Have you pointed out the mistletoe to Mr. Boynton? Oh, why don't you stop that nonsense, Martha? <laughs> it isn't nonsense. Mr. Boynton, look at the mistletoe. Mistletoe? Oh, oh, yes, a very interesting example of the flora found in various areas throughout the globe. <laughs> An evergreen parasitic shrub, it is indigenous to the regions where apple trees and oaks abound. Now that the lecture is over, may we ask questions? Well, certainly, Miss Brooks. Want to stand under it? <laughs> stand under it? Well, you see, because of certain characteristics in its makeup, an allergy is sometimes aggravated by its presence. I'll take a chance if you will. Come on, Mr. Boynton. Yeah, come on, Mr. Boynton. Uh, just bring him over to this wall here. <laughs> uh, I'll get under it if you like. Well, don't just stand there. Can't you see Miss Brooks is cooking? Well, don't fuss for me. I couldn't eat a thing. <laughs> Mr. Boynton, don't you know what standing under the mistletoe signifies? Well, I know what it signifies to most people, but to me it's just... <laughs> well, there goes 85 cents worth of mistletoe. Hey, I know what let's do. Let's open up the presents right now. Swell. A splendid suggestion, Walter. Uh, uh, shouldn't we wait until just before we leave? Might be less embarrassing that way. Well, if you want to open them now, I... Golly, this one tree is pretty crowded. I'll put some of these packages under this little one over here. Look out, Walter. You're bumping into one of the branches. Look out. Gosh, I got the funniest feeling when I touched that branch. What kind of a feeling, Walter? Holy... You're Harriet Conklin, aren't you? Well, sure, I'm Harriet Conklin. Walter, what's the matter with you? Nothing. Nothing's the matter with me. It's just that I want to tell you something. Harriet, you've got to change. You ought to try to be more like Miss Brooks. What do you mean, Walter? If you want me to stay interested in you, you've got to be more alluring, youthful, glamorous, feminine in that real feline Brooks way. Walter, have you been drinking pine needles, too? <laughs> Look at that tree. It's... It seems to be glowing. What do you mean, glowing? Just a reflection from the streetlights. This party is giving me the memes. <laughs> Holidays, indeed. Here, I'll just move the tree where it won't glisten in our eyes. There we go. <laughs> ho, ho, ho! <laughs> Merry Christmas! Of course I'm Mr. Conklin. Happy-go-lucky, fun-loving, gag-a-minute Osgood. Gag-a-minute Osgood? 
Sometimes I've wanted to. (laughs) (laughs) Miss Brooks, is that really you standing there? I think so, Mr. Conklin. Why do you ask? Because you suddenly look so different, so intelligent. (laughs) (laughs) Miss Brooks, I've made up my mind. You are now head of the Madison High English Department. Well, thank you, fun-loving Osgood. <laughs> I'm going to put this wonderful tree where it belongs, right in the center of the room. Give me a hand, Boynton. Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Conklin. I'll just take this end here and... Miss Brooks. Yes, Mr. Boynton? Come here, baby. <laughs> You said, come here, Connie. You did not. You said, come here, baby, and I'm here. <laughs> Look, he's taking her over to the mistletoe. Oh, isn't it wonderful? Well, 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 what are you going to do, Mr. Boynton? Uh, just call me Phil, Connie. And this is what I'm going to do. How does that make you feel? Oh, I feel like I'm in a dream, Philip. A wonderful, beautiful dream. Well, what's that? Mr. Boynton, where did you go? Where is everybody? Oh, I must have been dreaming. Well, that's real enough. I'll be right there. Oh, sorry, Minerva. I didn't mean to drop you. Surprise! Surprise! I'm cold. <laughs> Why, it's the Conklins and Walter and Mr. Boynton. But you all just left. Uh, I mean, come in. We thought it would be nice if we spent our Christmas Eve together, Miss Brooks. Yes, and we've brought a few little gifts over for you. I'll just put them under this tree here. Yes, do that, Walter. Aren't you going to ask me why I didn't go upstate, Miss Brooks? I know why, Mr. Boynton. Your folks are coming down to see you. Well, how did you know about that? I just got the telegram. Uh, Don't let's get too carried away with the holidays to prepare for the hard school season ahead, Miss Brooks. Oh, let's not talk about school affairs now, Osgood. Walter, look at the mistletoe. Yeah, look at it. Now, just a minute. Before we go through all that again, (laughs) would you please touch that tree, Mr. Boynton? The one on the left with the... Why, it's gone. There's only one tree. Miss Brooks, are you all right? Of course I'm all right. Could I have dreamt that part, too? Uh, Mr. Boynton, would you do me a favor, please? Of course, Miss Brooks. What is it? Would you touch the Christmas tree? Touch it? Please, it's important. Oh, all right. There. Nothing happened. Well, what did you expect would happen? A miracle. Oh, excuse me. I'll be right back. Oh, well, I'm a little urchin, and I'm selling magic Christmas trees. But you just... Please buy one, lady. They only cost 50 cents a piece. 50 cents? That's right. Here's two dollars. Give me four of them. <laughs> Eve Arden. All over the studio here, there are happy signs of Christmas. Bits of red and green, holly, and some imaginative person even hung some mistletoe in the control room. Must remember to drop in there after the show. (laughs) But the Christmas spirit is even more evident in the faces of our cast. Together with our sponsor, the Colgate Palm Olive Peat Company, makers of Colgate Dental Cream, Luster Cream Shampoo, and Palm Olive Shaving Creams, We join in wishing you a Merry Christmas. Yes, Jeff Chandler and Gail Gordon, Jane Morgan, Virginia Gordon, Dick Crenna, Gloria McMillan, Jeffrey Silver, our writer-director Al Lewis, and our producer Larry Burns, our conductor Wilbur Hatch, and all the others on the R. Miss Brooks show. And we're gathered here to say, may this be the most joyous of the holidays for all of you. (laughs) 